Good afternoon. I'm Mayor Ken Thurston. I'm calling the City of Lotta Hill City Commission workshop to order. Today is Monday, May 16, 2022 at 4.02 p.m. Nadia Chen, Deputy City Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Dunn. Here. Commissioner Grant. Present. Commissioner L. Martin. Here. Commissioner S. Martin. Mayor Thurston. Present. City Attorney Hall. Here. City Manager Joe Smith. Here. Roll call completed. All right. Thank you, Nadia. Before we begin, I want to explain that although the governor has suspended certain restrictions, we will still remain on the state of emergency due to the COVID-19 virus pandemic. Due to the challenges of the virus, the city of Lotte Hill will continue to hold hybrid virtual governmental meetings to continue to allow the public to participate virtually. The city commission will have a quorum physically present at city hall. The city of Lotte Hill will continue to follow CDC guidelines regarding facial covering, social distancing, and public gatherings. If there are any issues, please text Doug Downs, the IT director. We appreciate your patience and cooperation during this difficult and ever-changing time. And Vice Mayor, we've got some housekeeping items. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pass a motion to accept this revised agenda, which includes removing and replacing item seven, um, which is a presentation from Ms. Latoya Ashley with a presentation for the Lauder Hill Lions. Um, also item 12 has a added backup and we're adding item 15. Okay. Second. All right, a motion and second. Um, roll call for a acceptance. Vice Mayor Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Grant. Yes. Commissioner L. Martin. Yes. Commissioner S. Martin? Yes. Mayor Thurston? Yes. All right, so today's uh, workshop agenda is now approved on a vote of five to zero. Flipping pages fur furiously. And uh, we're at item one. 911 dispatch center issues requested by city manager Desiree Dow Smith. It's Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna call up the chief. She's gonna introduce our guests that we have here today. And we're gonna discuss the 911 um, dispatch emergency system that is provided, um, I guess, Brow by Broward County through our sheriff's department. So chief, go ahead from there. Yes, yeah, so good evening. Um, as you all know, last commission meeting, uh, it came up, uh, the 911 came up and we had a, a few of our citizens who were concerned as they had uh, reached out uh, to 911 uh, for an emergency they had and they were delayed in getting a response. So uh, myself, along with uh, Chief Torres, um, presented um, some facts to you. Um, and we also mentioned that Deputy Chiefs Levy and uh, Siegel sit on the board, uh, both representing the police and fire communication board, both representing the police and fire associations. So uh, we felt that um, having the sheriff come here, I know you all mentioned that you wanted to see how you um, as a commission, uh, what you can do to assist. I will say that the uh, Broward Chiefs uh, Police Associations have been having several meetings and we do plan to meet with the sheriff this week to see how we, as a, an association, can assist them with the um, issues. So without further ado, I feel you uh, hear it better from the horse's mouth. So we'll call uh, Sheriff Gregory Tony to come up. So thank him for coming up. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for allowing me to come in and mm -hmm. actually talk about some of this issue of concern as a community, rightfully so, should be wondering about the status of our communication system. Uh, to begin with, I got to give somewhat of a historical to the community about how this system works and the dual partnership that exists amongst my office as well as the county. Currently, the county uh, commission is responsible having two elements of responsibilities with this communication system, the first of which is technology. And then the second is also with the operating protocols of which we utilize. The second element or the third element that uh, creates our communication system falls or lies amongst the sheriff's office where we are responsible for the personnel, meaning the 911 call takers, the dispatchers that are operating in our three centers across this county are under my command. And so one of the things that recently occurred, uh, we had an incident in Hollywood 
where an article was created through the Sun Sentinel, allegations and assertions was made as to whether or not we were answering certain calls and it created a somewhat fear element within the community as to the status of our system. And so immediately what I wanted to do was first rectify uh, and answer those allegations and questions. I tasked my staff within communications to do a comprehensive review as to whether or not we were dropping calls, missing calls, or what shortcomings that may have existed based on DSO personnel. That report was done. We provided it over to different stakeholders talking about the things that were accurate in that uh, news article and then those things that were not. One of the things that came up and really had kind of exacerbated the concerns in the community was about our personnel, meaning we were uh, 90 plus vacancies within our dispatch center and whether or not we had the capability through those personnel to answer the calls or were we falling short there. And most certainly there has been a national defect or deficiency when it comes to 911 call takers. But folks, you know, this isn't unique just to uh, call takers, just employment aspect in general. There's a lot of vacancies, a lot of people are choosing not to work, et cetera. And we are down. And so how do we get there was essential for me to explain to this county commission, uh, which I presented a few days ago, as well as what I've been talking about amongst every single city stakeholder. And what I wanna to say to this commission is, the invite I got started with, well, we'd like the sheriff to come through to explain what's going on. But then the second side I heard was because we want to help. And I appreciate that because we get a lot of calls and a lot of uh, commentary about what's not working. But very rarely do we get everyone or a group of commissioners to say, well, we want to help versus just point the finger. So uh, I, I sincerely appreciate that. I was excited to come here knowing what the intent was behind uh, what you want to get involved in. So we have a PowerPoint presentation slide that was presented to the county commission a few days ago. I think it's going to answer many of the questions that you may have, and then we're going to take questions from you. In an audience today with me, of course, I have my XO, Colonel Ahmed. I have the undersheriff, Nicole Anderson. I have one of our assistant directors over communications uh, to be here to answer any technical questions. Tara Thompson, who's been with us for quite some time. And then I have, uh, we also had Captain Jamie Smith here, who's the XO for Nicole Anderson. I just want to recognize them. To begin with, and I believe we have the correct PowerPoint up there. That looks like our recruit one, folks. That's not the right one. <laughs> That's a recruit one. Okay. Well, I'm going to roll through the hard copies, always come prepared, uh, so that we can make sure we're all on the same page. For the audience and the community watching abroad or online, uh, we apologize, and we will make sure that the commission get access so that they can later put this PowerPoint slide up on their website. Uh, the overview of this presentation covers our BSO regional communications, personnel, and demographics, the historical budget analysis that's occurred over the last 10 years, the operation variances within comparison uh, to our neighboring jurisdictions, which is going to be very important, salary comparisons, proposed salary assessment, staffing considerations, hiring process, recruitment strategies, and a few other areas in terms of concepts behind what we'd like to see within our PSAPs here. Currently, the Broward Sheriff's Office is responsible in partnership with the county for handling a communication system that is comprised of over 29 law enforcement municipal cities, 20 uh, fire rescue municipals, the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. We also have Port Everglades, the court services, and the Department of Detention. So we are in every single component of our local communities here when it comes to the importance of this system. The next slide I have prepared was about the personnel and demographics of who makes up our dispatch staff. Currently, 84% of our staff uh, are women, 16% are men. And then in the middle bracket that you would see is the age demographics about the age breakdown. About 36% is between the age of 31 and 40, 23% is between 41 and 50. And it's those two figures, that 60 percentile, that I'm kind of focused on today because I think once I get rolling, you'll understand the importance behind this. Um, and so we currently are at a staffing position of about 84%, 84% filled with pushes up around about 20 percentile uh, vacancy notice, which is not a good thing. We don't ever want to get down to those type of percentiles, but how do we get there? Part about how we establish, if you go to the next slide, and we've arrived there is to look at the budget analysis and the variances amongst what we've proposed and what has been adopted by our county commission. This is imperative to understand. Over the span of 10 years, going back really about to 2013, if you start looking at the chart, you can see, um, I'll, I'll break it down a little bit more. The proposed budget, of course, is in green. 
the adopted budget is basically in a yellow. And if you look at the two intersecting points on those line graphs, you'll see back in 2015 was the last time that this office had presented a budget related to communications and it was adopted in its entirety by the county commission. Since that time, we've seen a variance of two, three, four, five million dollars at a time going from 2015 all the way up to 2021, where those variances and differences to the general public, what I am saying is we've requested X dollars and the county commission have given us Y. That difference has been $31 million in variances over the span of 10 years. That impacts our operating protocols. I've been, it's been stated, and there's truth in that statement, that the sheriff, once his budget is adopted, can do as he pleases to make things operate. Well, it's very hard to work when you're already upside down, when every year we're coming in in the red in communications. Now, in fairness to the county commissioner or the previous excuse me, county administrator, having worked with Bertha Henry over the last three years, she had recognized that this was an issue, and she and I had worked on a strategy plan to reduce that deficit to make sure we were made whole. For example, over the last two years, there's been $3.5 million increases going into getting us to a point where we can be made whole. But that's an astonishing number to see, understanding that communications is the lifeline for this entire county, all two million of us. It is our lifeline. The next slide I have here, and this is going to kind of uh, mesh up against the other one I talked about, is the operational variances that exist amongst our peer group or those organizations that do what we do or have a responsibility of communications. And the reason why I put this up here, um, really, quite frankly, is to make sure our community understand the enormous volume of calls that come in and that we are appropriately being compared to those in comparison and not those that are handling a fraction of calls of service. I've heard it time and time again over the last three years. Uh, well, Coral Springs does this. Coral Springs is more effective in such status that they answer their calls faster. I've heard it about Boca. I heard it about Palm Beach. Well, that's much easier to do when you have a fraction of the calls coming in. The Broward Sheriff's Office answered 2.6 million calls per service every single year like clockwork. If you look at the uh, the way we structured this chart, from the left column down, we have, and we're just talking about 911 calls, our 911 call volume is still well above anything in comparison. We answer 1.2 out of that 2.6, 1.2 million and some change, 911 calls for service coming in. And we answer law enforcement and fire rescue. The only agency that is close in remote comparison is the Miami-Dade Police Department. And even still, they only answer, answer law enforcement calls. Palm Beach, they answer 400,000 calls per year in law enforcement, and they are not mirrored and working also handling law, law, uh, fire rescue. And then it starts to trickle down even further. You see Boca Raton at 57,000 calls for ser services per year. Plantation at 54 and Coral Springs at 63. Uh, this again goes back to the importance of understanding what we are dealing with in terms of call volume in this population. The last narrative, for those who can't read it online, just outlines the fact that our organization also has accreditation standards that these other organizations have not yet to acquire or even have the interest of inquire or to acquire because we put our people through pretty much a very vigorous gauntlet of being successful and making sure their credentials are up there. I'll roll over to the next slide. Understanding the work volume and load that's occurring at our comparable agencies, and then looking at the salary, I jump straight to Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, as you can recall from the last slide, answered 400,000 calls per year. They're focused exclusively on law enforcement, and their personnel, if you look at the salary variances over to your right, are making anywhere at the entry level between $15,000 to $20,000 more than our personnel here in Broward County. And if you go down to communications operator number two, different status, different credential elements, it's 17000 and upwards of $25,000 in the top out. And you can see the pattern continue to persist in that our personnel are being underpaid by tens of thousands of dollars. And so this is part of the problem as to ter in terms of why are we losing so many people? It's not just COVID-19. It's not a competitive environment. We have individuals who are answering 2.6 million calls per service per year, and they're being underpaid by the organizations just to the north of them by almost 10, 15, $20,000. I would ask you, would you stay? 
Or would you seek an opportunity for better employment? I'm going to re uh, take you back to the other slide about the demographics of who work in there. 84% of our staff are women in there. They have kids, they have daycare, some of them are single mothers. They need to be paid well to be in order to be competitive against other organizations, or we're going to continue to lose them. I'll go over to the continuing side slide. So one of the things that I was challenged with, uh, or even more so challenged the commission with, was to come back with a proposal and outline on the strategy of how do we get to be number one in this county as we deserve to be? How do I get my 911 specialists and communications folks to be better paid because they're over, they're better trained as it is, and they're overworked. They're being task saturated, right? We talk about standards and minimum standard operating, how many folks are in there. These people are doing a phenomenal job and they're still being underpaid and the staffing levels are not where we want them to be. Looking at the proposed salary strategy that we put together, we want to be 5% above where Palm Beach County is. Uh, and that's what was proposed to the county commission. That's what they'll be voting on in terms of making sure we have enough funds to get this done. And from my understanding, that is going to happen. So by going up 5%, you can see that that'll put us in a salary variance. We're now we're above the best, above this group. We're in the top line. They're getting paid between almost up to $3,000 to $4,000 coming in as a communication specialist number one. And it continues to increase at two and level three. World to the next slide. So one of the things we have to look at is what is the strategy going forward? Understanding and using the APCO as our guide, which is an association of all the different public communications operators and specialists. These are the subject matter experts to set the standards for what is needed in any type of public safety uh, center or communication center. And looking at the numbers and figures of to where we're trying to go, we currently have staffing up to 448 available positions there, but in-house we, we're having about 278. So that's why we have the vacancies as, as it is, and we're already short. In addition to that, the proposed plan, knowing that the population density is going to grow here in Broward County, more folks are coming to live here in this community, we're going to have to get upwards about 534. And the reason behind that, which is that 86 total increase that we're looking at over time, pretty much a five-year strategy to increase over uh, 86 positions. I'm not going to tax the county and say, I need 86 positions right now. We don't, but we know long-term we're going to have to get to that point. And that's a solid strategy that we have in place, but it's going to cost money to get there. And the money is on its way. I'll go to the next slide. It's been stated to me, they said, well, Sheriff, you, you know, if you have 90 vacancies, uh, perhaps we should hire people with criminal records and allow them to work into the 911 communication systems. And let me start with that in itself. Our 911 communication specialists, all our communication folks that are operating in these facilities have passed, have passed excuse me, a very vigorous background check. And it is important because of the amount of confidential information that they have access to. Our people have access to your social security numbers. They have access to a slew of things from driver's license, your home address, we cannot and I will not reduce the quality of personnel in here to just start pumping people inside of these positions and then create a harm to this community. It will be inevitable if we did such a thing. So our application process, if you look at how competitive it is and the things that we are requiring of our applicants from our uh, critical call examination, our pre-screening interviews, the oral interviews, the group orientations, the psychological evaluations, which by the way, of all those competitors uh, in the area, not all of them are requiring a psychological evaluation. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, we will not remove that process as well. The individuals who are handling these calls when 911, uh, 911 emergencies are coming in, if your family member is trapped in the car, if your kid's drowning in a pool, the psychological impact that that have on our personnel cannot be understated, it is tremendous. These, these women and men answer these calls almost repeatedly, jumping from call to call to call. We need to ensure that they are psych psychologically fit to even come into this organization, and then we have the responsibility to maintain their mental health by providing them all the other services that we do, from employee assistance program to mental health care counseling, all these things that we continue as an organization. And so our application pool, we had about 1,156 applicants coming in 2021. Of that, 58 were successful in our application process and made it into our pre-training program. That's 5%. Again, I've heard different strategies, suggestions to say, hey, Chair, maybe you can cut some things out. We will not reduce the quality of the personnel that we have in this organization. It's not going to happen. That is off the table. 
and, uh, and what I would roll in comparison is it is very competitive to get in this organization as it is in the FBI. The FBI takes less than 20% of over 20,000 plus applicants that come in every year because they know and recognize the importance of the special agents that are going to go in the community must be the cream of the crop. And that's the same standard we have for our dispatch personnel. I'll go to the next slide. And so what is the strategy? What does it look like? What are the things we've been launching over the last year plus to try to enhance our recruitment and get individuals to come into the organization to take on this tremendous responsibility? Some of the things we've done, of course, would be going out to different events, social media targeting, um, advertising, and now putting in a hiring bonus packet to where we can give these folks an incentive to come in and leave other organizations in addition to our employee referral program maintaining that. If you look at the slide, 24 plus percent of our applicants that are coming in are coming from our employee referral, which is a good thing. I mean, we're talking to folks that we know that would have the right temperament, demeanor, demeanor and capability to be a dispatcher, and then they're coming over. I'm gonna slide over to, we'll go over to the next slide. And so one of the things, and I'm gonna slow it down a little bit so I can explain this to the community. We currently have three PSAPs spread out strategically across Broward County communication centers where we are operating under. There's one in Pembroke Pines, there's one in Sunrise, and then we have one in Coconut Creek, which we're about to depart. All of those facilities are leased, rented under agreement with the county. Again, the Sheriff's Office per law, we cannot own property, I cannot build anything, but we can partner through the county to lease. That doesn't make sense for the models that are being uh, utilized across the country. We need to build a state-of-the-art PSAP here in this county that gives us the capability to house all our dispatchers inside that site location so that they're not spread out and we're not renting. Uh, we have good partners. There's nothing wrong with Sunrise. We work well with their police department. There has been nothing wrong with Pembroke Pines. There's been nothing wrong with Coconut Creek. But the reality of it is, is that my men and women that serve in these roles don't have a home. We have been leasing and for an account of over $11.4 million, $11.4 million leasing space. And as a county, where's our return on investment? Love Coconut Creek, love Pembroke Pines, love Sunrise. It's not our home. And I would ask you all to imagine that you've put 10, 20, 30 years in the organization and you never even walk inside the headquarters. You never get to see the people that are your administrators and your staff. It is a blow to their morale. And morale matters in this profession. It matters in theirs. They have to feel like they're part of the organization. Last year, excuse me, two years ago, I was tasked with fixing all the active shooter deficiency, excuse me, deficiencies and putting forth a strategy and plan that would make sense that we could sustain all the advanced trainings we brought into the organization under my administration. Something that was key for that was to build the counties, the sheriff's office, first training center. This organization has been around for 107 years. And it's the first time that we're going to have an independent structure, 108,000 square feet, four stories tall, with all the state-of-the-art equipment needed to train not only our organization, but to help out your chief when they need the support. With that, it is freeing up over 21,000 square feet inside of our headquarters. So what I propose to the county is it is time to return our men and women back into our facility in our headquarters so that they can be part of this organization in its entirety and not renting space out to partners where there's no return on investment long-term. The approximate fees or, or uh, funding that we would need is estimated at about $17 million, okay? I'm gonna go to the next slide. Finally, summarizing everything, one of the requests that has been submitted is in order to make us whole, make us competitive, get us to that point where we are the top paid organization uh, when it comes to communication specialists in the Tri-County area, we will need roughly $11.4 million. 11 million plus of that is going to salaries, incentives, things of that nature, which you all understand, but also to include in the retire, excuse me, the recruitment incentives and packages that we talked about from those $5,000 bonuses, et cetera. Uh, and then the last element that I covered was the PSAP uh, building it out. And so that's the overview for what was presented uh, at, the, at the county, almost precisely without uh, shouting and screaming. Um, <laughs> I had I had to throw that in there, a little fun, guys. I know I'm serious right now, but look, the, the reality of it is, is my call to action to this commission would be we need your support. 
We need you talking to your county commissioners. We need you writing letters and talking about the thing that how vital this is. We also need to get back to a point, and I have to get this historical, where the sheriff's office has an 100% uh, control over communications. That's not an ego request. That's a liability, actually, for me to request it. As an elected official, you all understand that. The more liability you absorb, the more likely you're going to have a problem and the more likely they're going to vote you out of office. But this is not new to the Broward Sheriff's Office. Regionalization occurred back in 2013, where the municipal cities agreed that we would come under a consolidated dispatch center. But the Broward Sheriff's Office has always, always handled multiple cities and jurisdictions. It's just part of the organization's responsibility. And yet in 2013, that was handed over by my predecessor, allowed to go under the chain and, and command, so to speak, with the county. I think that was a, a huge mistake. I've talked to my colleagues across this country, part of the Major County Sheriff's Association, in the top 10 sheriff's office in this country, all controlled communication. We cannot have a county of 2 million people, 28 municipal police departments, 28 fire rescue um, individuals that are, or, excuse me, organizations engaged in first responders' responsibility to only have a dual master approach of, I'm the end user, so to speak. I'm the person on this radio. My first responders are the ones on this radio. We are utilizing it. We are the subject matter experts behind it. But the processing behind enhancing technology, enhancing protocols, the county commission has that authority and power as it is. And so no matter how many things I can check off the box and fix from a personnel standpoint, we are still going to be navigating through challenges because of this process of how it exists. Now, my understanding was Sheriff Lamberti before um, he was uh, he lost the election, understood that and was going to fight for it. But my predecessor did not and allow this to happen. And we have gone through some challenges here. I remember to almost 15 years ago and working at Coral Springs Police Department. And when this process was going to occur, being undercover and hearing the complications running through Coconut Creek, Coconut Creek and dispatchers under this new regional system, learning the streets and trying to navigate and figure out where you are. Those problems have been mitigated. But the problems of when I need certain technology, I have to basically go back and present and explain to a civilian-based body who doesn't understand all these complications, it creates problems. When our law enforcement community from the Broward County Chiefs of Police goes and express the importance of certain technologies and certain protocols, and we have to negotiate these things, it becomes a problem. When the Fire Rescue Association and their chiefs of police and leadership has a point of view, and we have or uh, ORT and all these different divisions, it's different. It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to my colleagues. And so this will be my next push, is that I will take on the responsibility. I will bring in the chiefs of police association. I will bring in fire rescue. But we need to do this right, and we need to do it now. <clears throat> The MSD Commission, after one of the worst school shootings in American history right here in our soil, right here in Broward County, have proposed and recommended that the communication system in its entirety go back to the sheriff's office. But it has not yet been executed. And so that's my challenge. That's what I need your support on. I have my staff in here. If we didn't, uh, if I was didn't answer all your questions that you may have, um, we'll be able to follow up. So, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to the commission at this time and answer any questions you have. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sheriff Tony. Um, several of the commissioners do have uh, their hands raised, uh, seeking the opportunity to ask questions. Yes, sir. First, we've got uh, Commissioner Grant. Uh, thank yes, you so much, Mayor, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Sheriff Tony, for gracing us with your presence. Great presentation, very informative have learned a lot and thank you for the history as well, which is very imperative for us to fully understand the scope of what we're discussing. Um, you mentioned uh, in terms of the support, that was one of my questions uh, to see if sending a letter to the county commissioner um, or the county commission in support for the increase of funding was something that you wanted us to do because I believe that we should move in that direction and you have answered that. So I will 
of course, with the support of my colleagues, speaking with the city manager, if we have decided to do so, I think that definitely is something that we need to do. Um, secondly, wanting to know as it relates to the funding, uh, if it is received, um, will the people that are already there, the personnel that's already there, will they receive an increase or will it be the new persons that are coming on board? No, no, ma'am. And thank you for that question. They, the current personnel will receive the increase in bonuses to get them where they should have been. Um, but we will also maintain longevity in that. So anyone that's new, com new coming in will receive that new salary. They will receive that new. Okay. Yes. Uh, and looking at the criteria of these personnel, I was quite pleased to see that it is, is quite strenuous and and detailed, you're not just picking up anyone. So that's a very good thing. And no, knowing that we are looking at um, an industry where it's hard to find people to work, have you considered probably going to the colleges as well, especially the community colleges, and even looking for part-time individuals that can fill the slots? I think maybe that could be appealing to some of those individuals yes, that are there in college. And I'll expand on that. Yes, we are, in short going out to our colleges and universities, but we're also focusing locally on our high schools. One of the things that we have in our organization is a cadet program and an explorer program for both fire rescue and law enforcement. And what I've challenged communication is to, to do right now is to create a program where we're tapping into these young folks in our high schools and giving them an opportunity to get exposed to their craft so that we can hire them. It, it's, it, we've had numerous success stories where a cadet has become a deputy. A deputy has become a captain, and we have a cadet who went the whole gauntlet and now is now one of our colonels, the lieutenant colonels. So we know it's effective, and we've seen similarities with our fire program, our fire explorer program. Same process. We have members that have started as explorers and have become chiefs here. So I think, one, uh, it's incumbent upon us to give our own people an opportunity, mm -hmm. tap into our youth, give them you know a career path that has benefits and everything else, and has a lot of nobility to it, to where they're impacting their own community. Right. So those were really my questions, and I feel that possibly with our marketing team as well, we can figure out a way how to help to send this information out to our constituents to let them know that you are hiring. That's something we can do, whether it's via social media or otherwise, um, and also working with our Chamber of Commerce as they deal with various businesses, as well as uh, individuals that are looking for opportunities. We can work with them as well to be able to assist your department. That's it, Mayor. I yield my time back to you, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lawrence Martin. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I say thank you also. Uh, Sheriff Tony and staff for coming over and uh, addressing some of these concerns of our citizens. A um, couple questions. Back to the actual uh, conversation about the 911 calls. We actually had residents come in our last meeting, which kind of prompted a lot of this um, conversation where they spoke of specific calls where basically they were called 911, they were left on hold, you ended up calling our fire department who responded and I think walked in and the call was still on hold at the time. Understanding the things you just outlaid as far as some of the short falls personnel wise, things of that nature and all that's real. We all experience it. My background is with the feds. I retired. So law enforcement across the country is suffering, trying to ramp up and, and find good qualified people. But as far as the citizens are concerned, we understand that we're on the front line. We've done the work. But when you make that call about grandma, auntie, somebody that mm -hmm. fell down, that goes out the window and they really don't care. What is either the short term versus long term solution right now that we could tell our citizens, this is what you should expect. And we do the same thing. And I try to make it as very clear to, to the public. We have a limited number of police officers. So if you call and your cat's up a tree and we got a shooting on the other side of town, your cat's going to be in tree for a little while. Right. Um, so, and again, sometimes you got to be that direct with people. But again, if it's a staffing thing, let's tell the people what it is. If it's just, we had a bad pinch, three weeks, we're not, the call volume is now within two minutes. I don't know. We made a very good conversation. Don't hang up because you go back into the queue and you start right. over. All this stuff needs to be as plain. And I'm the guy, if you got to step on the landmine, let's step on it. But let's be very clear 
as far as the expectation of what our people are going to be experiencing. So we don't get the calls and then we end up doing this all over again. Yeah, no, look, you, you almost gave me a softball pitch because it's something I want to make sure I covered here. One, the misnomer and information that was put out in the Sun Sentinel was that we had X amount of unanswered calls and we're not answering calls. That's not true. Uh, one, from a, a policy standpoint, every call is returned at some point. What happens is when we have something re referencing a surge, right, an incident take place, maybe it's a shooting, it's a fire, the surge increased. And we have a minimum standard of how many operators are going to be working between 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning based on call history and volume over the last 10 years or so and based on national standards. But what's not predictable is how many calls are going to come in during a surge. The Hollywood incident that kind of sparked all this, for example, had a call surge of over 233%. These calls were coming in almost nonstop. And to your point, sir, you're spot on. Having been a first responder, you're spot on. When you're calling 911, you don't want to hear about national standards. You're expecting that we're going to pick that phone up on the first ring, but that's not the reality. When these calls are coming in, people are abandoning the calls. They're hanging up because it took longer than five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever it may be. Now, the national standard is that we pick up 90% of our calls within 15 seconds. In April of 2020, the national standards was picking up 90% of the calls within 10 seconds. But we, they pushed that back and gave us another grace period of five seconds. So to the community, uh, one, do not hang up these calls. We are going to pick it up. I understand that there's expedience and you're expecting us to pick up these calls. But what happens is if you hang up the call, we're going to have to circle back and call you while other calls are coming in. And we're at minimum staffing levels. And so that's a reality that we need to face. And we also need to educate the community on ensuring that they're not dialing 911 for the cat in the tree. Because the cat, my cat lovers, forgive me at home, it's not a priority. When, some, when we have 2.6 million calls coming in per year, 1.2 million of them are 911, the, the car that rolled over is the priority. The gunshot victim is the priority. And so you are going to fall in terms of the community who's calling for these non-emergency events way back on that queue, as you, 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 you put out there. But we are answering these calls. It's not that we're, okay, no one's ever going to get back to you. We are going to get back to you. It's a policy procedure. It's a safety procedure. But understand that order of operation of call surges, increases in numbers of calls. We are going to be task saturated, and we had to put things in play. Now, you also bring up an important point. To, to go back to my, my position of this needs to come to the sheriff's office. Um, there has been technology after technology that we have recommended to be procured and introduced. One system in, in particular called Entrado. Entrado is a system that automatically calls back, reducing personnel needs to physically dial and, and get that call coming back. That has come up time and time again. County now understands that after multiple conversations with our uh, ORT um, commissioner, excuse me, chiefs of police, fire chiefs, myself, and many others, it's coming into play, right? But this goes back to the end users knowing what they need and should have the decision-making for what we procure and not negotiate technologies and not negotiate policies and procedures. I'll give the community one. I'll, 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 yeah, I hope I answer your question. Uh, I, I was going to go into a scenario, but... <laughs> Yes, and, and again, from the standpoint of just being very, very clear and transparent to the expectations of the individuals in the field who are making these calls, mm -hmm. if indeed any of our citizens experience this situation, what would be their recourse? Because again, I'm always telling people, record the time, the date, and what your experience was, and you know, God forbid nothing yeah. tragic happens, but follow up on that because again we get the phone calls we have access to our you know wonderful fire and police department directly uh specifically as commissioners but again if you're experiencing something like that don't just take it because again perception and reality sometimes mm -hmm. are way over here right. when somebody's choking out or dying 10 seconds seems like 10 minutes that's right 
And because I know y'all maintain the records on these calls, mm -hmm. it's very easy to go back and say, ma'am, you're really on the phone seven seconds right. or 30 seconds. Or if they're on the phone for 15 minutes, I'm sure you and your staff want to know about that particular incident. And I would say take the time now to also explain when we use words like surge and things of that nature, what does that mean in real life? Like I said, you get a shot, a, a mass shooting, you're getting 5,000 phone calls right. from everywhere. That's right. And, and those calls are probably taking precedence over. Yeah. So, so Commissioner, for example, uh, since you talked about the mass shooting, you know, when we're handling, handling these type of calls for services, keep in mind, uh, when you as a citizen are calling 911, that you're probably not the only one calling 911. In addition to that, when incidents are taking place, people are reaching out to their friends and saying, oh, my gosh, this is happening. So that surge that we're talking about is the incorporation of numerous calls coming in new players, new numbers, sometimes we have to identify those numbers to make sure we're able to effectively call them back. And so it is an enormous responsibility occurring. And this is why we have the preference, if it is truly a 911 call, stay on the line. By getting off the line, you're going to put yourself back in queue and there are folks are going to have to generate and come back to you versus if you're already on. And I know that's a hard thing to swallow when bad things are happening. But if you're capable, stay on the line. Um, I saw Tyra move from the side of my eye. Did you have something you want to add? So this is one of our assistants. I'm going to get out of out your way in a second. This is one of our assistant directors of communications. Been with us for quite some time. Comes with about 30 plus years of experience. Yes. I put you out there. I'm sorry. She's a veteran. She knows what she's doing. So just please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We also have text to 911. If for whatever reason oh. you dialed 911, and um, 10 seconds seems like two minutes. 20 seconds seems like three minutes. You can always text the 911 and someone will respond to you via text. Didn't know that. Pardon me? Did not know that. That's good. So you yes. just text 911. Text the 911. Uh, relatively new technology. And it has been around. It, it was launched last, time, last year. Mm. Um, and but most importantly, we want you to use 911. We want you to stay on the line. We don't want you to hang up. Please stay on the line. Do not hang up. And if it's a non-emergency, that cat in the tree, call non-emergency. But what a lot of people, there's a lot of discussion about abandoned calls. And it's such a horrible word. I hate that word, abandoned calls. I mean, we just kicked you to the side. You're never kicked to the side. The call will always be answered. It may not be answered within 10 seconds, but it will be answered. And if you do disconnect, our operators and supervisors will call you back. If we're unable to get a hold of you, if you dial from your home phone, we'll see your address and we'll enter a call for service, a 911 call. If you dial from a cell phone and it's a phase two cell phone, we'll be able to get your coordinates and we'll send the officers to an approximate location. Instead of 123 Main Street, it may be Maine and Oregon. Phase two basically is the newer 911 technology and it's gonna give us the X, Y coordinates and we'll be able to locate where you are. It may not give apartment 125, but it'll give the two cross streets. And then that way we'll send someone out. We're always gonna send someone out. If, we, if you answer the phone and you're not able to talk and we notice that there's something going wrong, our operators are trained to ask you questions like, is there a problem, answer yes or no? Because we don't want the person dialing 911 to be in danger. I mean, you know, if I can, sir, with your time, just I'm going to have Tara explain one other item of interest because I've heard this come up repeatedly about, well, why are they, you know, asking all these questions when I'm calling? Uh, we have an interrogation process, which is important, not only for standardization and things of that nature, but it also adds more time on. So do you want to explain the interrogation programs or IAE? Discipline and its interrogation sounds <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> this is on the phone, right? Interrogation. We have, um, I know, the interrogation questions. Our operators are trained to answer to ask specific questions for sig per signal type. Um, I was blessed today to hear a call where a young lady dialed 911 and she was giving birth. And she was the only person home with her children. And the operator verified her location. She had the phone number. And she was able to give her 
her own pre-arrival instructions to deliver a child. There are other calls where people are having a heart attack and then are telling them exactly what they need to do, CPR, to save someone's life. So, and um, it's police interrogations and fire interrogations. Quite frankly, we don't get very many fires. So we have specific questions to ask the citizens so that we can make sure we put that information in what we call a computer-aided dispatch center. It goes to the firefighters and they send the exact apparatus that's needed. So there's a waste. Many years ago, people would ask questions when someone was sick and they would just put in a sick person call. But now with call interrogation and answering, asking specific questions, we know exactly how to classify the call so we can send the appropriate um, apparatuses and deputies and officers to the scene. So, so to sum that up, Mayor, do you have a couple more questions, please? Um, you certainly may finish your questions, but keep in mind that the other commissioners all have their hands raised. They're, they'll be okay. Um, <laughs> Please take advantage of 911. Track the call if you think it went excessively. Notify the agency so it can be followed up on. Um, and my next thing was really in reference to you, you mentioned about the budget and financial uh, concerns. And you said there's three pieces as far as the county's concerned, the money, the technology, and the staffing, which you acknowledge you're currently in charge of. Um, and I heard two things uh, where... Commissioner Grant talked about the commission supporting you. One of your asks was that, and it sounds like that part's already been covered to me, where the commission has said it will, it's willing to increase salaries to at least match or go 5% above. That's an ask that you, you feel you've already gotten. That's correct. They're, they're coming up on, to vote on that item. Uh, and I would, for my, I would be shocked if we didn't get what we needed at okay. this point. Your second ask is a lot bigger. You're asking to basically take over the budget uh, once it's a, I guess, like we do our budget, we tell the police department based on the city manager and the finance department saying, here's what we have to spend. And you're asking that that budget be turned over the, to your agency not to- Not the budget, but a budget will come with it. It's to return the communications, technology, and protocols element or CAT back under the sheriff's office so that everything is operating under one single body so that we're consistently making decisions for the betterment of this. I guess community. that's the part of that. I just want some clarification. Yep, I understand. A County's budget will come with it, of course, because as it is today, the county is running the communications component and there is a budget associated to that. But we never see that component and I never introduced that as part of my annual budget. They have their budget for what they think is needed for, to operate and handle those communications from the technology side and whatever personnel that they have associated to it. And then we have our budget, which is for personnel. And I guess my last question really, when you say communications, cause that's not strictly just 911. Communication goes across your complete agency, I guess, in, in different parts. It You're does. Just it, talking. It, communication applies to everything that we do. It's every single element of it. So that whole piece is what you're asking. We want for. the whole piece back. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Saray Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and a lot of my questions have already been asked. But first, I do want to thank you, uh, Sheriff Tony, for coming in. I know Lauder Hill is not one of the cities that you currently contract with, uh, but I do know that you are there for us should we need additional help. So I want to thank you. And also thank you for taking your time out to come out and explain some of this to our residents. And I got to tell you, uh, I'm, I'm with my colleagues to uh, support and any resolutions that any one of them want to bring forward to support you with getting the the staffing funding. Uh, I've been a proponent for our uh, first responders to make sure we have the best on on, on team here, uh, but definitely for the uh, technology. I was excited to hear about the text to 911. I'm sure there are a lot of people that may find themselves in a position that texting 911 yeah. might be better than dialing 911. So I am, I am of the mindset to agree that you guys probably need some more input, or if not total input, on the communication and the technology uh, that you need for your officers and everybody out there in the field. So uh, I'm glad you was able to come out here. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm near and dear to BSO. My father was retired BSO prior to your arrival. My sister's currently Taryn Session is BSO out at there, Dania. And I know she's communicating that she's with okay. 
<laughs> she's okay. <laughs> but I, I know she's communicating these I hope things. I thought that. I hope she <laughs> uh, with, with the residents out there, because uh, you got your community engagement team out there. And so hopefully they're able to share these messages and, and not get a bad uh, opinion when you call 911 and it's not answered in five seconds. So do appreciate you coming out. It's very timely. Uh, as my colleague mentioned, uh, we had residents in here just last week. Uh, and so for you to come out this week and share your input and they can get some real time feedback on what some of the challenges that you face, uh, definitely appreciate that. So thank you. Can I, if I could just say one word to that commissioner, I appreciate uh, your comments. And this is for the community who's watching. Um, you know, I took an oath for this county and, and I could care less if you're a contract city or not. Mm -hmm. Your constituents are my constituents. They're the same people that voted you in office, voted me in office and expect me to safeguard them. So, and, and the chief of police knows that, your fire chief knows that. If a call comes out of this city and you all need our support, you'll have the full resources of this office. All right, thank you. Vice Mayor Dunn. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I actually um, just had a clarifying question. A lot of my questions were answered as well throughout the course. I've taken a lot of notes. And you, you already answered a lot of my questions. I, I am curious about one thing, though. Um, you mentioned the national standards for answering the calls. I believe you you said something along the national standards is picking up like by 90 seconds. Is that? National standards is is, is to hope that over 90% of the calls that are answered were, at, were are answered in over 10, in 10 seconds. Now, that was in 2020. Uh -huh. That got moved to 15 seconds. So our benchmark standard to make sure that we are getting it done for all the national protocols is to pick up 90% of our calls within 15 seconds. And so is that what, is that the benchmark that you're hitting now? Yes, it is. Okay. So I'm asking that question specifically because I was at um, the Broward Estates and George Homeowners Association meeting this past week. And this topic came up um, as well. And there were a couple of residents in the audience um, who were, um, made to hold to wait a long time on their 911 call and one person mentioned waiting for two hours um to have a call picked up i, I can i i would be as first of all i'm just gonna be as open i would fire somebody instantly if we had if someone waited for two hours i'm okay. not even gonna negotiate anything um despite whatever surges may occur two hours would never happen it would not happen uh, and I, I know Tara wants to get up, and I'm going to let her get up because, because you, you seem like you struck a nerve, so I'm going to get out of the way. Yeah. And, and I have to say, Tara, that it was um, it was a heated room to be in. Um, the residents were quite unhappy. And, of course, we, sh we were able to share some of the information that our chiefs shared with us. Luckily, the night before, so I was able to, to share that um, information with them. But I just want to be really clear about, you mentioned the standards. What is the current average wait time right now? Well, um, I, I, first of all, if you ever want me to come to any of your meetings, any of your association meetings, I will gladly come. I'll give you my card today, mm -hmm. my phone number. I'd like to clarify some of those things, but we will never, ever have someone wait two hours. Now, it may have been a little, I, I don't understand how that could have happened. If they dialed 911 and the phone rings, it's not going to ring for two hours. Even if they hang up, somebody will call them back. All right. So just to say, I, I find that really hard to believe. Now, yeah, maybe, maybe for her, um, it maybe it was two hours to get service too. So that that's a distinction, right? Yeah, there is. And, 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 and mm -hmm. right. I, let me, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sarah, go ahead, sorry. technical stuff, I'll let you go with. But that's what a lot of the community confuses, right? There's a response in terms of when did we get out there when they placed the call? I'll give, I'll give you a scenario. If we get uh, someone who dials in 911 accident, say, I'm in a car accident, the dispatchers are going to go through the protocols to make sure that no one is injured, life threatening injuries. And then it's going to be strategically deployed out or dispatch out based on the priorities of what's occurring in resources and manpower. So if you tell our dispatchers over the phone that, okay, it's a little thin to better, no one's hurt, we're both pulled off the side of the road, the priority of that dispatch is going to fall lower and lower as the calls are coming in. So we get another call, same city, same environment, something is happening, a shooting, a domestic. 
that's going to require multiple personnel to come out there to safely handle the call. That person may sit there for an hour. It may happen. Um, and then that when that's not abnormal, to, that's not unique to Broward County. That's how it would operate in anywhere in the country. So I just want to make a real clear distinction, right? Mm -hmm. First distinction is how long you're waiting Correct. for somebody to pick up the call. And you're saying that it's no more than 90 seconds on average. We, yes. Right? That's the, calls, the goal. 90% of the calls 90%. within 15 seconds. All right. Okay. So that's the first distinction for us to know residents. And then the second distinction is how long you wait for personnel to actually show up on the scene. That's correct. And a lot of that, again, to the community, the determinant, the determinant that uh, the expedient, so, so to speak, I'm trying to think about just keeping it clean, will be based on manpower, the volume of calls that are coming in, the priority of those calls. You know, here in Lauder Hill, uh, the chief may be short one day, maybe, you know, waiting for somebody to come in on overtime, but we're going to be dispatching out and getting personnel to the cause that are priority to make sure everyone's fine. So yes, the community needs to understand there may be a time where you may call the police department and it is a non-emergency issue that came in through 911, right? You may introduce 911 in a, in a car accident, but then it is triaged, not interrogated, change the words for you. Mm -hmm. it is yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is triaged and determined that it is a non-emergency and then there's gonna be a little bit more waiting period. Okay. And so to be clear again for residents, mm -hmm. you use the non-emergency number. And I guess if we can give that again um, for our, our residents to, to know what that number is. And then um, two, to understand that they shouldn't really be holding a long time for 911 and you're working on a solution. That's correct. Okay. And, and every call is answered. Going back to that notion, because we don't want people thinking, well, it's not an emergency. There's no need for me to call. But, well, there is a reason for you to call if you need our services. It's just not meant to be a 911 call. Dial the non-emergency number. Okay. And then um, my final question is actually, I think uh, my colleague already asked, what does this all mean for residents? Um, yeah, that question was answered. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up is city manager, Jow Smith. Thank you so much, Mayor. Sheriff, what I wanted to ask was, do you guys have any um, promotional materials that you're putting out that gives this information, like the text number? Please call non-emergency so that maybe we can put something out on our yes. website. Yes, yes, it. yes, we do. And we'll make sure we get it over to you guys. When we merged, when this system came into play, we did a big launch campaign working with the county to get the content out there to educate the community. I think which one of the things is you're never really done educating the community. So it just needs to continue to happen. Well, yeah, we'll be happy to put it out for you. Okay, we'll get it over to you. All right, uh, Commissioner Grant. Yes, Mayor, and this is a very short question. Um, while the questions are being asked, when the individuals call, you guys are dispatching, right? Yes. yes. Okay, great. That's important to know. Thank you. Yes, and, and again, there's a two-pronged process to how we dispatch services. This is for the community dispatch services out to you when you go call 911 or non-emergency. Our 911 call takers are the receiving group. They're taking the call in, they're going through these protocols, they're processing it, but simultaneously that information is going over to our dispatchers and our dispatchers are starting to deploy resources, whether it be fire rescue or law enforcement. Thank you. Commissioner Lawrence Martin. Take advantage while I got you here. <laughs> Let me get a sit, hold on. <laughs> Um, and again, just to clarify that one step further, once BSO or 911 makes that dispatch, it's now in the city's hands. In our case, our local law enforcement, our local fire department, or the responding agency. Um, my next question is kind of off the beaten path a little bit, but I know as a matter of um, opportunity that your office has instituted an MOU to work with other cities. Uh, we have this major issue with uh, speeding, aggressive driving, and things of that nature, or something y'all are working towards. Um, can you speak briefly to some of the ideas or thoughts that your office might have in utilizing other cities, uh, pooling resources to help address some of the problems that I think we all experience when it comes to these uh, kids racing yeah, up I and down our streets? I think easily for me to talk about is just some of the partnership things we've done over the last few years since I've been in office, it, you know, it's not abnormal for 
uh, my office to receive a call from the chief. Uh, the chief called me directly of our designees communicating about different elements you all need here. Uh, there was a case where COVID had impacted this community very uh, severely. You lost a lot of your personnel that was doing traffic accident investigators. We sent our staff over here to support that. Uh, there's numerous cases from investigative tools, from crime scene, things of that nature. When personnel short, we, we support it. Traffic enforcement, joint operations, we support it. Uh, again, I'll go back to, look, you may not be a contract city, but when opportunities exist where we can support you and it doesn't compromise anything that we have with a contract city or, um, you know, put us to a point where we're, we're dedicating resources for too long, we're here. Uh, and I think the chief, fire chief will attest to that. We're here for you all when you call. And these operations are going to continue to happen. Uh, what I've said to my colleagues that are chiefs of police in this county is criminals don't care about jurisdictions. Uh, you know, I, I've never chased anybody in Pompano. Then they stop and say, hey, we're going to Deerfield. They, they can care less. <laughs> right. So the, these borders are imaginary. This is one county. And every single thing that occurs in this city impacts the rest of this county. Thank you. All right, Chief, the uh, board is, uh, I'm sorry, Chef, Sheriff, the board is clear. It's, it's all good. All right, I uh, want to thank you for coming Sorry. out and sharing all this valuable information. And hopefully the um, residents of Lotta Hill have a better understanding of uh, what we're all up against. Yes, sir. Mayor, look, anytime you all call, you need me here. I will carve out the time to make sure I come here. This is important. We're all on the same team, and I want to make sure that your folks, your residents here understand that we got your back. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did we need to come to a consensus about the letter? Uh, I, would, I would think more conversation needs to be had. There were two parts of money talked about. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm okay with the first part. I don't, the first part's already done. That's my, That was my point to that question. I don't have enough information for the recommendation about the second part. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hall, is that something that we, we should make another workshop, Mayor? Uh -huh. Do another workshop for further discussion amongst the commission. Okay. All right, we'll move on to uh, item two on the agenda which is update and presentation from school board of Broward County requested by city manager, Desiree Giles Smith. Thank you so much, mayor. Um, with us, we're having the school board of Broward County come up and I believe we have school board commissioner. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> Daniel. Let, let her oh. <laughs> board member, I know, put you to the test. Daniel Foganholy. There you go. <laughs> you know, it, it, get, you guys will get us, it soon. Yeah, okay. give us a couple more weeks. <laughs> yeah, a couple more weeks, exactly. No, but thank you all for having me. Um, thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, before I even get into this, I just want to say thank you. Y'all have been extremely welcoming. Um, we've done a couple of events already, so I yes. feel like I'm home. <laughs> I feel good. Uh, but I appreciate, you know, the warm welcome and the assistance because I know how important it is for us to work together. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so today I am, of course, the District 5 school board member. I represent the schools here in Lauder Hill. Thank you all for inviting me, for allowing me to talk to you about this presentation. Today I want to go through the reports of the 2020-21 academic year and how it's broken into the following categories. I do want to talk about academics, incident reports, um, the smart bond, and address some inquiries that the commission had sent over. So I will get some questions over as well. Of course, this is week two. I'm going to try my best to answer, to answer as many as I can, but I brought the team here. I have Chief Alberti with me. I have Mr. Sam Bays from Capital Programs and Chief Kowalski as well, and also the best aide I can ask for, Mr. Andre Hill. Everybody's familiar with him. So starting off, I do want to talk to, I'm on page four, and of course we did want to talk about um, the scores and the letter grades for our schools. Um, of course, the ones that are updated so far, we did have Larkdale that did opt in to receive a letter grade and they increased their grade from a D to a C. Uh, the remaining schools, they did not qualify or did they opted out to receiving a grade. 
I'll get into that. I see Vice Mayor Dunn ready with the question. <laughs> We're gonna get into it. But of course we have different things in place. Things like on the next slide, we have iReady. And iReady is an online program for reading or mathematics that helps students and teachers determine the student's need, personalize their learning, and monitor, monitor progress throughout the school year. It allows the teachers to meet students exactly where they are um, and provides data to increase the learning gains. High school and center did not use iReady during the 2020 school year. But really what this is, is allows us to focus with progress reports to make sure that we meet students where they are. Teachers understand that. Um, and just really understand how students are doing to make sure we're, we're meeting them where they need. On to the next slide, we have one of the highlights um, that I wanted to point out, and you're gonna see me point back to this, is something I took pride in, super excited about, was Lauder Hill 6 through 12, 100% graduation rate. And this is now six years in a row, Andre. That is something to be, to be proud of. Um, and 0% dropout rate. Um, once again, so posted another 100% graduation rate, 100% of the students um, heading to some college or some sort of scholarship. And of course, I want to say thank you to the city. That's a huge, huge accomplishment for everybody. And it's, it's a big effort from our community, from our community leaders, parents, teachers, principals. It's a lot of help um, to make that happen. And of course, we did make that on, we were ranked above the, on the top 25% of the nation by US News and World Report. So that's something to be proud of, Lauder Hill 6 through 12. I just wanted to say congratulations to them again. So the next slide, one of the things we are looking at right now as well, I know this is one of the questions and we're gonna to get to it, but of course our enrollment. So, so we wanna look at, there are certain situations we'll look at, certain like Kurt Castle Hill that we are over capacity. Um, and of course we have certain situations like Broward Estates that are under capacity. Um, those numbers are something to be looked at. Um, we, we, so we're gonna get into that. And of course, like the possibilities, especially the question came up about merging schools and we wanted to see the possibilities of that. And the question does arise that in the community, it has come up before, but I'm gonna get into that in a second. Uh, but it's important to look at these numbers and I really want you guys to have those records to make sure you look at that. So the next thing we wanna look at is the behavioral incidents and suspensions update. Um, so when analyzed with pre previous years, incident reports continue to improve as we shift the culture on our campuses. Um, of course, looking at the numbers initially on this chart, I was alarmed at some of the numbers. And of course, looking, even sitting down with Andre, we talked about these things and, and I was like, one suspensions, these suspensions, these are unacceptable. And, and these numbers are extremely high when it comes to certain schools. But for example, last year, the percentage rates, and let's look at Lauder Hill, for example, six to 12 was 23.9%. Last year was 491 suspensions. That's a lot. And through the hard work of the school's administrations, incidents have dropped 454 incidents for a reduction over 20%. Also the percentage rate of incidents last year at Parkway Middle was 23.9% with 1,017 suspensions. Through the hard work of the school's administrations, incidents have dropped to 897 incidents. That's a reduction of over 18%. So I wanted to say again, we're not, we don't like to see any numbers on this chart at all. Um, but for me, I believe we're on the right track of getting improvement. I'm sorry, am I looking at the wrong thing? I, the, the, it should be page the eight. Page eight? Yes. Or, and this says 37. Yes, this is this year's. I was talking about last year's. Oh, so that's okay. the improvement of where it's been. Okay. So from 37, you know, we're looking at, it came from 491 suspensions to 37. Okay, gotcha. In Lottery Hill. So of course, you know, it's, we're not where we want to be yet. I believe we have a lot of things to improve. We have a lot of long way to go, but we're on the right track. So it's an accomplishment. Um, to be on the right track. Now the next page, of course, on slide nine, we're looking at the SMART program. And the SMART program, of course, we're talking about renovation budgets. I'm not gonna get through every single slide here, but this is showing what phase we are in each school. This is where we're at, whether it be hiring contractors, if we're in construction, if we're completed, 
and of course, estimated date of a of when we're going to be seeing that completed. It's going to be there as well. So of course, we see Broward Estates, Castle Hill, and a lot of these. These are not updated. We're still waiting for the new report. This is as of December of the updated report. So we're waiting for the new one to come out. Okay, so we're just going to skip ahead here do those. And of course, all these are public to be able to see. So if anybody in the public wants to see these and the progress of their schools or where we're at, they're able to see these, uh, these slides. which brings me to the golden one, we can skip to slide 17. And since day one, coming in, you know, speaking to Andre, but even speaking into the community, number one concern is Parkway for us. This is a big priority. And of course, we've seen a situation of where we were, what had happened. Um, and of course, we're in phase one. Um, and let me just go through that. So smart program enhancements at Parkway Middle School are being implemented using the two phased approach. Um, unused buildings are supposed to be removed or are being removed and necessary enhancements will be implemented in new buildings. The phase one budget is approximately 4.7 million with a projected completion date of quarter two, 2024. The phase two is the classroom additions. The budget for the phase will be estimated upon finalizing the scope option with a projected completion date of the second quarter in 2025. Okay, so of course, phase one, we have fire, sprink uh, fire sprinkler improvements, um, civil site work for demolition, drainage, grading. Like I said, I put this, we're going to put this on the slides here for you. It's there, so for you for your reading. Um, now, the big thing, of course, is funding. This that's that's the issue. Um, we promise that the plan for phase two will be determined with the help of Lauder Hill community through community discussions, surveys, and other methods of public outreach. Several alternatives for the best long-term solution for the campus were considered and the input of various community stakeholders were studied. Now, I believe that the commission today is looking for an update for the discussion from the Lauder Hill community meeting on January 3rd and the board discussion, which was had on January 5th. That was a school board workshop where it was disclosed that the capital budget department will research funding options for the 37 million price tag for the classroom additions. Now, before I continue, you know, because I, I did want to address that, especially with the January 5th, it hurt. That that situation hurt. And I know it hurt you all. It hurt this community. And a lot of trust was lost. Um, and for me, it's uh, me and Andre really talk on this all the time because this is the, this is the main concern for us. This is the main focus for us. Um, but I know that this community was hurt and, and I want to apologize. I know I, I wasn't here, but I can apologize and I know what we're fighting for here. So it's extremely important for somebody to, for everybody to know that you're going to have someone here that understands the importance and is willing to fight for what we need in this community. And we need to fight for Parkway. So I'll continue that. And I know you guys are holding back questions, so I'm, I'm ready, but <laughs> I'll move forward. But of course, at this um yeah, so I am pleased to report that my colleagues and I will be deliberating on these funding options starting next month during the final budget workshop. At this workshop, the district's educational facilities plan, which is the DEFP, will be discussed, which usually includes the planning of nearly 200 million in funding for capital projects. As the board representative, I ensure you that I will explore each option at disposal, rather it be the DEFP, COPS, the capital reserves for completing phase two of this project. If the project is to be included in the DEFP, it's a multi-year plan that will be adopted by the board in September. Now, I urge the Lauderhill community to stay, of course, in tune. Things, these meetings will start in June, July, um, and September discussions, and I'm sure that all the funding inquiries will be answered. Um, but between that time, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work in the community to make sure, whether it be town halls, whether it be meetings, of course, even with the HOA getting out here and talking to more leaders in our community to make sure that that we can address any concerns and make sure we get questions out of the way. Now, one of the questions that we did have was the demolition area at Parkway, and there were questions about converting that area into a temporary parking lot. Um, pending the new uh, construction, this would assist with daily traffic issues during drop off and pickup. 
Um, after meeting with Principal Flowers and her team and touring the construction site, the school is not able to accommodate that request at this time. Um, building a parking lot would be a temporary measure and will add more money, time, restraints um, on the project and the campus. A street path would need to be created, grounds packed and prepared, pavings, permits, et cetera. And in addition, everything will need to be ripped up and removed once phase two would begin. Um, one of the things, especially we talk about, I, I don't like Band-Aid options. And this, that was looking like an option. Of course, traffic with the pickup area, if anybody's familiar with that seat, the street, it's very small. And that school is operating a number of buses. So between traffic, the request was seen if it could be a parking lot to help. But being that we would do that, it would cost money, more time, it would push it back. And then of course, there would be another phase that it would just push everything back. So that's why that's not an option that we're looking at right now. Um, therefore, the school's administration will remain focused on preparing the campus for efficient operations in the August start. Managing the capacity usage while being mindful with the class size requirements, treating the grounds to minimize or minimize mud, dust matters during wind and rainy seasons, and securing canopies between the buildings. Now, of course, like I said, you can find this information, like those slides that we were looking at. You can find that on the SMART, the SMART program website, which is bcpssmartfutures.com slash Lauderhill. Now say it again, bcpssmartfutures.com slash Lauderhill. Now, I did want to take the time, of course, the inquiries that were sent over by the commission, and I wanted to discuss that. Um, of course, which schools in Lauder Hill were still up for discussion as far as combining schools go? That was one of the first questions. Now, the community in Lauder Hill rejected the K through eight educational opportunity to combine Broward Estates Elementary School and Parkway Middle School at the July 22nd, 2021 community meeting. And the results of this community survey, the district has elected not to move forward with the K through eight model. Furthermore, I know that there's a lot of speculation that we're considering models um, to model of schools like Broward Estates and Larkdale due to their enrollment. As today's workshop, we do not have any plans to incorporate or merging any schools at the moment. Now, this could change in the future, but let me give you a little insight on it. Um, our demographics, department monitors, student flow reports such as enrollment at the beginning of the year and meets with our board around September, October to go over model options for certain schools. If any schools in the Lauder Hill community are to be considered, we will always come back to the community. And that's a normal practice for us. It's not something that is gonna be a business decision and strong arm. We have, we have to have the community on board and if they're not on board, then we can't move forward with those decisions. So like I said, meetings, HOAs, surveys are extremely important in this process. Now the school district of course is over 40% black which the administration top level representation, we wanna see how that reflects. I did put that chart on there. And so I do want you know you all to take a look at that. This data is readily available to the public for the 2020, 2021 annual education equity plan. It's accessible on the website, the EEO department page, which is page 80. And of course you can see that it's highlighted on, oh, I'm sorry, this is page 24, slide 24. Move way ahead here. Then you can meet me on page, on page 25. Next slide. Fantastic. Now, next question. School board is asking for a, four, a $1 million uh, tax raise. What will those funds be used and for how much will be earmarked for our district? Now, the school board voted to allocate those funds for the following. 75% would increase compensation to recruit and retain teachers. 17% would provide funding for school resource officers and school safety staff. 8% would preserve important programs such as mental health programs and personnel. Now all comp compensation will be subject to collective bargaining. Uh, the public will have an opportunity to comment on dispersal of funds generated prior to the distribution. These funds will not be available until 2023, 2024. Now, of course, the impact on the taxpayers 
Average homeowner with a home value of 393,755 would invest approximately $274.22. That's average $23 per month. And then a condo owner averaging $13 a month. Now, if the referendum passes, it will generate $177 million for Broward County Public Schools and $45 million for charter schools annually, a total of approximately $227 million in fiscal year 2023. The referendum will expire in four years. And one of the things to keep in mind, of course, is these are the numbers that were released for the referendum to the public. Um, to promote that, but of course, this is one of the things as the board we're fighting for is more transparency. We want more and more transparency. And of course, it's it's very clear of where they're at right now, 75, 17%, 8%. But that's one of the things that we've heard loud and clear from the public. We want more transparency. So that's what we're, we're going to ask for. Now, another question we had was, what are the plans to improve the feeder pattern and the curriculum at Endeavor Primary School? So at the moment, there are no feeder issues that we are aware of for the I zone in this area. As asked by one of the commissioners today, Endeavor Primary Learning Center, EPLC, has a K through three model. Students then attend Royal Palm for grades four through five. This includes transportation if eligible and students stays more than two miles from the school. For six through 12 grades, students then feed in uh, to Lauder Hill, six through 12, STEM med by 100%. Now there's sufficient room at both schools should the students enroll to enroll at Royal Palm or Lauder Hill 6 through 12, please remember they have school choice where the students can attend other schools in Lauder Hill, except Castle Hill because they're at full capacity right now and beyond. This is usually a favorable option when students are following other academic programs to meet their desires. As per question on improving the curriculum, there's no magnet or innovative programs at EPLC due to the K-3 model. As you are aware, we're striving to make sure that uh, so all students to reach a certain level of competencies by third grade. The K through three model promotes early learning opportunities and high quality comprehensive services and daily classroom experiences to help develop skills that are important for kids at that young age. And please keep in mind that the students can still apply for the STEM programs um, and the Montessori program at MLK as well. And then also we, we did have a question about mental health and counseling services. Um, and it's an extremely important and that was an important question for me also, especially with the time that we've been through COVID. We see a lot of people being affected, being away from their classmates, teachers, and having that learning. But our student services department provides a short term individual and family counseling uh, to help address challenges across several areas, including family issues. We look at divorce, parenting skills, abuse, abandonment, Second time we hear that word today, I don't like it. Uh, social issues, bullying, uh, self-esteem, peer pressure, emotional issues such as anxiety, depression, anger, stress, and conflict re resolution. The school-related issues we have, of course, study skills, ADHD and ADD, attendance and behavior issues in class. These services are to all residents, are private, confidential, free of charge, with licensed therapists, and are available in numerous languages, including Spanish, Portuguese and Haitian Creole as well. Oh, I'm sorry, next slide. I keep skipping ahead. I apologize. On page 28 right now. The next question right now we have is there a goal to have a resource officer in each school? And if so, what is the time frame? And what other safety measures are being discussed? to address safety concerns or school concerns. Now, there is, a, is there, although several of the security measures are confidential and we cannot be shared in detail with you today, I can attest that the district has made vast improvements since the creation of the safety, security, and emergency preparedness department a few years ago. Um, so I'm going to actually call up Chief Alberti to come and share some information about security measures. Again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Alberti, and I'm a Chief of Safety and Security and Emergency Preparedness. I've missed uh, Dan here. Well, I've been here about two weeks. So I'm also new. I'm going to give you a brief uh, little bit about what we do here, our security, safety and security. I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, been a police officer for 24 years. 
Uh, I've been with the city of Kissimmee. I work for the Orange County School Board as a uh, school police for the past seven years, um, and now I'm here. So my background is both uh, in local policing as well as school board police. Um, I just started here two weeks ago, so my information, I'm still being briefed on a lot of the information that we have, and thank for this opportunity to be able to meet different people, major uh, chief of police here. Um, so that was a great opportunity for me to, uh, to be here today. So that was uh, gives me a good chance uh, to uh, introduce myself and say hello to the folks. I brought out our chief of um, special investigative unit here for uh, Broward County Public Schools here with us. And he's going to help me out with some questions in case you guys have questions for me that I don't have answers. Um, so me being here for the first two weeks, I can tell you that um, a lot of good work is being done uh, behind the scenes. Um, I will tell you that my predecessor established a lot of layer approach into uh, the security systems for our schools, not just uh, physical uh, things that you can see, but things that you also do not see or may not be aware of that perhaps may not be disclosed in the open forum, such as this. Um, we have a multi layered approach that it not only includes um, drills and perimeter fencing, uh, but we're also talking about training because we can we can put money into safety and security all day long, but if the folks that are out there at the schools, the parents, the students, if we're not educated or we're not trained, um, all that money and safety and security uh, would do us no good because we don't have um, the ability or the knowledge to put that into action. So to me, a big component of safety and security is to make sure, like learning about the 911 and things like that, sharing that information with everybody else. That's key for us to share. So we're um, instituted a 365-day, 24-7 uh, district security operations center. My predecessor did that. Um, it, it's been run by folks that take calls in and they handle all the tips. They come in either through the 45 Florida, but also through Alyssa's Alert and many other avenues. We also have an email system where you can actually send a tip in. So those are all monitored into one location. They're um, investigated and divvied out, working with local law enforcement and our investigative team. Uh, we have a proactive threat assessment uh, model and tip, um, and tip monitoring system. We have perimeter gates um, that are throughout our, our school system. And our single point of entry, uh, where we focus everybody to come in through one entrance to the school, so they have to be checked into some kind of badge or ID process. Um, our training, one of the one of the first uh, mandates or orders I have is to also ensure that we are providing for our school district and everybody here, because uh, it affects everyone, is to have plain language. What does that mean? That means that whenever we have an emergency and we have a code red or a code black, we are using language that everybody is able to understand uh, plainly and also in different languages because we have people from different, speak different language to make sure that we're able to, uh, they know what it means. So we have an event happening at a school or near one of our schools that everybody knows what that language means. So that's one of my first uh, tasks to make sure that we're um, in implementing that rolling that out. So I'm in the beginning stages of trying to, um, you know, get that process uh, going. Uh, with regards to the SROs, I brought uh, uh, Chief uh, Kowalski with me. I want to make sure that he also um, addresses the question regarding SROs. I believe SRO question, um, you guys had a, a question regarding the SROs. Um, so I will tell you this much. I've, I've been here two weeks, and um, I'm very proud of a lot of the work that these people have been doing. They've been working hard. And they've been working very hard. Uh, so I am just so happy to join the team, happy I've come with full of energy to make sure that we're all working together, not just um, with, within the school board, but also with all you guys in all the cities uh, that comprise Broward County. So um, I don't know if you had a question regarding the SROs that we want to ask, or you have any questions for me. I gave you, I, I gave you, <laughs> I gave you a brief uh, overview of the things that we're doing that you can see as far as security, but some of the, you know, um, granular details, uh, you know, we have to leave out. Mr. Alberti, we, we appreciate you being here, uh, and we've got lots of questions for you. Uh, but before we uh, take those questions, I wanted to uh, recognize the presence of uh, State Representative Derek Campbell. Mr. Campbell, if you stand so everybody can see you. All right, and we appreciate you, you being here. Uh, in terms of uh, hands that were raised by the commission, uh, the first was uh, number two, which is uh, Lawrence Martin. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Daniel, I appreciate you 
buckling up and coming on in here. And we run into each other probably, I think, three or four times in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, you kind of know my passion for, for the area. Um, one of the couple of people up here that's kind of homegrown and been in this area literally my whole life and have a real passion for where the community is headed. Um, you touched on the base and I'll premise everything I'm going to say by understanding you've been appointed. Both of you in this case have been here for less than a month. Um, and at least in your case, you have a finite kind of clock that's ticking. And like I told you, when we first met, I'm going to squeeze every second ounce of time out you that I can to get what we uh, hopefully get the ball moving. Understanding this has been a ongoing concern problem in our area for years. Don't expect you to come in and, you know, move mountains or make miracles happen, but we're going to get what we can from you. Uh, in reference to uh, specifically the parkway scenario and the finances that we're talking about, um, historically, and I think everybody knows this, this goes back to the early 2000s. Uh, this school has been designated as a knockdown start over school for, from that time, and that's documented. And the fact that the school system took it upon itself or the contractors, I don't know who put the cart before the horse, brought the community together, showed us some beautiful renditions of what the school could look like, had us vote on which direction we want to go. And at the end of the thing said, guess what? You got no money. Why do that to the community, to the people, to only get us riled up more understanding uh, that was the case. Second part of that move forward, Construction comes in. No, I'm sorry. We we contract someone to paint a nice, pretty mural on the office part, and everybody, oh, we're moving in the right direction. Only to have construction come in, knock down half the building a month or two later, and then walk away, put up some fencing, and now we, we got kids going to a construction zone for school with no real long-term uh, plan as to when this thing's going to be revisited. Um, it's frustrating to say the least. And again, it's nothing I don't think you're going to fix before you get out of here, but we're going to keep bringing it to the attention of those that come before us. Uh, in that same vein, and looking at even the report that you presented here and the questions that I pose and looking at what they want to do with the 1% uh, percent mill, that money spread across the whole district. Okay. The, me the mental health, everybody needs it. The increase for teachers is going to affect everybody. Nothing in the proposed document that came out where some schools were identified to get certain monies. I think we had one school in that area that, that fell into the proposed funding for some repairs and or increase in services. Again, not a good look for this district prior to you getting here. I'm going to keep saying that. Um, so I'm not even really sure where, you know, Quite honestly, I was hoping this room would be packed with people because we get so many people that complain, yell, scream, kick, and make noise on the outside. We hear it all the time everywhere we go. But when it, the rubber hits the road, you know, we're dealing with it. I don't know if we got people online. I'm hoping we do. But these are the opportunities that the city of Lauder Hill is taking to bring the people to the front that have the control, that have the, op the information. But we need the community to be stepping forward. Um, but we're going to continue to carry the flag, make the noise, do what we have to, to try to at least keep the information at the forefront of, of the seriousness of this situation when it comes to the schools in our area. Parkway is just one of them, but it's, it's probably the most egregious without saying. Briar to States falls in the same. I've lived in that neighborhood since the 1970s, early 60s, late 60s. The school looks exactly the same as it did when I attended there back in probably 74, 73, 71. The school looks exactly the same. Other than some paint and maybe a couple of murals, the school design is exactly the same. That should be enough for anybody to say, you know what, something's wrong there. We've built beautiful new schools all over Broward County. Um, and we're still traveling. Parkway, same thing. School's been the same since all of us grew up in the neighborhood you know, from the 70s. Um, my other concern has to do with the fact, again, we, we're bringing in new blood. I like that. New ideas, that's good. 
but is anybody paying any attention to, and you, you made mention of what I said about the cultural makeup of our schools and our communities. Lauder Hill is a, has a huge Caribbean influence, huge African-American influence. Um, are we being culturally diverse in our thinking when we're bringing in individuals that are going to be able to address some of the concerns, even from a law enforcement standpoint, with a background in, in community corrections? I know there are certain places I go into, I got to be thinking about that group of people don't necessarily think the way I think. So step back, take a blinders off, look, look at it from a perspective where I'm not just running in and running over people, where again, I would venture to say some of the thousand plus suspensions but because I didn't understand what little Johnny was talking about or what Pierre, how his interpretation of what I was asking him to do when. So are we keeping in mind at the forefront, the cultural diversities that our schools encounter and that we um, have to be weary of uh, this, this community, this, this commission, our professional services probably is one of the more diverse, large, medium, large size cities that you're going to encounter. And uh, I think we all take that quite serious from the standpoint, not that we all agree on everything, but we recognize there are differences in some of the things that we deal with as far as the community concerned. And I, I would venture to say the school board needs to make sure it pays attention to that and has people at least in the, the, the upper echelon or mid management that can say, Hey, you know, let's take a look at this or it's training. I don't know. But again, you know, those are things that, this is a listening session. I don't expect because of the time frames that we're talking about that a lot can be affected, but I think you have an opportunity uh, to lay the foundation for things to start moving in the right direction. Uh, we've had school board members that have been in the community for years and years and years. It's a push pull. I understand like, but that's like a commission. You get one vote. Um, but we want our voice and if nothing else to be heard. Um, if it means, tell us what we need to do to help get things moving. Be it be more visible at the meetings, be it bring more people to the table, be it, uh, I don't know, campaign, writing, I don't know. But it just can't continue down this road. And say Parkway is just one big tip of the spear where that school is just, it's, I mean, you've been out there, I have to tell you, you know what it looks like. Um, and it's, it's no school in Coral Springs resembles it. No school in Parkland resembles it. No school uh, in the south part of the county resembles it. And we've been looking at that for the past 30 years plus. So not only you as our school board representative, but Mr. Campbell as our house representative said the same thing to Dr. Osgood as our new Senate representative. Uh, as Omfroy is aware of it as our other senior representative, our county commissioners, Everybody's seen this problem and it's just time for something to happen. So, you know, I, as a, as a voting person who's going to be asked to vote on a one mil increase of three plus hundred dollars to a lot of our seniors who are on fixed incomes for the money to go elsewhere. I couldn't support that in good faith. I'm just being, I'm being real, real, real honest. Now, if I know that money's going to be earmarked somewhere to help the schools in our district, in our city, then it's something we can talk about. But right now, based on what I've seen written, what I've seen dispersed uh, from the school board and, and through other articles, that money's going to get spread out all over Broward County. And we're still in the same boat, but we're going to have to fight with our citizens about where that $300 plus worth of taxes come from when it hits their tax bill. But they don't see the school board, they see the city a lot of hell. So you got a big lift for seven months. I think you're up to the challenge. Uh, you personally, uh, your personality, and you're willing to step forward. I applaud you. Uh, it's a heavy lift, but we're going to ask you to do whatever you can to help push those things forward. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Next up is uh, Vice Mayor Dunn. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the information. I just wanted to understand two of the data points a little bit better. Sure. Um, Commissioner Jabo already. My third question was going to be about the money, but you heard. Sure, sure. <laughs> I, I completely agree with what he said. So I'm going to take question three off my list. But question number one was about the grade level. 
I didn't understand um, opting out, not applicable. Help me understand that. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So the um, Florida Department of Education, uh, should I say the legislators, they passed a bill where schools may opt out of a school grade due to the pandemic. So not everyone was eligible. Either you were not eligible for it or you opted out for it. So not, eligible, not everyone received a school grade. Um, even if you did opt into it, you had to apply for it, you had to be eligible for it. So you had certain criteria that you had to meet in order to be eligible for a school grade. So even if you did opt into it, not all of our schools were eligible for it, be to the standards that they set for that criteria. So unfortunately, only one school within the Lauder Hill um, boundary opt into it, as well as qualify for it. And that unfortunately is uh, Lardell. But that didn't stop the schools from monitoring the students. Um, although the school itself did not receive a school grade, we was able to still monitor the way that the school um, moved forward, as well as our students. And we moved away from the, and I'm pretty sure you heard the governor say it a lot of times, move away from the standardized testing, because a lot of our teachers were teaching just to the test. And that's not good for our students. So what we did was we looked at homework. We looked at what the, student, what the teacher was actually signing. We looked at a lot of the progress um, reports. A lot of us misused or, or kind of undermine what progress reports are for. Um, a lot of our parents were just requesting progress reports and that's the only time that they would get them. So we utilize a lot of progress reports more often as well as a lot of the iReady is only one of the tools, but they receive a plethora of, of different tests. And we use all of this combined into a, one big ball and that's how we were able to continue to monitor our students. So although they were not able to receive a school grade, that did not stop our schools from monitoring the students and how they did. But unfortunately there was no way to put it on paper how the school itself did. So did how are our students doing? How do we know if, like what's the baseline? How do we know how well? So the way that we monitored how the students were doing was one through their promotion rates, because you know, if you don't do well, you unfortunately not get promoted to that next grade, as well as the school is also looking at, and I think they do a lot of workshops. You all do multiple workshops and you just went through a, more, a workshop where they where they looked at the I'm not sure if you wanted to speak to that how they did the um how they did the um the progress monitoring or the progress flow. Do you remember that workshop? Was you, okay. uh, you only could you have share? Them, could you weeks. when you get a moment as a okay. follow up? Could you Absolutely. share the data? I think it's important for us yes. to get a sense of um, how how they how they're progr progressing, how they're doing, <laughs> and then I'm yes. curious to see how. Um, COVID and this change kind of impacted our kids. Right. I know um, Commissioner Grant has spoken before about the psychological impact of COVID on our young people, but I'm also, in addition to that, I'm curious about the academic impact. Right. And so if maybe there's another way that, that you use to benchmark how well the schools and the students are doing, if you could share that information with us, that would be really helpful. Absolutely. And we did look at summer models as well. If we had to have that summer experience, I know last year we did that great summer experience for the students that did fall behind. We're also looking at it, that again. Um, those benchmarks that we try to make up, again, the pandemic kind of left us no option as to how to grade it because the state basically said, wipe everything off the table. They didn't even test a lot of them. They didn't use the tests for a lot of them. So we kind of were left on our own with that. And a lot of our guidance comes from Tallahassee. The board doesn't make a lot of the decisions that a lot of the um, public thinks that the board does. We follow the direction of the, of the Florida Department of Education. So when they leave us and that on our own, we have to come up with those benchmarks ourselves. And then we come out with summer experiences and we also look at that as well. So that's not off the table. If our students need it, we most definitely will get that, but I most definitely will follow with yeah, you. Yeah, that would be that. really helpful to give us some baseline. And then my second question is, um, I'm trying to understand the suspension data. I think that was slide. Uh, slide eight. Slide eight. Slide eight. Yes. yes. So I think anecdotally, you mentioned um, that the suspension for Lauder Hill six to twelve last year was four hundred and ninety-one. Correct. And then right now it's thirty-seven. Um, could you help me to understand why the drastic decrease? And do you know, like, what's 
Because I, 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 I know that there's fighting happening over there. So to go from, that's like a real huge For sure. shift. It is. And it's hard work. I think with um, the administration there, the principal, we've been in touch with them. And of course, like I said, 37 is still not, we're still not happy. That's so is it that shift. they're not suspending kids anymore? Or is it that kids are behaving better? They're be yeah, it's, so it's, that there's no need to suspend them. Yeah, I, they're, they're, no, they're still acting up and there's still suspensions happening. They're not doing it less. Um, I just do think it's between administration working better. Of course, security, <laughs> it's, it's getting better for them to adjust to not have as many incidents because they're having more hands on approach. So there's more people being involved. Could, could, could COVID have been a factor there? Yes, it is. It was as well. Okay, so that that sounds more like it because I'm like, wait, that's from a big jump. 490 yeah. something to 37, it can't just be because it's. Correct. I mean, I. Okay, and and that trend is across the school, across all of the all schools. schools. Correct. So then, Correct. Mr. Mayor, I will take that. I think that that's the real answer. It was COVID. <laughs> Thank you. But it is also like I like you said, it's still something that we're visiting schools. We're still talking to the principal because we do see incidents happen. Some are even worse than we don't see that on the numbers as well. So you don't see the incidents that are happening that are escalated, that are very bad. So for us, it's really working with the administration principals to see how we can get better, whether it be SROs and security. Um, it's important that we, we show up. We show up and speak to the leadership to understand what's going on in every school because every school is different. Yeah. Well, from my conversations with some of the kids, um, yeah. Well, anyways, I'll talk to you about that privately. Thank you. We already have a little, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah, we'll some more. All right, thank you. Next, uh, City Manager, Jal Smith. I just wanted to, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say, I know the school board is looking at starting its own police department internally. Is that correct? So we do have our own uh, police officers. Uh, Chief Kowalski, if you can come here and brag about your team, uh, I would love that um, because we do, have, we do have a... Uh, we do have our own. We I know you own. guys have, but I mean, providing, I guess, SROs internally, that's what we were advised, that you were going to actually start um, having police officers internally. That's as correct, ma'am. So we currently are slotted for 10, sir. We have one, 10 additional, and we have one that one um, right now that it's on board. So we're looking for additional nine. So if you know any good candidates, um, you can please send them our way. I think that was a little different. I think the chief, Chief Stanley, had you been... I guess we had an understanding that you guys were going to start doing like Miami-Dade and Palm Beach where you provide your police officers internally. I believe the information is correct. You had like a pilot program where you're going to um, have a few SROs placed in the school. So that's my understanding. I know you're conveyed with. Uh, but not a department. Yes. A de yes. Like a whole. So my name is Craig Kowalski, Chief of Special Investigative mm -hmm. Unit. What we we currently have a investigative unit, which is 19, including administration, 22 law enforcement officers, right? So we call them school safety officers. And the difference between an SRO and a school safety officer is really who pays their salary. School safety officers, the school board of Broward County pays their salary, SROs, the municipality or sheriff's office pay their salary. So what we are doing with our department, we are adding 10 additional school safety officers where their fo focus is primarily going to be assigned to a school location. Um, so that's where we're, we're going as, as you heard from the sheriff earlier with dispatchers and, and probably within your own local um, department, uh, hiring is challenging right now. Um, so we're coming up with innovative ways to get people on board. And as the, as the chief said, um, if you know anybody, send them our way. <laughs> One question I have is, I know, I think you said at Parkway you had 1,000 incidents, and then this year I think it was 800 incidents. Are you looking at putting any of those personnel at Parkway Middle School? No, it was, um, yeah, it dropped on, which, which school was it you said, Parkway? Parkway. I thought you said it was like 1,000 and it dropped to 800. I'm not. Correct. It was 1,000 and it dropped down to 897. So I'm wondering if we're if you're considering placing one of those at um, Parkway, some additional safety officers. Well, the answer is yes. Chief Kowalski just answered that question for me. Yes. Yes. 
For, for the benefit of the public, as soon as I go through the question from the commission, we'll open to the public. So there are just uh, two more questions coming from uh, uh, commissioners. Um, Lawrence Martin. Uh, hold on, it's the, it should be Saray Martin. I'm sorry. I, I just turned it off. My question has been answered. Thank you, Mayor. Right, fantastic. Uh, then next is uh, Commissioner Grant. Yep. Thank you so much, Mayor. I'll try to be brief. No, I didn't skip you. You're next. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be brief. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for a great presentation. Extremely informative. I always like when we have enough information that we can uh, peruse through. So thank you so much for that. Um, as it relates to the grades of the school, uh, I've been here now for just about four years and the grades have been consistent in some respect. And in my estimation, not good enough. And so on average, we see C's across the board. And now we've learned that there are schools that have opt out possibly because the grades are not that, they figure more or less that the grades are not gonna be that great. One school receiving a B. Um, and when we look at other schools across the county, um, schools that are very close to us um, in other cities, their grades are much higher. And so we understand that even though this, the demographics of the city of Lauder Hill is a little bit different in terms of diversity, um, and culture and otherwise, um, then possibly a sunrise or a coral springs, it lends one to try to understand why so, right? Um, going into the schools, I see that we have great teachers and these teachers care. Um, Commissioner Jabba Martin mentioned in terms of having diversity in the schools to be able to address and assist her, our students. And I think that it's there really. Um, but when, when you look at it, you're trying to figure out, we know that these kids are just as intelligent as the other children across the, the county and the teachers are, are also as engaged. So I'm trying to figure out what the root cause is for these grades to be so low, number one. And most importantly, what can we do to be able to assist? Um, figuring out what the issue is, then we'll be able to find the solutions, right? So that's my first question. And secondly, um, trying to understand as well as it relates to funding. I oftentimes, it's, it baffles me um, when I see other schools that they have the technology, they have all the resources, and there is one Broward County school system. Nonetheless, the city of Lauderdale Hill does not get the same amount of funding. I would like to understand how the funding is allocated and why is it that we don't receive the same amount of funding as other schools as well? Thank you. Sure, and um, thank you, Commissioner Grant for the question. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I think that's one of the questions, of course, like you said, it, uh, Andre was speaking to earlier, Mr. Hill was speaking to earlier. That's something to look into. And I think that's something we're not gonna know right off the bat right now, um, but it's something that we need to work on together. Of course, going into a new year, but really getting a better understanding of curriculum or how we can get those things to improve. Because like you said, for the past couple of years, it's consistent and we need improvement. We need to get better on everything. So if we see different things that we're focusing on, whether it be security, we look at different things, of course, construction, all these things, but education is the key. We wanna make sure that these, these schools are getting better. So it's something that we need to work on together to get there. Um, and yeah, and then same thing with the referendum, same thing. You, you spoke on that. Commissioner, it's more transparency to understand where the money is going. And the community is demanding that. We want that. So it's something we need to speak to as well. But all, all the cities or the schools don't receive the same amount of monies. So if there's like $10 million given, sure, it's not evenly distributed. So the school board does uh, calculations when it comes to equity. So no one gets uh, the same amount of money. If, you know, if we get a hundred million dollars, we all, we don't just divide it up by the number of schools and send it out. So we do have a formula where we put it out through equity. So if your school needs more resources, whether that would be through programs, whether that be through partnerships, so you may not get as many laptops, but I have different partnerships and spend that money elsewhere or, or other ways. Um, you may basically get, um, 
a new lab where basically you get something behind the scenes. So the money is being spent um, based on equity and not equal amongst all of the schools. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but the money is, is built, spent on an on a equity um, formula. So I guess that's where our school board member goes in and fights for us and, and speaks on our behalf in terms of what the needs are. That is correct. So they look at basically what the needs is, are, are for that and it comes to, and it, it comes full circle as well uh, with your first question as to the grades. If the grade, and, and, and I'm happy you brought that up because a lot of times you see a grade through other schools and they may be an A or B and they may have an A going across the board where you may see a school with C. So how do we grade that? And what we do is we look at learning gains. Uh, we look at the, comp the competency um, blocks as to where they fall within the competencies with, with math, with reading, um, reading comprehension, and we look at learning gains. So that learning gains give us a point system, and within that point system, we can then see how the schools and kind of break it down a little bit as to the, the slope of learning. Um, so you may have an A, and you may have an A next year, but I don't see any learning going on. So you started out high, and you ended high, but I can't see where, where the learning is, and that's basically where we go we dive deeper. And that's what I tell people all the time. Please do not look at school grades. School grades do not tell the full story of how hard our teachers and our students are working. You have to dig deeper and that learning gain slope kind of tells us how that school is learning. So yes, we unfortunately will have a C the next year, but we're, we made it so far that we're, we're right on the precipice of a B. Mm -hmm. And that next year, yeah, we do kind of go over that line and we get to that B, but we get that by knowing that, okay, we have that learning gain. How can we get them over? And that's when we go into our, 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 our equity, um, evaluate, uh, equity um, tool and we say, well, what other resources do they need to get them over that B? So we look at those learning gains and what do they need and we kind of match the two. So it's not two separate concerns, or two separate issues. And I'm happy you asked the question the way that you did because it all ties into one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks. All right. Uh, Commissioner Lawrence Martin, then we will open to the public. Try and make this real quick, Mayor. Thank you. In reference to that question that was just asked, how is the money divvied up? I think the, 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 the naked eye sees socioeconomic tax base, people that pay more taxes in their communities have better schools. Let's call it what it is. It's what we see at the naked eye. Um, the 33311 has just been neglected for lack of a better word, over the course of the years, and the schools represent it. So we can talk about the teaching and the moving and the shaking and all that. But again, if I tell you I'm 50, I'll be 59 years old, and I've lived in that area since I was seven years old, and the schools look the same, you know, that speaks volumes, period. Um, I do have one follow-up question that's referenced to um, the SOU, the school resource officer versus, I'm going to call them the yellow shirts. Are those the guys security that are currently in the schools now? Um, uh, that's your security team. The, 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 no, that's, that's another level. So there's three different levels of security. Four. Can you just touch on that real quick, please? So there's a statute that talks about safe school officers. There are school resource officers, guardians, guardian vendors, and school safety officers. Of those that are law enforcement officers are SROs and school safety officers. Does that help? And the yellow shirts are just... They, they are a program that the um, state developed shortly after MSD and our board um, reluctantly chose to move that direction because of the timeliness that we had to do for implementation. Um, so we implemented the guardian program and to the day the, I mean, the guardian program actually supplies most of the safe school officers throughout the county, even surpassing some of the other agencies. How many SROs are there in, in to your knowledge in Broward County right now? Approximately 201. And they're spread out strategically around Broward County. Remember, the, the board has um, agreements with municipalities to provide those services within those cities or like the sheriff's office to provide services within their jurisdiction. So we have multiple um, agreements with multiple. And you said the cities and or the county picks up that tab. There is a 
fee that we pay to the municipality, it's, I believe it's 61,200 per SRO at this moment in time. And those uh, conversations are occurring between the Chiefs Association, Broward County Chiefs Association and the school district as we speak. So assuming a municipality has the manpower to say, hey, we got five guys, give us, we'll pay for five SROs, we'll stick them in our schools. But again, it becomes a manpower issue and the ability that y'all have financially to fund it, I guess. Right. Again, if, if, if the municipality came to us and said, we have five people we want to stick in schools, we would say, okay, we would give you the 61 too for that, that officer. We would contribute to that. Okay. And to the city manager's question early, because again, it was floated at somewhere and maybe it was a misunderstanding in language that you all were moving towards trying to have your own internal SOU team to to cover schools. And you're saying that's not necessarily. I could say we're moving to enhance or add to our current unit. Um, we are in the midst of, um, and Chief may be able to speak a little bit more on this, but there are some changes coming to the organization. Um, so that, that information is forthcoming and um, that we'll get back to you on. But there are a positive step that the board did commit to those 10, uh, 10 additional officers. So we're moving forward with implementing that out. Um, so with that, you will see cars that are marked officers in uniforms because that is the role and that's what we want them to demonstrate when, on our, when they are on our campuses. We want them to look like an SRO. Um, they're not thinking they're not going to be wearing the uniform as the guardian because that's the guardian uniform. So you'll be able to tell that's a police officer on your campus. City manager, I ask, can we maybe in three months invite these gentlemen back? Let's kind of see where, what direction we've moved in and uh, if any of that has trickled down to our area. Because we know for a fact, like I said, Parkway Middle School has had a very noticeable, visible problem with uh, extracurricular activity as well as your numbers for the Lotta Hill 6 through 12 prior year uh, was also, you know, an extreme high number. And it's something we get calls about all the time. And talking with my with police chief in the department, our team gets tied up sitting on those calls uh, routinely, which takes them away from, you know, things in our city, uh, having to address certain things. So I definitely look forward to the, the relationship, like you talk about transparency and kind of being forthcoming, acknowledging that we have a problem in the city of Lotta Hill uh, on multiple levels that the school board needs to step up to uh, where it can. And again, by, you know, working with our police department or giving us an, an out where our resources aren't being drained uh, because, you know, when you're dealing with the juvenile, particularly uh, a lot of time is spent sitting, but it's time you have to spend to deal with that case to get it moved from point A to point B. So city manager, I'd ask that uh, we make a note to please bring them back in a couple, three months and let's find out, give you a little more time to get some sand under your shoes and uh, find out where we're at, and what, what direction we're moving in. May I address one of the comments? Absolutely. So Chief Stanley and Deputy Chief Siegel, we do work with the Water Hill Police Department. So when there are issues, as you mentioned, we do provide additional support today. Um, I mean, I can remember as recently as last week. So we, we do provide the support and we, I believe we do have a great working relationship with the police department. Mm -hmm. um, so again, as those opportunities come forward in the future, um, we'll, we'll bring them back to you. And again, at the end of the day, it's all about safety. We want our kids safe, we want the community safe. So having the balance there is, is one thing I said, I don't know that we're getting paid for any officers on, on, on at, at this point or that we even have the bodies to extend to that degree right now. Uh, we're working towards staffing up like most people, but um, I just want the communication to be open and understanding what each other's expectations are. So again, when we get calls from the community, why don't we have officers over here? Well, we're balancing, you know, like everybody else, we got five balls in the air. And one of them is dealing with school board stuff. Um, so, again, I know you got a tough job. God bless you. And uh, we'll hopefully see you in three months. But I'm going to continue to stick that one point about when I talk about cultural diversity, 
I'm not talking about the school level. I'm talking about the administrative level because you're going into situations that you got to have conversations with teachers, parents, uh, school, you know, commissions, and make sure that our diversity represents what it is that we're seeing out there. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'd like to uh, give the community the opportunity to ask a, a question or two. If you gentlemen could hold on for a, a few more moments. Uh, I'm going to recognize uh, Mr. Robert Crumb. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Robert Crumb, I'm 3601 Northwest 7th Place. I want to thank you guys, um, the school board and the city of Lauder Hill for putting this meeting together. As you know, in our community, the great um, area of St. George, Browdy States Homeowners Association, um, in our area, we are very concerned about our Parkway Middle School. Um, and is want, our want is to make sure that we definitely get more focus on the budget and where the funding is going to be coming from. Um, as the commissioner mentioned earlier before, and you just guys said just now, we should have a building finished and completed. If I'm not mistaken, that was quarter two of 2024. So, so I am just want to see if that, what, that information was accurate and make sure that we, in a three months time period, do get a definite information of where the funding will be coming from to make sure that our school is going to be developed because we don't want to have uh, empty construction site for, for our kids. I can tell you, I walk the campus right now doing volunteering and just to have the gates and the construction site next to you on a main corridor, it's just not welcoming. Doesn't make you feel comfortable at the school at all as well too. So I definitely, if you haven't seen it, and you walk it, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I heard that we mentioned about the parking lot, and I know we have a lot of things that's going on in all of our schools across the district, and I don't think the parking lot is a great decision, so I'm glad that we voted that down. But I know that that funding probably was maybe about $1.5 or so. So what else can we do with those fundings at our schools that we can do right now at the current moment to make our current schools better? I know I have a lot of uh, elementary schools. The playgrounds is 90% sand. So how do we get some upgraded playgrounds where parents like myself um, can feel that my kid doesn't have to get in a fight at school because they're throwing sand and of course that's one of the number one fights that's going to be starting at these elementary school levels. So can we get new playgrounds with canopies? Um, at our, I can tell you with the Chief Stanley this weekend, we had a great event at the robotics um, over at one of our parks and we don't have robotics programs even though we have steam pro schools we don't have robotic programs that are inviting parents to say hey i want to be at this school we don't have anything that's a signature standout for our schools which is leads to our low attendance so how can we fix maybe getting some funding for our robotic classes and possibly a teacher so that we can be the city would have the schools that really truly stand out so that we can have the attention and the funding that we really are looking for so those are just a couple of questions that I had that I wanted to make sure that we're not just looking at just the one big parkway and building a school but how can we make all the schools across our whole entire district even better and how can we be that that key city that we are you know the amazing all-american city Thank you so much for your time. Yes, you may reply. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Mr. Crump. I know that since Dr. Rosgood was here, um, him and I have been on the phone a lot of times. We've seen each other at uh, the uh, community meetings a lot. He has been a, a huge voice for that HOA. So regardless of how we get across with the um, different ideas for Parkway, I, show that you're, I see that you're passionate on it. You continuously do be passionate on it. So I just wanted to say thank you um, from former school board members to the new school board members, as, as well as myself. Uh, thank you for the work that you and your HOA do for the community, Lauder Hill, as well as for Parkway students and, and, and staff. So thank you so much. I uh, just wanted to touch on from Kim the issues on um, the programming. And I know a lot of times we say we want to throw different programming in schools. We want to throw robotics. We want to throw, I'm pretty sure I can ask everyone up there what we want and we can throw it in a school. But the, the buy-in is actually our students. What are their interests? And our innovative learning in our magnet department goes out and they actually see, well, the feeder that comes in. If these students come in, will they take different, different programs? So I just want us to be very careful as to what we say. We want all of these programs. That's what we want. But we're not the ones that's going to be sitting up there um, taking those courses, using that equipment, taking advantage of those partnerships our students are. And if that's not their interest, 
then we want to be very careful as to what we what we have for them to buy in because that's where the that's where the buy-in really is is our students and we have to take their feedback in so i just wanted to say we do take all requests for programming very seriously but we also go back out, out to our students and we get their input as to what's their buy-in what is their focus i mean we're at one point in time we wanted to do a program at north fork and it was not at all what the, what the students want. And we actually did what they want. And I went in, Dr. Rosga, we went and visited that school and they talk, start talking about clouds and, and they start teaching me a few things. I just thought it was rainy, but they actually start talking about all of the weather systems. And they actually had a weather lady come in and actually talk about those things. So we just wanted to say that we do get that feedback from our students, I'm sorry, our, our, our community, but we come back and we get the buy-in from our students first. Thanks. All right, that, thank you for that response. We're still open to the public. Uh, is there one, anyone online uh, who would uh, like to ask a question or make a statement? Seeing no activity, we'll close to the public. Uh, Mr. Dan, and that is what Mr. Alberti said. So I know, right? we'll take it to <laughs> he did like, not use go he did not pronounce your last name. You still can't do it either. I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's Mr. Home. <laughs> well, give, give us a week. We'll all get there. <laughs> yeah. So we, we'd like to thank you guys for for coming to make the uh, uh, give us an update of what's happening in our schools, and we look forward to seeing you in three months. You too. And I want to thank you all for having me. Um, you know, just like Commissioner Martin said, it's heavy lifting, but it's easier if we do it together. And, uh, and we're going to need the community. I need everybody to come in here. It's not me by myself. It's, it's a whole team effort. And we have six months, but we're going to get it done. I believe we're going to get a lot of the good things done. So thank you all. Thank you. Welcome to both of you, right? You're both brand new. Welcome to the job. Thank you. No, we're not. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, item three, MPO presentation on Metro Transportation Engineering and Construction Cooperative, MTECC, requested by Commissioner Lawrence Jabo Martin. And I'm gonna tell these guys, one, thank y'all for sticking it out. You get to see how municipal government works when it's not building a road or bridge or <laughs> putting the sidewalk down. Um, as part of the, uh, the MPO's services they're looking to offer, I'm just going to be real brief and let these guys do their presentation. They have an opportunity where they're recruiting cities to basically buy into a, a concept where, as we know at the city of Lotta Hill, we plan on doing a lot of building over the next 10, 15 years. And here's an opportunity that the, that the MPO is offering through this initiative where cities can pay into it's like an insurance policy is what I call it, where you can put a little money up now. So when you need the services there, where you have engineers, you have design people, you have a plethora of, of professionals ready to take your project from start to finish. And a big part of why they're doing this is F dot who used to do a lot of this heavy lifting has kind of backed away from the table and said, go do it yourself. Uh, this is more for, small to medium-sized cities who may or may not have a full-time staff of engineers, city planners, or want to use those resources in different ways, that this is an opportunity that we'll always have people on board and have an opportunity to pursue any projects that we have and know they're going to be carried out in a professional and dignified manner. Is that pretty good? Commissioner, I, I, I think we're done. Uh, <laughs> We couldn't have said it any better. So, um, Commissioner, thank you so much for inviting us here this evening. My name is William Cross. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Broward MPO. Uh, and I'd like to, again, thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight on behalf of our Executive Director, uh, Mr. Craig Stewart, um, who is hosting actually a national group of MPOs here in Broward County uh, tonight, which is why he was not able to be here. Uh, so again, I'm gonna get out of the way and I'd just like to introduce Chris Bross, who is our manager with the MPO, who is really leading this effort for what we call MTech. And he does have a presentation for you tonight uh, that we'll, we will try to be brief. But again, thank you for the invite this evening. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you. I'd like to echo uh, Mr. Cross's uh, 
uh, statements as far as um, an opportunity to present. Thrilled to present MTech. Um, so I get excited and I really am happy here this afternoon to present. So uh, it starts off as far as some history slides, getting to where we are today. And uh, then we'll go through uh, some of the um, some of the language that's in the interlocal agreements. Uh, I'll walk you through that as well. And then we'll end with the implementation schedule. So you all have uh, a chance to see where we are today and where we'd like to be tomorrow. So why MTEC? Uh, the history goes back to a mayor's and elected officials round table, uh, which identified a need. Uh, Commissioner Martin said it perfectly um, as far as um, some of the greatest transportation needs. Um, there's an equity issue as far as being able to deliver uh, these projects, um, you know, staffing levels, level of expertise, um, award of transportation funding to any given municipality is not frequent enough to justify permanent resources. So to hire these resources for your staff um, for this expertise in federal procurement engineering, um, well, these, these specific projects aren't occurring regularly on a regular basis. So justifying the need to have that staff um, is, is an issue. FDOT decision to end delivery of federally funded off-state highway system projects using LAP. That's uh, the local agency program. Project delivery requires significant technical resources and specialized administrative knowledge. The high cost and complexity of LAP delivery to individual municipalities um, study was basically um, looked at and estimated that um, $100,000 per project is what you could potentially pay uh, your resources to get through all the rigorous requirements from design, you know, really from cradle to grave as far as your transportation projects. Next slide, please. So some of the things the subcommittee explored was uh, how are we going to develop this new cooperative, this new agency? And things were looked at as far as C corporations, cooperatives, and the Florida Interlocal Cooperation Act of 1969, which is what uh, basically we landed on as far as moving forward. Next slide, please. <coughs> A little bit more history and background on the Florida Interlocal Cooperation Act of 1969. Uh, permits local government units to make the most efficient use of their powers by enabling them to cooperate with other localities on a basis of mutual advantage. Um, basically, there's strength in numbers, and um, we thought that with the Broward MPO, with uh, representatives from all municipalities within Broward County, that um, we saw a need and we saw basically the the initiators of this organization saw this was the best opportunity to pursue a new entity under that cooperation act. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and some last bullet points on that act. It's a known legal process. It's nothing new. Uh, interlocal agreement sets terms and structures of the cooperation and it's flexible structures to meet local needs for three of the, um, advantages moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, the MTech benefits. Centralized engineering expertise with design, bid package preparation, construction oversight, inspection, right of way, et cetera, and centralized procurement function. So all projects within Broward County municipalities, if you're a member, um, everything would be basically going through standardized process, standardized procedures with, uh, um, with expertise of uh, engineering and staff to provide the cradle to grave approach. Uh, efficient and timely project delivery, centralized public involvement, and the city only buys services necessary without the need to maintain staff. I think I referenced that earlier. Next slide, please. Some key elements of MTech, it's a self-governing board, self-funding by members, it's primary funding through project awards, we'll get into that in the next future slides, uh, municipality member annual dues to cover the overhead. Next slide, please. So the founding members, uh, MTech basically was uh, presented to our Broward MPO board and approved at our April board meeting. Uh, it's an agreement between the Broward MPO 
and the three founding members of MTech, Hollywood, City of Hollywood, Plantation, and Pompano Beach. So with the passing of that ILA uh, in April, we now have formed um, an entity. <laughs> the MTech is now created, it's now birthed. And as I said earlier, I'm thrilled to take next steps moving forward with, with some of the projects, but those are our three founding members. Next slide, please. As far as the contributions uh, to MTech, the founding board member contribution for the three cities is a $100,000 fee. The non-founding member contribution, if Lauder Hill were, um, were to desire to become part of MTEC, uh, it would be a $50,000 contribution fee, and there's an annual membership uh, fee as well. Uh, it's also a five-year minimum commitment, and actually that may be adjusted by the board, that annual amount. That's why it's, there's an asterisk footnote. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for the, the agreements for the creation of MTEC, uh, there's two ILAs. The first ILA, as I referenced earlier, was the formation of the entity with the three founding member municipalities, which was approved by our board in May. Uh, the second agreement was you have a new organization now that's not staffed, and they basically need, they need assistance, and they're going to need support services from the Broward MPO existing staff, procurement services, planning services, financial services, board support services. So an interlocal agreement, which was just approved uh, at our May board meeting um, uh, between the MPO and when MTech has its first meeting, we'll be presenting that ILA to the MTech board is for those administrative services, for their startup services. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the ILA, this is language right from um, uh, the legalese language from the document. The purpose is to consent to and authorize the creation of MTech in order to facilitate the planning, design, and construction of transportation-related projects throughout Broward County. So that's the meat of the uh, purpose of the organization. Uh, there's a firewall between planning activities of Broward MPO and design and construction activities of MTech. Uh, the MPO assumes no financial responsibility for MTech projects. Uh, those will be covered in project agreements, which I'll touch on in a future slide. Next slide, please. So the authorized activities of MTech in the ILA, uh, the Federal Aid Project Administration, which uh, deals with lap certification of federal projects, liability of the parties for federal aid project completion, and local project administration is addressed. The provision of services to municipal members for the payment of services and selection of services. These are the things addressed in the founding member ILA. Next slide, please. So the Federal Aid Project Administration talks about, uh, it basically addresses LAP certification. So on behalf of the municipal members of MTech, MTech may become LAP certified by FDOT. Uh, certification, LAP certification is required for your federal highway projects going through the program. So we'd have to have the project certified uh, before we can move forward with, with any projects. Um, and that's what MTech is, is going to be doing. Um, the liability for the parties for federal aid project completion. Normally, the municipal member requesting the project is responsible for non-eligible expenses and cost overruns. MTech's never responsible, nor is the MPO. Uh, typically, you would see cost overruns. Just an example, what's a cost overrun? In, in a construction contract, you may be out, you know, um, putting in a culvert or, you know, any type of, um, you know, asphalt in which there might be, for whatever reason, overruns of what that contract amount would be which would be basically um, something that would be in addition to the, the contract amount and tip. Those are your typical costs that the municipalities would um, be responsible for. Next slide, please. The local project administration. Municipal members always retain option to use MTech or not. So if you're an MTech member, um, you don't have to be and participate um, in projects that you're basically getting funded for. It is, it is management and, and, and your um, commission's decision whether to utilize MTech for those particular projects. Project costs and responsibilities are addressed in individual project-based agreements between FDOT, MTech, and the municipality. Uh, these were typically with FDOT, they are the LAP agreements. 
those will be specific to the project and those will actually lay out the responsibilities between the city and MTEC and FDOT. MPO will not be party to the individual project-based agreements and there's no responsibility of the MPO for funding beyond the TIP program funds. Next slide, please. So the second ILA, uh, which was just approved by the MPO board, as I said earlier in May, uh, addresses what I basically um, had stated before, uh, in-house support and also BMPO contracted support. So what support we cannot provide as internal MPO staff, uh, we are actually putting together an RFP for uh, supplemental professional management services. So that will have a full array of services ready uh, for the MTech organization. Next slide, please. And this is always uh, saved for last, but this is uh, the implementation schedule so that everyone can understand um, how we've progressed with the organization. Uh, as I had said earlier, the founding members, um, MPO and the founding members approved the ILA. Our board approved that at the April board meeting and the administrative services agreement was completed in May. So draft MTech policies and procedures, uh, that's underway, as you can imagine. Um, <coughs> You're starting a new organization with a new board with um, lots of federal requirements, um, you know, requires lots of procedures. So, you know, we've been working digitally, digitally on getting uh, procedures um, um, completed. Also, organizational stand-up efforts. Uh, that's what I addressed earlier as far as the MPO current staff support and the RFP for additional services. Uh, develop FDOT MTech lab agreement. Uh, we are aiming for summer, fall. Those are going to, that's going to be the actual um, third party project agreement that I mentioned earlier. And that's gonna lay out the responsibilities of the parties. And then procure key consultant resources, summer, fall 2022. Uh, uh, and our aim is to begin MTech operations, fall 2022, and begin MTech project, projects, state fiscal year 2023. And I believe that's our last slide. Um, if there's any discussion or any questions. Did I miss the cost while I stepped, when I stepped out? <laughs> Did I miss the cost slide when I stepped out? I uh, like that. I kind of okay. All right. Sorry. Slip that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, any, any questions? And thank you. Thank you for your time. Microphone on. Uh, let me. Uh, First uh, hand raised is uh, Commissioner Dunn, oh. Vice Mayor Dunn. Didn't mean to demote you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping that um, Commissioner Job was going to ask a question before I ask my question because I actually am um, unclear, and perhaps you mentioned it and it went over my head, but I'm unclear about the benefits of membership. So that's my first question. And then my second question is, Jabo, as MPO representative, what's your recommendation here? And that's why I was just talking to Zach. You come up real quick. Here, here it is in layman's terms. I don't terms. really understand. In, in real, real layman's terms. Yep. As y'all are aware, we went out um, about a few, four or five months ago, and we aggressively went after a project, which we were, we were lucky enough to win and got ranked number one. And that process, that project is in motion now. What we did in house was about a 45 day, which was about six months. Uh, we did it in a couple of months. We got together, put a package together. When that package goes, the MPO gets graded, locked in, and it's awarded that, yeah, move forward. Our staff would then back out of the way. MTech in, in this form or fashion would pick up this, the thing afterwards. But right now, just what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, myself, Zach, Herb Johnson, who should be up here right now. Um, no, just kidding. Uh, myself, Zach Herb, the Florida Department of Correct, uh, Florida Department, of Correct, Department of Transportation, and probably a group of about 20 people and would have, should have probably had our engineer and another other person out there. We all had to go out and start walking the project and they're now doing feedback and documentation. MTech would take that part and our staff would be off the hook for it. So we got man hours, reporting, you have to keep somebody lap certified and all kinds of things that would follow the process where now 
our wonderful city planner could do other wonderful things, go after other projects. We get them lined up, teed up, get them out to park. MTEC is going to pick up at that point, and our staff now becomes more support, but we're not having to do those reports, follow up on those meetings, do all that extra stuff in the background. And we know we have wonderful staff that are quite capable, but we got so much other stuff we're going to be devoted to their time and efforts to. Um, this will be an opportunity, again, knowing that we're going to be going aggressively after a lot of these projects, and my intent is that we're going to get a lot of them. Um, I think it's going to be beneficial just based on what I think the cost was. The 50000 Was it 50000 a year for 50, three 000. years? Is that what I heard? <laughs> so it's an initial investment of 50000 and then 25000 thereafter. Yeah. Okay. So figure $25,000 in salaries for <laughs> at the numbers. If you do it over time, okay. one project's going to going to far surpass the time and effort that our staff is going to put in. And again, no guarantee you're going to, now the upside or downside is there's no guarantee you get a con, you get a, a project every year. Got it. But Some right now we have one three. project that we have that's going to take a tremendous amount of time to That, that project in itself would pay for what our costs are right now. Okay. And most of these projects are not just a year, they're two, three years in the making of back and forth because of the nature and size potentially of some. Okay, and so being a part of this consortium, if you will, that does that then lead um, lay the foundation for us to go after joint projects with those groups? MTech is going to be set in a place where if we did a project with the city of Plantation, and Plantation's a founding member, they got a little juice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yes, that would definitely offer that opportunity. Yeah, I, and thank you very much for the question. So I just like to add that. Um, fundamentally, the purpose of this group is to help deliver projects that are federally funded. And, you know, we've all heard mm -hmm. the saying, don't make a federal case. There's out of it. a lot well, of in infrastructure case, dollar. If we want the dollars, we do have to make a federal case out of it. And Got so it. what we found is, you know, many of the local cities, it's just they don't do enough of these that they're familiar with all the federal rules and regulations. And what will happen is you wind up spending a lot of extra time, a lot of effort to get up to speed. And if you make one mistake, you know, it, it's, it's a fully reimbursement uh, program. So the city has to invest the dollars first to deliver that program. And then you have to submit all the paperwork that you've procured everything according to federal regulations. You hired your contractors meeting federal regulations. All of that documentation is submitted. And if you know if you make a mistake, then you're not getting reimbursed right away. So that's really at the core of it. Um, our elected officials have, have been through these lap uh, projects before. We had a group of them uh, from you know various size cities, and they all had a similar experiences dealing with this lap program. Uh, and and that's really we we tried to react to that to provide an alternative. Uh, as Chris's presentation showed, it's completely optional. As, as long as you're a member, you know, you always retain that decision whether or not you want to put a project through uh, MTech. But uh, we think it's a it's a an, it's exciting opportunity and we're really uh, pleased to be uh, providing this service to our municipal members. OK, thank you. And I think and to answer question. your second question, I would I would defer to city staff who's done this and they know what the requirements are and city attorney and city manager as to where they think this might be beneficial. Yeah, so Madam Vice Mayor, speaking from a staff perspective, this bridge is the gap for us because, you know, larger cities, they have extensive staff that dedicates teams and groups to certain, you know, grant applications for large right-of-way improvements, whereas for smaller cities, mid-sized cities, you may not have the same manpower. So as uh, Commissioner Jabo stated, we had a mad dash for that C-slip and all the, you know, the, the grant, the application itself, the information gathering, all those things, we can get support from MTEC. And then once that's submitted for the commentary port part, when you're going back and forth with FDOT or MPO, you have a team, so to speak, that's, you know, ready to assist in any way that they can with, you know, giving comments on applications and, and costing and, and the like. So the way we, this is my third time now listening to this presentation. So, so the, you know, the way I figure it with the grant dollars that are coming down the pipe from the federal, you know, the federal infrastructure stuff, the different county opportunities, 
if you have two to three applications, you know, in the pipeline and, and you're successful in those applications, you know, it's, it's an investment that pays for itself. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Grant. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, few questions. Uh, so it is 50,000 down in a sense, right? 50,000 to start and then 25,000 per year. Um, if we have projects or if we do not have projects, we will be paying the 25 per year. Um, how many cities are currently members? So currently we have the founding members and we also have signed um, Deerfield Beach. They've actually executed NILA. So when we have our first MTech meeting, um, hopefully bring them into the membership. We also have um, presenting before you all today. Um, there's also interest from some other municipalities, but as far as signed uh, members, it's the three founding in Deerfield right now. Uh, the three founding would be Plantation, Pompano, Pompano, and Hollywood. And Hollywood, and so four all together. Yes. Okay. And would this be for the budget for next year? Is this what we're looking at, City Manager? I think that's what they're proposing yep. for cities to join now, right? And then it would mm. be your October 1st budget. October 1st budget. Okay. And so I know that your role and the lobbyist role is quite different, but we just got a federal lobbyist. So I'm not sure how much are we paying the federal lobbyist at this time? I don't know at the top of my head. Earl, can you assist? Don't know the exact amount, Commissioner, but I'll give it to you tomorrow. Does it sound something similar? Uh, no, I think I think it's, it's higher for the, for the federal lobbyist. Federal lobbyist yes. is, is but, higher. Yeah, but I and on an annual basis, but I think what what this group is, is offering, uh, Commissioner Grant, is you know project management to help us with the federal procurement. And as Kenny will will tell you, we try to get our money back from the federal government for FEMA. We wind up resubmitting and revising the the documents often. And so if they can provide that service to the city in terms of helping with those federal procurements and submitting your documents to get your monies back, <laughs> I think Kenny would agree that. <laughs> we, could, we could use this assistance because it's just, you know, it makes all of us, the staff from uh, yeah. Kentria to uh, to make all of us have to go into the federal area as opposed to being the state. Level. Right. So um, in my estimation, I just listening to the presentation, I think that um, logically it's sound. Uh, the questions are being asked because we are always, um, I guess, um, somehow, uh, approached by the residents in terms of how we're spending our funds, right? And we are always saying from the city level that we don't have any monies. And so to be able to then find 50,000 and then an additional 25,000, it is something that um, if we were just to say yes now, um, without a little bit more due diligence for me, I don't know how I would feel about that because I would have to, of course, engage the constituents. But nonetheless, it doesn't mean that this is not a good idea because I understand that staff is overloaded and um, they always want to please our commissioners. So when we have a project, they want to make sure that it's done with great excellence. So if you have uh, a team that will be able to assist, that is a great idea. Um, if this is staff's recommendation, it's Kenny is 100% signing off on this in addition to um, Herb as well as are going to be our next uh, city attorney, and they are saying yes, then I will, I will agree to this based on what they are saying. Just, just to Earl's point, I, I think it's important when we speak of the type of projects that we're speaking of, they're, yep. so they're, they're capital type projects. Sure. So this cost is, is part of our capital cost. So it doesn't have the same impact on our budget as an operating expenditure. Budget. So when we're looking at uh, uh, doing the projects that were submitted or projects off of our five-year plan, we find it important that we do engage someone on the front end so that we can have all of the planning work and all that stuff done ahead of time because we do miss out on opportunities because that work isn't done up front uh, when those dollars become available. But it doesn't, the, the, the type of work that they're doing and the funds that we would have to pay, we would attribute attribute those to the capital project so it wouldn't have the same impact on our operating on budget. financially. Right. Okay, Correct. thank you for the information. I think it's a good idea with all the information I've received. Thank you. I've got a question. Uh, does MTAC uh, put a limit on the number of hours of assistance we get? 
That's why you're the mayor. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for that question. It's a good one. And we haven't heard that before, but the answer is no. Uh, there's not a limit. And in fact, uh, based upon the size of the project, uh, if you have a larger project that's more complex, there's going to be a larger budget that comes with it. And so uh, just to be clear, the dollars that we're asking for from the city are to cover the cost of running the organization. Only those few costs that are just not federally eligible for reimbursement. So if you get a significant transportation project, almost all of the costs associated with that are going to be federally reimbursable. So we will put in the extra hours necessary and we will charge the federal government. Appropriately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, yes, sir. All right, Commissioner uh, Lawrence Martin. Yeah, that, that's kind of the point I was going to touch on is as much as these projects come down, they're getting paid, MTEC's gonna get paid from the project itself. What we're looking at ponying up right now is really for administrative costs and, and things of the nature of running an office essentially. Uh, so like any other new program, you know, the intent and the hope of the MPO is that more cities come on board. The potential for that 25 to go down is there, or it's even there that will go up just to be very transparent. But obviously, the more people that come on board because it's a new service, you got to you got to run it through its paces to find out, you know, where exactly it is. Are you locked in for life? Not at all. But if you're not on board, you don't get the service. If you're on board, you get to make the choice of utilizing the service or not. So like, you know, it's like Bitcoin, get in early and hopefully it multiplies in value five million thousand times. So, um you know, I, I, I think it's a good opportunity for the city, just knowing the aggressiveness that we plan to go in, in the direction of going after these dollars. And the other thing I ask my, my colleagues to keep in mind, that whole concept about us being in the center of seven other cities, projects are going to come our way. And if we could just piggyback on one project for every other city and do our own stuff, we got the potential to be in the mix of some, some heavy, heavy construction projects going forward. That's everything I can read my notes well. Man. Uh, all right, I think there seems to be a consensus of the uh, commission to proceed. Okay. All right, thank you so much for the presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for sticking around. Thanks, Herb. <laughs> All right, we move to item four, Florida Department of Corrections, uh, FACE IT presentation requested by Commissioner Lawrence Jabo Martin. Whew, thank you. Um, as, as most of you are aware, we've been in partnership with the Florida Department of Corrections over the past couple of years and helping them out with their graduation ceremonies. And I've made it very clear about my personal background and working in probation and being very uh, invested in anything community corrections driven. Uh, the Florida Department of Corrections approached us about teaming up with them to assist in hosting uh, or at least providing space for them to hold uh, returning citizens meetings um, periodically in our city to help address some of the concerns of individuals coming back uh, from incarceration as well as notifying their family. They have a program they're gonna present with the ask being that we authorize or allow some space uh, in the city uh, for those meetings to take place. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Melinda Bethel, the Deputy Circuit Administrator for Florida Department of Corrections here in Broward County. And like um, once again, um, thank you for the invitation to allow me to present this presentation. So we have met with our judiciary here in Broward County, um, Judge Siegel and ASA, Mr. Pryor and public defender, Mr. Gordon. They have the um, brochure as well. And Mr. Gordon wants to, our goal is to have judge, the judges ordered as a special condition of supervision. And what face it is, we do this already as probation officers, but if as offenders, 
probationers, when you're in court all day, you're rushed through your sentencing and someone is saying, do you agree, agree, agree? You're just saying, yes, yes, yes. You really don't have a true understanding of the conditions of supervision. So what we are asking for, our, for the space for family members to come along with the probationer to the meeting. And it's a two hour presentation where we present and go over the conditions of supervision because sometimes the family members are not aware of the conditions of supervision. So just imagine your family member is on supervision and someone is knocking at your door at three in the morning. You don't understand that. So because the probationer has not explained that part to the mother or the father in the home. So we, within the first 30 to 90 days of supervision, majority of the time, the offender will violate the conditions of supervision. One, because of communication. They are not aware that if I test positive, don't just run away. You need to communicate with your officer. So if you have communication, you have a better term better success of successfully completing the conditions of your supervision. And that's our goal. We want everyone that's sentenced to supervision to successfully complete their supervision term. Um, in a recent study conducted by our Office of Research and Data Analysis, it was determined that approximately 22% of the individuals on supervision were referred to the sentencing or releasing authority for failing to comply with su supervisions within the first three months of being sentenced. And we don't want that. We want them to successfully complete supervision. And that, that's because of communication, where I think, okay, I moved, I didn't tell my officer. Oh, they're going to have a warrant for me. No, that's not the case. We need to communicate with the probationer to let them know. We don't want to just ask for a warrant. We have other items that we could utilize. We don't wanna remove you from your home, from your family, from your employment. We have notice to appears that we can ask for. We can complete a technical violation letter, which we do it all the time. But if you're sitting in our lobby and you're communicating with other probationers who don't communicate with their officers and you're getting the wrong information, you're like, oh, they're gonna violate me. No, that's not the case. And we go over the roles of the probation officer and we go over the conditions of your supervision. We ask questions that maybe the probationer is afraid to communicate and ask their officer at the time at this two hour presentation that we present. We also have let the probationer and the family member know of services that's offered in the community that maybe they, not, they are not aware of. We have an employment specialist that we have in our county who works with OIC, um, with Broward Reentry, in reference to helping them with their resume writing, um, also interviewing skills, because she wants them, we want them to gain employment. If you have employment, you have a better chance of successfully completing your supervision term. So the presentation is it's a two-hour presentation, and we... And the ultimate goal is face it. And you have the brochure there and the acronym is family. If you have a strong family support, you have a better chance of completing your supervision. Even if you don't have a family member who can attend the meeting with you, we have mentors and community-based partnerships who come to our meetings and they could you know, be a mentor to the offender, probationer. Attitude, if your attitude, your attitude will determine your altitude. So we want them to understand, you know, work on your attitude. Communication, communication is the number one key. Communication is just not me saying what I need to say. I need to make sure you understood what I said, to make sure you received the message. Employment, like I stated before, we have an employment specialist. We want them to gain employment. Improvement, we want them to improve so they can be better for their family, better for the community. And at the end, taking responsibility. You have to take responsibility, take ownership. Just because you made this one um, mistake, this doesn't direct your future. And that's what the face it is with Florida Department of Corrections, our initiative. So, thank you again. You have any questions for me? Yes, uh, we've got several uh, hands raised, but uh, since I got the microphone, I'll ask my question first. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of risks do you see for the city of Lottie Hill 
by offering this space? Risk? I don't think it'll be a risk. It will probably be a incentive for your city because we are providing the probationer with information on employment, resources for okay. your community. Uh, okay, so this is, um, if uh, someone has uh, not adhered to the terms of uh, their uh, parole, uh, parole or probation, uh, you are not going to set up a, a meeting and then arrest them at no. the city facility then? No, sir. That's This pre presentation, that meeting is not for that. This okay. is for offenders or inmates released within, if they're returning from prison within the first 30 to 60 days or being placed under supervision within the first 30 to 60 days. That's us having a meeting with the probationer and the family member going over every detail of the conditions of supervision. So no arrest of uh, no parolees arrest. will happen uh, at Lottie Hill properties? No, no okay. arrests. That, thank you. And now looking at the uh, queue, uh, first up is number two, Lawrence Martin. Yes, Mayor, that was, that was a great question, something I was going to kind of elaborate on. And in the conversation myself, the uh, city attorney and the city manager had with the, uh, the organization initially, yeah. Uh, it would be somewhat of a contractual agreement initially as a pilot is the way we kind of uh, saw it going forward where we restrict certain types of uh, crimes or people who have committed certain types of crimes from being on our property, i.e. child, you know, sex offenders, things of that nature. Um, but again, you know, this having been my background, like, 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 um, like she said, those first 60 or 90 days are paramount to the success of most people uh, being placed on supervision and are returning uh, from incarceration and just getting them off to a good start of knowing your probation officer is not your enemy, not your friend, but a person you need to communicate with and understanding what the expectations are. Um, so again, I, you know, I've been pushing the, the reentry thing from day one. I think this was a great opportunity for the city to put a step forward. Hopefully other cities will fall in line. We're taking it, a, you know, a, a aggressive approach and being a part of um, assisting people to get that second chance. And I tell people all the time, but by the grace of God, go whoever. Um, you know, we've all had situations or we know people in our family that have done whatever, but they've turned their lives and just needed a hand up. So. I'm hoping it's an opportunity that the city has to, to be in the forefront of an opportunity like this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next in the queue, Commissioner Grant. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, just a few questions. Um, how often will we have the meeting? Well, it depends on how many offenders are sentenced. And my plan is we have We've, we've held a presentation in Coral Springs, so I try to hold these meetings, you know, in reference to them a, being able to get to the presentation. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm going to, um, I have a meeting scheduled with a representative from the library to host meetings in Oakland Park. So this would be technically for our citizens here in Lauderdale. So this will benefit your community. Okay, so... Um... You're not sure how often the meetings will be, but you're saying the city of Coral Springs has already signed on well, they to did partner. Not sign on. Mm -hmm. It was a private um, entity business, business. Uh -huh. and he helped. We we act. you hold your meetings we there as well. Meetings. Okay, yes. but the city of Coral Springs has not signed up. Just to give an example, of that particular meeting, it, it's not court ordered. So when we send the email out to the officers to notify their probationers. I asked for that space held 50 people. So I asked for 25 offenders because you have to keep in mind they're bringing their family members. So the 25 and 25, that's my 50. Sure. I'm thinking I would have, you know, 25 or 50. And at that time, like 10 people, 10 family members came. 10 family members. Okay. So either and once a month or every other month. Okay. Thank you. And how many other cities are currently participating? None at this time. So we would be the first city. Okay. Um, and where in the city will these meetings uh, be potentially held? Do you have any ideas? I don't know. I, and I'm 
asking you all that. In, in reference to the meeting, I would need a projector for the presentation. So whatever space you have, I'm willing to accept. City manager, you have any thoughts? A park, a park. Okay, so when the mayor goes back to um, asking the question in terms of liability of sorts, and um, I am always for second chances, right? I have a 14 year old child and sometimes Lord Jesus, but nonetheless, um, always for second chances, but we have to be very, very, very wise in our decision making process as it relates to um, individuals that we know have committed crimes and they're at parks where we are promoting to be a safe and um, clean in a sense environment for children because at any moment, God forbid something happens, the city will be responsible and liable. If say, just in case someone um, in that meeting leaves to go to the bathroom of sorts or whatever, and it could happen to anyone, whether it's a person who is not have not uh, committed a crime, but just an individual who is just deranged of sorts and um, go outside and something happens to one of the children that's playing in the playground. That is would be my concern having it at a park at that type of facility. Um, I'm not sure how our residents would feel about that. It sounds like a very, it's, it's a very, um, I wouldn't say good idea, but it's a very thoughtful and considerate idea. But nonetheless, I think we have to really flesh things out for reasons such as, um, I think one of the things that we probably should do as well is probably engage our residents to see how they feel about it because they are the taxpayers and they're paying for the parks and all of our facilities. And so um, I think they should be engaged as it relates to that in particular, as it relates to our children, because that is a huge, huge, huge issue. And um, it will be great for us to be able to be the ones that are advancing this initiative, the first city to come out to do this. But at the same time, there's so much risk that potentially is associated with it that I probably would need a little bit more information of how it's going to work in terms of security measures, uh, because we don't have a city to be able to now uh, look and model from, right? So we will be the first ones to do it. And so interestingly enough, we'll be able to figure out why other cities have not partnered. Maybe you guys have not engaged other cities. That's, that's one of the reasons. But we definitely have to look at it, especially when we're talking about our kids. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Saray Martin. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Grant asked most of my questions, uh, but one remaining is how are you getting your funding right now? There's no funding. So you're all volunteer organization? We are volunteering, but myself, the supervisors who com completed the training, we do this. They will flex their work hours out, and we just come and we volunteer our time. How long have you been doing this now? We just started this March of this year. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks for volunteering for what you do. So no more questions. All right. Vice Mayor Dunn. <laughs> yes. I Actually, the question that I wrote, I thought you answered it, but I want to clarify. So the folks who would be coming to this training are folks who are in supervision, who are living in our community, correct? Yes. And so um, my understanding based on your presentation is that by educating them about the rules and regulations and preparing the family, it decreases the chance that they'll offend and get reincarcerated. Right. Yes. And so this is kind of like I'm hearing you say that this is like a preventative measure. Um, right. Yes. Ma and then uh, Commissioner Jabo, I think I heard you say that you and the city manager would be putting parameters around oh, the city attorney, that there will be parameters around because to to Commissioner yes, Grant's correct. point about safety and children. Yes. that we would be specific about the type of offenders. That is correct. Um, if the commission were to authorize us to move forward, we would draft an appropriate agreement that limits the kind of offenders that you want on your parks. Okay, so it could be maybe somebody that got incarcerated for marijuana or something. Right. Um, correct. But we know that um, we've had discussions that we don't want folk to have child sex abuse, so mm -hmm. we prohibit those to be part of the program. At right. least on city's property. They could be on all the city's properties, but not in Lower Hill. Okay. 
All right. And so um, I can tell you that I've been working with some um, previously incarcerated individuals through our LEAP program um, and listening to the men who some of them serve 30 years, some of them, um, I believe in giving people second chances. And I, I see the effort and the willingness that they have to do well. And it sounds to me like this is a preventative measure. If you know the rules and you fully understand it, if your family members know the rules and you fully understand it, and these are a lot of Hill residents, these are people in our community anyways. So I would be open to um, seeing how we could support this, keeping in mind that we put those parameters so that you know it's non-dangerous, um, offenders. I mean, they're living in Lauda Hill anyway, so we got to figure out a way to, to help them, to support them so that they can become um, productive members of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lawrence Martin. Yeah, just to clarify a couple of things, it sounds like it might be a little confusion. This program is being run by the Department of Corrections. These are all sworn probation officers that work full time. They're not volunteers. And not working for free. These are duly employed sworn probation officers in the state of Florida, correct? Correct. Now, if you're familiar with community corrections, if you're an individual on supervision, the last thing you want to do is violate and go back. As a probation officer who's, who has eyes on, and Commissioner uh, Vice Mayor, you've summed it up correctly, this is the front end of their supervision. Get started, start the right foot, hopefully you move down the road. I even tell people that employ individuals on supervision, not only as an employer are you watching that person, but you get a free set of eyes, their drug tests, home checks, verifies collateral contacts, and watches that individual. So you get a whole nother person on top of what you do day in, day out. Thirdly, these people are already in our community. Fourthly, yeah. if you go to the sports park right now, you can probably get 15 contacts. It's just the reality of, of the world we live in. And all we can do is take as many fail safes as possible, put as many parameters in place to minimize uh, the opportunity of anything going wrong. But again, there's no 100% guarantee. So if you're looking for that, don't vote for this because I would never tell anybody there's a 100% guarantee of anything. But the fact of the matter is these people are first time sentenced or coming home. And the last thing they want to do the first day out of wherever first week is get in trouble. And the fact that we have sworn state officers employed by the Florida Department of Corrections, certified probation officers overseeing this program, they're not volunteers. They're not doing this out of the goodness. It's a part of their job. And what good is out of heart because they're putting the extra hours in. But they want to see people succeed. Um, so I think it's an opportunity for us again, to play a part in, in that success uh, in minimizing whatever risk we can. Um, and keep it in mind, you know, you can't keep people out of parks that are convicted felons. But in this case, we're trying to help them stay on the right path by getting them started. Thank you, Mayor. All right, uh, Commissioner Grant. Yes, Mayor, I'm gonna make it uh, brief. Um, Thank you so much for the presentation, by the way. It was a very good presentation. And um, as mentioned, it's, it's extremely thoughtful. And I'm always for second chances, always for second chances, for sure. I have been given many second chances, second, third, fourth, fifth, and probably up to the 10th in various areas. And so I understand that component. Um, I'm just concerned about the security measures and um, parks, when we're talking about parks, we're talking about young kids, we're talking about, I just don't want the city to be at any form of liability if we haven't really fully done our due diligence as it relates to this. So I would like to see the security um, plan and kind of see what the, our city attorney is putting forth um, before right. yep. I make my decision as it relates to that, because I think he being an attorney as well, he knows better than I that this can go very good, but it can go very, very badly as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mayor, uh, Commissioners, I think the idea would be if the commission gave a consensus for the city manager and I to
start drafting something that would come back to the commission for a full vote. So not, you were not, you're not voting on it. No, 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 for sure. But I think in terms of just uh, hearing what everyone is saying, it seems yeah. as if it's going to lead towards that coming back. So in that respect, I would love to see what you guys Indeed. Yes. put together. So yes, Commissioner Grant. You're we're protecting, we're helping them and we're protecting the community as a whole as well. Correct. Thank you. Okay. All right, very good. Ms. Bethel, thank you so much okay. for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, we have been meeting now for uh, over three hours, so uh, let's take a 15-minute break. And I uh, apologize to anybody who's here in the audience, but uh, we need a break. Free food. All right, so uh, we will um, come back in at 7 30? Well, we can do less than that. Less, less than, than that. that. Less than that. <laughs> yeah. Tell me. Uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. All right. 10, 10 minutes is good. All right. 10, 10 minutes, minutes it is. Yeah. Well, I think we need to go and revisit our <laughs> two items for the permission of put it down to one. Yeah. Uh, all right.
calling the Lottie Hill workshop uh, back to order. We are at item five, a presentation from Kim Hill of Task Force Outreach requested by Vice Mayor Melissa P. Dunn. Good evening, Commission and Mayor. I am not Kim Hill. <laughs> I'd like to make that clear to begin with. My name is Carl Falconer. I'm the CEO with the Task Force uh, for Ending Homelessness. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our organization and some things that we're doing in the community okay. to uh, help alleviate homelessness throughout Broward County. Um, I've been working in the business uh, myself since in the homeless response system since 1994. So I have a lot of experience in this area. I've worked in Jacksonville, Florida. I've worked in Dallas, Texas. And now, of course, I'm working here um, in the wonderful county of Broward. Uh, the Task Force for Ending Homelessness is a not-for-profit agency that provides outreach, education, and advocacy on behalf of the unsheltered homeless population in Broward County. Our mission is to get homeless neighbors off the street through proactive outreach services and provide placement in a program that will help them get home. Our philosophy is based on honesty, quality, empathy, and responsiveness. And our guiding principle is meeting people where they are geographically, emotionally, philosophically, and helping guide them with compassion, fairness, and purpose. A little bit about the task force. We've been around, we've been doing outreach services to the unsheltered homeless population since 2000. Um, we operate 365 days a year, 15 hours per day, 6.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Or 14 and a half, I guess that is technically. Um, we have 20 direct service staff um, who are made up of formerly homeless individuals, veterans, uh, we have uh, multilingual speakers uh, who speak Creole, French, Spanish. Um, we have been deemed a best practice by Housing and Urban Development Department. We've had contact with over a quarter of a million homeless individuals since 2000. And in, two, two, in 2021, we had contact with over 13,000 individuals out on the streets. We also coordinate the annual point in time count for the last two years. We've led those efforts throughout all of Broward County. So we lead that. Um, that's a count of the uh, homeless individuals who are out on the streets um, on any given evening. So the two types of services that we provide that I really want to talk to you a little bit about is we provide outreach services, which of course that makes sense. Obviously that's what we do. Um, but uh, it's a little more technical than that. As I said before, we provide it seven days a week, 365 days a year for, 14, for about 14 and a half hours a day, uh, including Christmas and Thanksgiving, because homelessness does not take a holiday, unfortunately. Um, we're the access point for any individuals entering emergency shelters in Broward County, which means you can only get into an emergency shelter in Broward County if you come through the task force we have to make the referral to all of the emergency shelters for individuals in Broward County. Um, we engage people, we build rapport, we assess them for services. We enter information into what we call our homeless management information system or our data system, which collects all the information on homeless individuals in all of Broward County. Um, and that is what we do as part of our outreach services. We also provide what we call housing navigation services. And this is a new service. I say a new service. It's a new service to us. Um, just starting last November, we've started these programs, um, but they've really kind of taken off across the county. Um, housing navigation is a little bit different. We have two teams. Uh, they consist of two individuals on each team. And what we do, uh, sorry, the teams are currently uh, funded through the city of Hollywood. They have a, an exclusive contract with us to have their own outreach housing navigation team. And we also have a contract with uh, the Broward Behavioral Health Coalition. We also have a proposal which has been uh, approved by the city of Fort Lauderdale for them to have their own uh, outreach team. And we're currently in talks with the city of Tamarack to have their own outreach team as well. 
So these housing navigation teams are a little bit different than just doing outreach. So they don't just make referrals to emergency shelter. What's different about housing navigation is the housing navigators work with the people on the streets to actually get them into housing directly from the streets if that's what they need. There are, uh, there's a lot of the homeless population that is unsheltered that cannot or will not go to a shelter um, because of varying reasons. Sometimes it's mental health issues, sometimes substance abuse issues. Sometimes they just can't follow the rules or they can't be around too many people. They're afraid because they've been to the shelters and they've had their things stolen, whatever the situation is. They will not or cannot go back to the shelter. And so what our housing navigators do is they start to do case management with these individuals and they'll actually do direct placements from the streets into housing. Um, they'll get them things like birth certificates. They'll get them identification. They'll help them locate apartments. They'll actually help them locate what programs that they're eligible for through our continuum of care, all of the providers within Broward County. And they'll, They'll try to help them get to services if they need treatment, substance abuse treatment services, mental health treatment services, any of those types of things. But they'll do this while they're case managing them on the street rather than asking them to go to a shelter to get the services. If, they, if they're if they willing to go to a shelter, that's perfectly fine. We can make that referral. But the reality is we know that there are several people out on the streets right now, particularly in Lauder Hill, that will not go to the shelter. And so we're trying to help them specifically get into housing. And then eventually we'll help them move into housing themselves. We'll find the apartments, we'll help with security deposits, we'll help with first month's rent, we'll help with application fees. We have funding to do all of those things and we'll help them get moved in to uh, actual housing. In closing, I just wanted to point out a couple of uh, statistics. Um, Based on point in time counts over the years, Lauder Hill is the fourth um, largest city with a homeless problem, if you want to think of it that way. In 2021, or well, let me start with 2020. In 2020, there were 10 people that we found unsheltered in the city of Lauder Hill. In 2021, there were 180 people that we found in the city of Lauder Hill, from 10 to 180. This year, again, unconfirmed reports. According to the vice mayor a meeting she was in, it could be as much as double that for 2022. I don't have that official information yet, but I can certainly get that for you and get that back to you as well. But there's certainly a rising problem that's going on in Water Hill. So I just wanted to let you know that we have services that are available for homeless individuals. We have services that are available that can be specifically tailored to the city of Water Hill. If that's something that you're interested in, and I just wanted to introduce myself and also be a resource for you. I want you to know that we have a lot of information about the unsheltered population in Broward County. We're out there. We know the people. We've seen the people. There isn't, almost isn't a day that goes by that somebody calls that doesn't call us and say, hey, I have this homeless individual who is hanging out outside my business or whatever the case is, where I don't turn to my staff and they say, we know exactly who Johnny is. We know exactly who Reggie is. We know who exactly who Norma is or whoever the individual is. There just about isn't anybody on the street that we don't already know. Um, now, getting them off of the street sometimes, again, takes a little bit more work and a little more effort. And that's what we're trying to do with these types of services. Now, I heard that you um, that you're not Kim Hill, but I don't I, think I, I notated your name. Carl Falconer. Carl Falconer. Yes. All right, Carl, uh, we've got a few questions uh, for you. Uh, first one coming in from Commissioner Saray Martin. Right. Yeah, yes, thank you, Carl. Um, the organization you're with, uh, Task Force, say the name of the organization? Task Force for Ending Homelessness. Task Force. And is this the same task force that our Officer Keechel works That with? is. It is the one and only, yes. Officer Keechel works great with us. He's fantastic. We love him call him all the time. He calls us. It's a great relationship we have. Awesome. Thank you. And how do we, uh, I guess, contact you? And the reason I ask, because there's the homeless shelter, um, the Jim Moran, I believe that's the name of it. Um, there's only a certain way you could get to it. The people can't walk from the public. You have to come in either 
through a police officer or referring agency. You're talking about the Central Homeless Assistance Center downtown right. in Broward. Right. That's correct. They don't allow people to come in there by themselves. You have to actually come in uh, uh, escorted with someone. It's part of their, they made an agreement with the homeowners associations around that area. That's the one shelter that you actually have to be escorted into. Um, but we have, again, nobody can get into an emergency shelter as an individual unless they come through task force. Okay. So you actually have to see one of us and we have to do an assessment with you and make a referral to the shelter for you. Now that's assuming there are shelter beds because oftentimes mm -hmm. they're not, but every morning we get the full count of all the beds that are available in Broward County. And then we, we have a prioritization process that we go through that we go ahead and we divide them out to people based on priority. Okay. And I've ran into individuals who've called me up and said, Hey, I'm, I'm, coming homeless and need some help yes and so i said let's go through the system and i yes. wanted to participate because i wanted to see how it worked sure let's call 211 you call 211 and then they say here's a list of other places you can call and you call the list of other places to call but then they say here's some other people you can call and you just kind of keep going down this rabbit hole but they're saying that that is the only way to get into the system is through 211 are you part of 211 or you're 211 is not the best way to go through the system okay. um, because 211 has a broader scope of who they're serving and the services that they provide the better um, system is there's an actual homeless helpline and they can tell you exactly where we will be we not only do we do street outreach or what we call street requests which means if you called us directly that we could go ahead and we could send someone out to wherever it was that the person was, assuming that they couldn't get to one of our locations. But we also have what we call assessment locations every, seven days a week where, where we know that we're going to have individuals at those locations. And usually they're very well-known locations, LifeNet for Families, Hope South Florida, Mount Olivet Church, you know, these kinds of places where we know people are gonna hang out anyway or we know homeless individuals are tending to go for other services. So we have a schedule set up and it's actually on our website. If you go to our website, taskforceoutreach.org, you can actually see the assessment locations of where we will be seven days a week. And you can send people there. That's our first choice is to try to bring people there because we know we'll have people there. If the people can't get there, then we can actually send people to wherever it is that they are. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, City Manager Desiree Giles Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the services that you provide to us. Uh, this is such a great lifeline for those people who are in need. Absolutely. And I just want to say, if you have some materials that we could um, post, um, and we're, we just updated our website. I don't have the materials printed yet for our new information, but I do have cards that I can give you. And um, I'll also make sure that you all have a link to our website. Our Perfect. website, the address will stay the same. So it's taskforceoutreach.org, but we're getting ready to update it. So like tomorrow or the next day, that was a secret preview. <laughs> sorry, not supposed to say anything yet, but like tomorrow or the next day, we're going to update it. And you'll be able to see all of the information that you ever wanted to get there. We have our, our we do monthly reports, um, which I think I have the vice mayor on now, I think, um, where we send out task force monthly reports of our demographic information and information about the people we come in contact with. And then we also have all of our outreach locations and all of that information. It's all on our website. Well, great. I want to just make sure that we get that information. I want to Absolutely. make sure we get it out to our homeowners association. So when they come across somebody and they want to help them, absolutely, this will be a tool they can use. Thank that you is so much. absolutely correct. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Lawrence Jabo Martin. Yes. Thank you, uh, Carl, for your presentation. Uh -huh. And two questions. Uh, the numbers that you mentioned are I won't say staggering, but they're very concerning, obviously, yep. over a three-year or two-year trend yep. to go from double digits to triple digits, triple digits and then doubling. doubling. Um, mm -hmm. Does your information, your demographics, identify specific areas where the major problems are, particularly in the city of Lauderdale? Hill? Yes, we have some location <laughs> indicators based off of the point-in-time count. Now, the point-in-time count is only a snapshot, so it only tells us one day out of the year, but it gives us a, a real good count of like on any given day, this is how many people will be in your area. But we do have um, geolocators that we use for our point in time count. So I could 
give you very specific locations in terms of mapping where we found the people and everything like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Curious. And another question, um, do you find this population to be very transient? No, not as much as you would think. Um, our, we're tracking data on that on our task force monthly reports. We track that data. We ask people um, how long they've been in the Broward County area. And generally we have not found about 15% of the people um, have not been here 90 days or more. Um, but it's a very small number. So about 85% of the people that we run into have been here longer than 90 days. And generally when I've when I've worked again, I've worked in this industry for quite a while and I've checked the numbers across the country. And it's almost about the same. And usually what you find is the number of people that leave your area is about the same as the number of people that come, new people that come in. So it's really kind of a wash, but about 85 to 90% of the people at any given time are neighbors who live here, grew up here, went to high school here. In fact, one of our outreach workers, one of our new outreach workers, started using a new question, which we were, you know, kind of curious about is he started asking everybody where they go to high school. Mm. And he, sure enough, because he went to high school here and sure enough, he's running into people that he went to high school with and went to high school in other areas around here that were close. Um, but it's a great question because he knows that most of the people are going to be able to say somewhere here in Broward County is where they went to high school. That's interesting. Yeah. And my last question or comment. <clears throat> As far as the officers that you have or the case the case workers, yes, are they physically carrying caseloads, or they just kind of working day to day dealing with? They stay at they, the regular uh, over and over. The housing navigators have a specific caseload of what we call priority clients that they work with, so they keep a pretty small caseload, ten to fifteen at a time, and then when they move somebody into housing, they pick somebody else up off of the street. So we try not to give them too many that they're working with at one time, but about 10 to 15 at any given time. And then they move those people off of the streets, but they also have, they still do outreach. So they still have a whole bunch of other people that they come in contact with. And they're basically teeing them up to kind of move them to the priority level, if you will. Now, these pay positions and, or do you have uh, room for volunteers? They are all paid positions currently. Um, they go through extensive training, except for the extensive um, certifications, things like that, that we have specifically for them. But we do have room for volunteers, and we've had people go out with us and volunteer as well. So, yeah, there's an opportunity for that. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Carl, just a couple of general questions. Sure. Um, how many homeless shelters are there in the county, and how many beds are there? There are four major home, well, five, five, sorry, five major homeless shelters. One is a domestic violence shelter. Okay. That's women in distress. That's a smaller shelter. The exact number of units, you're going to have to excuse me. I, okay. I, sorry. Off the top of my head, I can't recall exactly how many we have. Um, I'm sure I can look it up and get the information for you, though. How many kids are involved uh, who, who, who are homeless that you're working with? <laughs> We don't work specifically with kids. We have a partner agency, Hope South Florida, that works with the families okay. to specifically work with families to get them into shelter. So when we run into families, we refer them to Hope South Florida, and then they work to get them into the shelters specifically. So they're the front door for the homeless shelters for families. We're the front door for homeless shelters for individuals. But we work hand in hand. They go out with us. We go out with them. We see them on a regular basis. Which is the entity that is able to get the housing vouchers, uh, the choice vouchers to help people get into housing? Um, depending on the vouchers that you're talking about, there's all kinds of different vouchers. We have the latest ones that we received were emergency housing vouchers um, that we got, and we were actually an access point for those. So we help people apply for those emergency housing vouchers. Um, and they're still, we're still in the process of getting people moved in to those for those. Um, but I think they've actually closed it because they have like double the number of people on the list for the vouchers that they have. But in terms of section eight and all of that, we yes. do that as well. Our housing navigators do all of that. They, they're scouring every possible apartment and unit location that they can possibly get for our individuals. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Dunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so at our last LHPP meeting, um, 
uh, Kim was at that meeting as well as Hope South Florida. And um, Hope South Florida shared some really interesting data about the number of children from the city of Lauderhill that are homeless. I'm actually going to invite them to come on the next um, commission workshop so that you can see the number was quite staggering. Um, and so the face of homelessness is, is not what it used to be. It's changing. As I mentioned, the, the spot in time um, report for the city of Lauderhill is, is the unofficial number has doubled. Mm -hmm. I believe when we did the community needs assessment, it was a hundred and something. And um, based on the preliminary data, it's almost 280. Um, and so I have personally, since the year started, helped at least four or five families um, that were facing homelessness. And each time it was a single mother with children. The last family that I was able to um, connect and serve through um, Hope South Florida was a, a lady who moved down here from Rhode Island with her two, with her three children, all of her three children. Um, she had a, 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 she had like a two-year-old, a three-year-old and like a six-year-old. And so she ended up being on the streets and luckily we were able to get her um, help with housing. Similarly, we had another case, a mother who um, had maybe four or five children um, that were in school in Lauderhill. And we were able to, through Tamika helping, um, we were able, and the Lauderhill Housing Authority, we were able to help her get housing. So this is um, an emerging issue for the city of Lauderhill. And I, I wanted to kind of bring it to our attention because as we know, there's a trend now with the amount of foreclosure that we're about to expect. And so as we go into um, our planning season for next year, I think it's prudent for us to keep this issue top of mind um, because it's coming and we should be prepared for it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Yes, I do. Absolutely. I'll give you all one of my cards. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. The uh, board is clear, but I just can't resist. Now, now Carl Falconer. Now, do you, uh, did you get pushed into Falcon Birds? Uh, and, and No, I did not. I did not take that route. Okay, uh, just I was, curious. I was thinking that, you know, at some point I might, but, you know, unfortunately, that's just my ancestry, so. Okay, that's okay, all. just curious. But, well, thank you all very much. Okay, thank you. We're... Uh, on to the uh, next item, which is number six, uh, Brookfield Square HOA, Mary Ann Raymond, requested by um, Commissioner Saray Martin. Uh, Mayor, thank you. <clears throat> As uh, my colleagues know, I do a lot of work with the uh, condominiums and some of the issues that uh, the residents there deal with. Uh, so on this one particular occasion, there was a resident uh, that reached out to me. Her name is uh, Ms. Mary Ann. Uh, she's in the audience with her family. You want to raise your hand? She is here. Uh, and there was an issue with some liens, um, with the selling of her property. So we reviewed it with legal and our legal team here. So I'm going to ask Earl if he could just uh, kind of share some of the background and what we're looking to do uh, to try to resolve this situation. Yes. Mayor and Commissioner, so um, as Commissioner uh, Ray Martin indicated, um, Ms. Raymond, um, a few months ago, uh, was in a real estate transaction selling some property and the properties had liens on them. And normally what happens in that situation, the, the seller, they have liens, they'll reach out to the city and they'll plot a mitigation form. And the city manager has authority on our ordinances to, to mitigate uh, the liens. But um, in this situation, um, we didn't get the uh, mitigation form in prior to closing. Um, and so after closing, we realized that she paid into the city um, a total of $14,896.47. Had she submitted the mitigation form and the manager had mitigated the, the, the lien, she would have only paid uh, $2,185.15. But because the closing had already occurred, the manager's discretion was gone. So now it's, it's to the commission to make the decision if you, if you all wish to direct the manager and I um, to refund the difference of $12,711 because he, 
you know, I guess she paid the entire amount at her closing, but had she submitted the mitigation form, she would have only paid uh, about 2100 and she would not have paid the other 12000 So that's the summary of the, of the matter. All right, Commissioner Grant. Yes, Mayor, is she here? Is she, she here? Yes, she's right. Yes, okay. Yes, um, you, want, you want her to come up? It's, I guess it's not necessary, only if you want to. I just wanted to, to see her if she was here. But nonetheless, um, based on what you have said, Earl, um, I will I will go with that, yes, for her to be refunded the amount. Just curious as to why the proper forms were not submitted in a timely fashion, though. Uh, sometimes it's the, as you, Mayor, as you know, this is the agents that are doing all your research for you and telling you what you should do and to get all the various liens identified for closing. And we don't know whether it's one of our agents that missed it or not, but it was soon after she reached out to us and, and, and asked me the mitigation form, so. All right. Uh, Commissioner Jabo Martin. Yeah, just so it's on the record, what were the uh, violations? Liens and I do not know. Maybe uh, I don't remember exactly what they're for, but um, and I'll just give a little quick background about some of the condominium associations. Right. They were not for right. her unit. They were common se. areas. They were it was a common, common area. area. That's right. That's where they were. And what's a common practice? So let's say a condominium association's pool is inoperable. Right. They will re request that that property manager right. get that pool up to speed. And during the interim, they will take whatever liens that the city is opposing on that condominium right. association, and they will divide it and spread it across right. all of the unit owners. So the resident, the unit owner, was not at fault in any kind of way and had no way of mitigating the the, 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 the damage or the code and for right. She couldn't fix it on her own. It wasn't her fault. She had no idea. And it was just placed across all of the uh, apartments. And, and I'm familiar with the case. I think she wrote to all of us. And I can say I'm glad you picked up on this, Ray, and went with it. But I just think it was very important to get that on the record. Yes. So people just don't realize that right. uh, this is something you just walk in and do. And hopefully people looking and listening, if you're purchasing or selling a property, um, make sure your people are doing their due diligence so you're not put in this awkward situation. It's 14000 It's 14000 I don't care how you slice it. So, yeah. I don't have a problem. I, very good. I'd, I'd be in favor of uh, reducing the amount down. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, so would I. Yeah. All right. So I think I'm looking at the other half of the dance. No, we're Everybody. Okay, okay. Okay, good, okay, good. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I think there's a consensus okay. to, uh, right. to uh, helping her out since it was not her fault. Yes. Okay. Uh, that there was a violation. All right, Mayor. We'll proceed accordingly. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. That and was success. <laughs> and um, at, at this point, um, I know she flew down from New York and she's probably flying back. Can you just explain how this process would work? I know we got to go to the city commission meeting and what's the timeline? Well, no, 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 we don't. No, we don't. Because because, because of the, 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 the amount, the amount being 14,000, city manager has authority to process it with, with the finance director to get it done. So if it's over 30, it'd be a different matter. But the city manager can, 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 we can come back. We can, so we can manage it. Does she have? Or the city manager. What, she, what we'll need is some kind of a place to, for Kenny to, to send the monies and stuff like that. So she needs to maybe go over Kenny. Can you have some of your staff to talk to her to get where she's living now so we can get, get the funds to her? But but the manager has the authority she to do it. She left the son and went to the polls? Hmm? She left the son and went to the polls? She's in New York? New no, she actually moved to, I think it's Lauderdale Lakes, but she's up what? north with her oh, family. Family. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 so, so if, yeah, if, if she's local, that's even better. So I thought she moved away. Okay. So she's local. Yes, good, good. Okay. All right. If we have uh, concluded that item, we're on to number seven. Which became Lion Soccer. Oh, no, that was off. No, oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, all right, Lion Soccer Recreation Program. Yep. Um, requested by Commissioner Denise D. Grant. Yes, Mayor. And so during our 15 minutes, I actually spoke with um, the leaders in the Parks Department, and um, all things have been squared away, and they're going to have dialogue with the coaches. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. That's well, it. All right. Fantastic. That was a quick one. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> we're at item eight, discussion of key 
to the city requested by me. The, I think that the uh, premier award that comes from the city of Lotta Hill ought to be the key to the city. Um, and as we operate on a day-by-day -day -day basis, uh, you come to realizations. And I think that the uh, way that we decide who gets the city, uh, the key to the city needs to change. Uh, I would propose that key, the key to the city is voted upon by the full commission, and in order to present a key to someone, uh, there needs to be a four-fifths vote. Um, and if there were only four out of five present, then all four at that time would have to vote for it. Then I think the key to the city becomes a, a prized and treasured thing. Um, it was uh, the original Lit, uh, uh, literature, the original legislation said that the mayor would decide uh, who gets this, the, the key, but that has not worked out. And, and I accept that fact. So we move on. We come up with something new. I'm proposing that the full commission votes on who gets this, the key, and it will take a uh, super majority in order for it to be awarded. I agree. No other criteria can be put in place to what? maybe stifle even it getting to the commission. I'm thinking, well, if we uh, would be the arbiters of whether it is a worthwhile item. So I don't think that we have to have or put anything else in place uh, at least uh, four-fifths of uh, us would have to say, yeah, that's a great idea to give that person or that organization the key. Now, that would also mean that because uh, life moves so fast that we will deal with these requests either at a city commission meeting or workshop, that it would be understood that the request to give the key uh, to the city could be on any agenda that, uh, that we have. Um, Vice Mayor Dunn. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about criteria. Um, I think it'll be good to add to that, um, that the person it had to be either a lot of, there has to be some tie. Nexus. Yeah, some some tie to Lot of Hill, whether you're a Lot of Hill business, a Lot of Hill resident, um, or, or, yeah, there has to be some sort of tie to the city of Lot of Hill. All right, I'm uh, looking at the hands. Next up was uh, number three, uh, Commissioner Grant. Uh, yes, Mayor, I agree with you 100%, and I'm glad that you brought this up so we have a better understanding of how to move forward. So this is excellent. In addition to that, um, as Vice Mayor Dunn exclaimed, um, a lot of resident, a lot of business, but sometimes if it's a head of state, mayor and that person is not a Lauder Hill resident, uh, that would not fit the criteria. However, if they have something to do with Lauder Hill, as is mentioned, tied possibly, but I think what you have outlined is sufficient enough. But if you were to add some other language or clause, I would not uh, disagree to that. I, I have no objections to other uh, items being added. Um, no. Lawrence Jabo Martin. Yeah, that was going to be my comment also. Again, I know we gave one to the Prime Minister of the Bahamas. And, you know, basically as a, as a, dip, a diplomatic acknowledgement um, of what we hope to be doing long-term business with this country. So ties to the city, employment, or otherwise, and um, heads of state or, or officials. I don't know how you word that, Earl. That's no, I, I, I have it. I, I understand what it, with the comments that I've heard from uh, Vice Mayor Don, Commissioner Grant, and yourself, Commissioner Martin. Um, we're looking at um, adding criteria that for the city commission to consider, such as um, Lord Hill residents, businesses, or heads of state. So those are the kind of things that we'll say, and I'll give it like that as a such as, as a criteria. 
Right. It's, 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 it's a business. It's a business. Yeah. It qualifies already. Okay. Yes. It would have a CIO. Right. It would qualify. Right. Commissioner Saray Martin. Yeah. yeah. Two two things. One, I'm I'm echoing the same thing that the other commissioners are saying. Um, the nexus, but also not so restricted that you couldn't give it to a heads of state or a yes. large company or business that may come in and uh, do a lot for employment, whatever the case may be. Um, and then I would also add just to entertain the thought. I don't think we have a plaque yet made, but maybe something on the wall that starts indicating uh, who we gave keys of the city to. So that as time goes on, if there's a whole new commission, they come in and say, we got a key to the city. We don't have no record of that. I've never <laughs> seen that before. <laughs> but maybe if we had a plaque with okay. the ongoing, um, you know, put a little label and they okay. shows that they had a key to the city, but just a suggestion. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Uh, is there anything else on this item? All right. We'll move on to item nine, Mother's Day makeover requested by Vice Mayor Melissa P. Dunn. All right. So tonight we get to announce. Oh, we're announcing the winners. We have seven fabulous ladies that will be treated to a Mother's Day makeover next week sunday so the women will have a full day starting um at 9 a.m there will be they'll have full hair makeup nails provided by um, florida academy of health and beauty and truly rooted um, natural hair and barber studio and then from there, they're going to get whisked off to nail the DIY for an afternoon of women empowerment with appetizers and mimosas. And so we are today announcing the winners. So we have seven winners. Uh, Ms. Thomas um, has been a single mom for two years now, and she prides herself on, on helping not only her own children, but children in our community. Uh, Miss Jones is actually a grandmother. She's 86 years old from um, the Parkway St. George's area. And she also is one of our seniors at the Sadkin Center. So she is going to get a, um, a makeover. Miss Wright um, is, you know, she does a lot of work on at her church. And she's one of our cafeteria workers at a, a school um, in Broward County, and um, she loves encouraging kids and, 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 of course, raising her own and helping to take care of our children as they're at school. Miss um, Her Herkes, I hope I'm not butchering her, her name, but she, um, you know, this is something that somebody wrote about her, that she is a good-hearted individual and a loving mother, and they say that she... Um, is a survivor. She's a true survivor um, who deserves a day to relax and be appreciated. And um, and then Miss Williams, um, she has an eight-year-old daughter that's the light of her life. And she has always worked on not only celebrating and taking care of her own kid, but she also tutors other children as well. And um, Miss Young is very active in the community and she has two of her own children. And then she also um, helps with the neighbor's kids. She volunteers and um, she, um, it says here that something I, that I truly believe our children would use more of, the love and support, not just of our own mothers, but of community of mothers that guide them through academic extracurricular activities and beyond. And Miss Young provides that for a lot of young people, um, not just her own, but children in the neighborhood as well. And Miss Foster is, um, is a single mom herself, but she's also a preschool teacher at Greater Horizons Academy. So um, all seven women clearly are very deserving. And so next slide, we have our Lauderhill Shines business owners 
who are collaborating together to create a day of pampering, a day of um, great experience. So in addition to, you know, the beauty spa morning and then the women empowerment afternoon, they're also going to be um, an opportunity for someone to receive two hours of free house cleaning services. Um, two 30 minute personal training sessions, dinner for two, a swag bag with jewelry and, um, you know, gift cards and, and um, uh, aromatherapy, essential oils, makeup. And so these companies, um, Florida Academy for Health and Beauty, Truly Rooted Natural Hair and Barber Studio, Nailed It DIY Studio, Vaughn and Lawn Boutique, Just for Girls, Josiah Speaks Hope, Sandra's Divine Gems, Queen Essentials, La Saint Femme, MRA Auditing, Lavish Lifestyle, Liquid Paradise, Creative HR Partners, Multi-Professional Services and Tax, Try 3 Fitness, and um, Dija, I'm sorry, um, Flowers and Decor, Crystal Clear Cleaning of South Florida, and Maggie's Aromatherapy with Essential Oils. All 14 of these companies um, will be partnering together to create a special day for our single moms. And um, today we're announcing the winners. They are going to have the service next Sunday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then um, on the commission meeting in June, the first moment we'll share the photos and the highlights so it's going to be a really fantastic day uh, uh, if any of you are are in the area and you feel like stopping by truly rooted or by um, between the hours of 9 and 12 or by nail the DIY and just to say hello please feel free to come by and they're going to be getting like gift bags with a lot of swag so I'm, I'm totally excited about it and I'm really proud of our lot of hill shines business owners for um for deciding to give back to the community, particular since a lot of them are startup businesses themselves. So that's it, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. We'll move to item 10, update on beautification efforts requested by Vice Mayor Melissa P. Dunn. I'll go ahead. I, I think, Commissioner Dunn, um, we just gonna have a slide on our beautification. I think Brian was up first, Brian and Scott. And these are some of our beautification efforts that we've done throughout the city. I know Public Works is gonna come up as Tamika and Martine, April from Code. Good evening. And Chief from Fire. <laughs> so you wanna go ahead and get started, Scott? Next slide. Sure. So um, some of the beautification efforts that the Parks Department has done, uh, there's several ways we try to beautify the parks. Uh, one is our daily operations. So we've begun to implement the plan that you guys approved, which is ordering all the heavy equipment, the lawnmowers, uh, the, the vehicles. So um, we've started to get some of that equipment in that's going to help us keep the parks beautiful. And uh, we expect some more to come in the next two to three months. Presently, we put one maintenance worker at each park so that there's accountability. If that park doesn't look well, we know sometimes it's two super, uh, maintenance workers if it's a large park. And um, so uh, we also do uh, park blitzes. So that's where we would take six to 10 maintenance workers and uh, we would just hit one park. So the other ways that we can keep the parks beautiful is the geo bond. So a lot of the geo bond dollars went to new facilities and also landscaping. So that's helped. And we'll have some slides to show you guys that. And then lastly, special events and projects. Um, Commissioner Grant's Adopt-A-Park. We currently have five parks that are adopted. Those adoptees visit the park six times per year. Those are basically like park blitzes, so those help us as well. Some of the community projects like 51st Avenue and the Love Project, um, those we've done outside of the parks. And then um, we partnered with uh, Public Works, helps us, we help them. Uh, the fire department as well. So we have a slide at the end. We're going to show you where we beautified one of those parks. Next slide. So Jackie Gleason Park, this is uh, one of the Geobond projects. And um, we uh, improved the privacy wall in front of the neighbors on the west side of the park. <clears throat> we also improved the asphalt walking trail, including uh, installing uh, lighting around the 
walking trail. So the walking trail, we also expanded to create a loop so that there's a walking path now that they can take. Next slide. The golf course barn, as you guys can see in the top left corner, our barn used to look like a backyard shed, really large. And uh, now we have this beautiful new facility with a cupola. And um, in the bottom, you guys can see the um, landscape beautification that our foreman, Jackie Taylor, who's really good at uh, design and landscaping has started to do at all the parks. One of the plans is to do landscaping around the buildings at the entrances of the park and throughout the park as needed. So there's a couple slides I'm gonna point out some of her design. So um, the golf course barn has definitely been improved. Next slide. South Gateway Park, this particular GM bond project was mostly about landscape beautification. So we have a before and after picture of the bridge and um, the main fountain in the middle that was repaired and also the landscaping that you guys see. This is uh, this was a geobond project that uh, made me think about maybe opening a side business of nursery as far as how much <laughs> landscaping costs. <laughs> Next slide. And the sports park, I think all of you guys were there. Uh, that's where we partnered with the Florida Panthers to paint uh, parking stops, curbs, and mulch. And we are contributing this uh, to their good luck in the first round of the playoffs <laughs> last week. Next slide. That was it. St. George Park. Again, I think we were all there this past Saturday where we dedicated the beautiful uh, covered basketball court and renaming. And uh, this project also included some landscape beautification as well, as, as well as a new playground and interior painting the building. Uh, so St. George got a big uplift. Next slide. Veterans Park. Since I kind of started a Veterans Park, this is dear to my heart, but Veterans Park turned out beautiful. Brian Picnic, project manager, want to mention that. Um, so again, this is one of those parks where our uh, foreman, Jackie Taylor, did the landscaping in front of the building. So we did that on our own without the contractor. But uh, does his landscaping eye, or uh, <laughs> I should say design eye, that park turned out beautiful. So Veterans Park also, uh, the geo bond helped us update that. Next slide. Wally Elfers Park, that's again an adopt a park initiative. Uh, Jackie Vernon Thompson and the Inside Out School of Etiquette partners with us. Um, they're about to do their third one coming up here soon. Um, we basically replace benches, uh, landscaping, mulching, pressure cleaning. And actually, after our first one, we, uh, we were raided by iguanas. So we actually had to go back to the table and do that again. <laughs> so uh, Wally Elfers Park is being taken care of, and they're about to do their third coming up here shortly. Next slide. Westwind Park is adopted by the Kiwanis Club. They've also met three times. We've done things like painting the pillars. We've got a new building, uh, planted flowers, and uh, the hockey uh, slab that we have out there. So the Kiwanis Club's done a real good job for us out there. Next slide. West Kenlark Park, as you know, we're currently under construction with the eight-lane track, renovation of the building, and there's going to be beautification with landscaping as well around the outside areas. Next slide. And then lastly, we just went over some other projects that um, we've done with the geo bond and other CDBG funding, but we have the Windermere basketball court canopy. James Bradley Park also got a lot of landscaping and a new pavilion. The Sacken Center got an overhang. Uh, John Mullins Park also got updates on the walking trail and the um, May Jenk, I think that's, uh, that's uh, James Bradley again at the bottom with the amphitheater. And then Waterford Park in the bottom right is another adopt a park with Charlie, coffee with Charlie. Next slide. And then this is the uh, front of the fire station 73. This is where we partnered with the fire department where Jackie, our foreman and a few of her staff went out there and used decorative rock plants and renovated the front entrance. So this is some of the things we wanna do in front of all the parks um, and in interior and all. Next slide. He's on Zoom. He's on Zoom. Oh, okay. You can go ahead, Martin. Good evening, uh, commissioners. Good, good evening, everybody, city manager. Um, yes, I think uh, Scott's presentation on parks uh, is, is great. And, and we are always in partnership with, with uh, the community as uh, we always try to address things that are come from uh, 
questions from them, uh, from the eyes and ear program, hey, uh, help us uh, remove graffiti or trash. So we also do have in, 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 in public works, we also work for the geo bond things, um, uh, address um, some of the items uh, that are related to geo bond with, uh, um, of course, the walls, for example, and medians. We also have um, uh, landscape main maintenance as the daily operations, waterfall maintenance, uh, pressure cleaning and painting routinely, stormwater management uh, maintenance, which relates to um, um, the canals, and of course, the litter program and some asphalt and concrete repairs. Next, please. Next slide. So uh, as daily operations for public works, uh, the landscape irrigations, these are also pictures before and after. Um, and and uh, included is the irrigation and landscaping that goes al along the walls. Next, please. So uh, pressure washing and painting. Um, um, we have uh, wash uh, pressure. Uh, we pressure wash the bus stops and sidewalks and bus uh, and the landing pads at each bus stop. Also walls and remove graffitis and paint them after, like before and after. Next slide. So um, thanks to the commission, uh, we have a new truck that cleans the catch basin. It's very important for uh, you know keeping keeping the the flood levels low. And um, on the right side, you see the pictures on the top. Um, we usually get a lot of plastic bottles, uh, plastic bags, um, styrofoam, and this is after it is clean. Very important for the beautification and 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 reduction of the flood. Next slide, please. So um, similarly with the canals, uh, we do have uh, uh, spraying for weeds and for algae. We have the curb ends. Also, we paint the the, the fence, the the picket fence and and columns, and we also pick up the litter from the from the canals. Next slide. For the pavement marking and signing restoration. Um, we also have a small machine that does uh, striping. As you can see, um, we have a stripe uh, pedestrian uh, um, crosswalks, uh, stop bars, as well as um, um, speed humps. Next slide. Uh, the daily operation is also very important, litter pickup and site restoration. We do have... Um, a, a, a small um, a vacuum um, that helps us pick up litter, you know, through the swells. Uh, we stop at every bus stop and pick up the and change the bags on the on the trash cans. We also do site restoration um, when when there is uh, usual um, abandoning from old time. We 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 try to clear. Uh, and and plant uh, new landscaping too. Next slide. Uh, and trash pickup. Uh, you know, we usually get uh, from administration or from the public calls for a an illegal dumping. Uh, also, we are operating the that truck that you see in the center is is um, is a grappler. And, and it helps remove, uh, just like the bulk uh, trash, it helps remove a lot of the, of the, uh, of the illegal dumping and try to uh, improve and add to the beautification program for the city. I think that's it. And I think uh, next is code. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, the privacy walls, of course, uh, which was addressed by Scott, and uh, we have in several 
areas and we're continue doing. Currently we're working on 19th Street um, between 33rd and, and 37. And, um, and there will be some more coming. Next slide. The medians, um, the medians uh, are also part of our of a, of a hybrid that we're working with uh, finances to do it in house and have some good savings and do more. Of course, um, this is uh, pictures of the medians in uh, um, Broward Estates, and we're moving into um, 441, uh, all the intersections, 12th Street, 16. And then uh, 26. Next slide. And of course, in the special events and, and other projects, we have swell reconfiguration, very important for, for uh, improving the, the, the drainage. We have a speed hump installation, and we have also rumble strips uh, installation to kind of warn uh, drivers uh, that there may be a curve or a speed hump uh, ahead. Next slide. So I'll yield to the fire department. Thank you, next slide, please. So here's fire station 30, obviously one of our oldest fire stations in our city that we have on the left on the before picture. And uh, now we have the after. So, so far, we're getting close to the completion of the fire station. We're hoping for a grand opening day sometime in June. We've had some delays that were very unfortunate, but we're hoping to overcome those challenges and um, have the new fire station open up. And again, thank you to Scott and his team for the purification of Station 73. We're very proud and we're very happy for the improvements. Cold. Hello. Um, I'm going to uh, help Andre to show a few pictures of before and after pictures of properties that have been brought into compliance. And that's what we expect from our code enforcement department. Although it is enforcement, what we're really looking for is compliance. If people right. people can bring their properties up, uh, whether it be planting grass or putting in trees or fixing your driveway, that's what the city really wants. We really don't want to impose fines and liens. What we want is to have the properties uh, fit into the standards water. So I'll let April go on from there. Yes. So um, this is one property that that's a before picture, uh, after picture. That's the before picture. That's on the east side. Oh, nice. That's another one after picture. Not better. Before. I think it was one before that. Yeah, it was one before that. That showed that's the after, I think. That's it was one before. That's all they have. Well, those were some of the homes that we cited and they brought them into compliance. So that's the work of code enforcement. Good. All right, great. <laughs> uh, vice Mayor Dunn. Yes, thank you guys so much. Um, I brought this item up because I remember in um, the focus group, most a lot of almost every single um, constituency group that we spoke to, cleanliness and beautification was one of their top concerns. And I knew that you guys were doing the work, but sometimes we have to get really good at telling our own story to the community. And so I wanted to create an opportunity for you to share with the community what's happening, um, particularly if you're driving and it seems to the naked eye like it's not moving fast enough, right? And I know, city manager, that um, more work is planned. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Well, I did have some questions. Um, so, Martine, 
Could you talk a little bit about, um, so the litter program, there is an area in particular that I've noticed um, that every time I drive by, I, I think like, okay, I should perhaps text Desiree to put it on your list, but then I'm driving, so I forget. And by the time I'm not driving, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, so the area that's the intersection of 31st and Sunrise, I think that's a swap shop area. Um, that place is always atrocious, in my opinion, with a lot of plastic bottles and bags. And um, so if I could bring that to your attention, I don't know if there's anything we can do. It's the swap shop property. Yes. Um, I don't corner. know. I'm assuming so. At the corner, we, we, we have a couple of bus stops. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner, um, it, it be, we'll, we'll, we'll try to reinforce that. Uh, but of course, uh, code enforcement actually is being very helpful also trying to work with the owner, with the swap shop, because sometimes that litter is generated inside their premises. Sometimes the wind carries it. But in, in, uh, I think it was last week, uh, we were just talking about some effort in, uh, around that corner on the south side. Yeah, yeah. And then I had a question in regards to the potholes and the sidewalk repair. How is there a process in place, Martine, where a resident could perhaps, how does a resident report or suggest about fixing a cracked sidewalk or yep. how do we how do we get that in the pipeline so, so uh tamika is if, if tamika is in there um we have a, a sidewalk repair program uh we actually go notify um oh there she is so um i, I guess let i let tamika go over the sidewalk program and maybe the pothole as well Good evening, everyone. So yes, Vice Mayor, we do have a sidewalk program. To answer your question, how residents can go about contacting the Public Works Department if they have identified that there's a sidewalk that is in disrepair, in need of repair, they contact us, we send someone out from the staff and they inspect the sidewalk so that way we can go ahead and generate a repair request. Now, other times there are staff that take the due diligence to go out and they identify a sidewalk that is already in need of repair and then we contact the resident via certified return receipt mail to let them know that there's a sidewalk that abuts their property that is in need of this that is in need of repair that's in disrepair and they can go ahead and go through that repair process which normally would be pulling a permit getting a contractor to site oh, so the resident will be the person responsible for fixing their sidewalk yeah. that is correct yeah. with our sidewalker oh, program yeah. Okay, our sidewalk see, repair program. That's is a very process. important distinction for us to make. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Understood>. <laughs> responsibility. So, just can I just yeah. speak yeah. on this because it's, it's really a risk management liability issue that we monitor. So we have staff and third party contractors who job is to go around and look for those cracks so that we can find them before they're trip and fall. And then when we find them, we notify the homeowner, you now have so many days and to make the, the letters you're talking about go to the resident saying, please fix your sidewalk. If you don't, you're going to get a lien. Correct. So that's our process. Mm, right. Yeah. The city will come in and repair it. We'll, we'll repair and then, and then lien you for the cost. Is placed right. on the homeowner. On the home. Okay. That's correct. In regards to the pothole, Vice Mayor, and if anyone finds or identifies that there's a pothole in need of repair, then of course through our eyes and ears program, that is something that we utilize as a resource. But if they do see that there is a pothole that's in need of repair, it's a lot of times we get calls or contacts through our code enforcement department directly through to our department or through the website that there is a pothole that's there. So we identify who the responsibility is for that pothole. It may be on a state road, it may be on a city roadway, if it is on a city roadway, then staff will go out and they'll make the necessary repairs. Okay, and then of course we can put in a ticket too if a, if a resident right. brings that to our attention. Yes, you can send it to us. Plus, if it's on private property, then April staff would be the one to go out and, and advise the okay. Absolutely, code right. enforcement yeah. helps us in that respect as well. Cool. So we use that trusty tool that um, that um, Doug created for us right. to submit the software the ticket. Okay, all right. Thank you. That's and they can get that from the website. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my questions. Thank you guys for sharing the information. I thought it was important for residents to know that we are working on making the city more beautiful. Fantastic. Uh, next, um, Commissioner Grant. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. 
from all the departments. Um, I do understand as well that there are certain associations that are responsible for certain landmarks like the falls, right? And so we would not, yep. Uh, like Inverary Association is responsible. They're responsible for those. Our waterfalls, though, the ones that we are responsible for are more like the signage, the ones by our buildings, we would maintain. But the main one, the main waterfalls, and Inver they are responsible. Okay. The big one, yeah. All right. So if there are any issues with that, we would have to speak with the association. Inverary Association. Okay. And we can always contact them if they contact us. We'll give them a call. Yeah. And um, run phase one also uh, spoke of, I guess, the street. The line in the street Rockwell. needs to be okay. So that's that was done. I think that was one of the repairs that was shown. It was okay. the Inver. It was I the missed the stepped away. <laughs> okay, good, good. And then Earl, I guess I wanted to talk to you about the peacock situation. Okay. Was that resolved? And not to my knowledge. I have not heard anything though at the peacock. I haven't heard him in a while, but um, yeah. it is not to resolved. Knowledge. Um, Do you know of it? What's a peacock? There, there are peacocks in the neighborhood. April, are they still there are people there are residents that have peacocks right. as pets. Oh, yeah, some are in my complex. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's some in my, my law office as well. Yeah. As pets. And so um I know this one particular resident wanted to keep his peacock. And they mentioned that um they're emotional creatures, which I don't know. So they're considered to be pets. <laughs> and so I know that April, you were working on it. Can you give me a little bit of an update of it? Because it, it crossed my mind a few days ago, and then now it's good to discuss it. You, I'm sorry. I'll She's be with the code officer that was dealing with the peacock issue, and I'll get back with you. Okay. 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 Great. All right. That's it's it. Like turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I know Inverary used to have them all over the place. Yeah. Well, these people they had chickens. They are. They're all over the South Florida. And something else. I think you guys let the, they got rid of the chickens, and then the peacocks were there. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Grant, anything else? Um, no, that's it. Thank you. All right. Next up is Commissioner Saray Martin. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you, Mayor. Before I forget the peacock thing, is this, is she referring to the same? Yes, sir. The one that I, it was a, the same peacocks. So I'll provide what update that I can. Oh, thanks. I had asked initially that the city attorney look into uh, his peacock a violation. Um, we don't want to come out with no blanket statements right. today. Okay. But as, as it relates to this particular case, uh, the peacock was not considered wildlife and mm. in effect did not violate that particular ordinance. Right. Uh, but that owner did remove the peacock. Um, and so I, I had mentioned to the owner that I would come out and canvas the community and that if the community did not have an issue with it, then I would speak with our attorney to then speak with code to kind of make this thing work. What I did not want to do is uh, fight for this resident and then later have the community come back in here saying, why are you letting this guy have a peacock? So I did canvas the neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood all spoke highly of the gentleman. Uh, the person who actually made the call to the code enforcement uh, about the peacock, his really challenge was he believed some of them had gotten out and the in-laws tackled some chickens and peacocks and he felt like that might have been some inhumane treatment. And so he was more concerned about the treatment, the treatment of the animals, not necessarily about the peacocks there. Uh, and then the resident who made the initial code violation called me because now they didn't have my number because I knocked on their door. They called me about it and said, hey, what's going on? Because there were some more chickens in the trees in my backyard. So I go back to the initial resident and say, you're creating a bigger problem for yourself about the chickens. And then he tells me, no, this particular chickens is somebody that's two doors down. <laughs> so I said, well, wow. you want to let me know who they are so we can send code enforcement. He says, I don't want to rat anybody out. I said, well, if you don't rat anybody out, you're going to take the blame for these chickens. So I have not spoken to him in the past week because he is still debating <laughs> if he wants to turn in the neighbor who owns no, these but chickens. Earl, are you sure it's the same situation? I, I, I think so. It could be. What is so the, the area that it, 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 is, it is northwest Slaughter Hill, one block from uh, Pine Island. Is it close to Veterans Park? It's in that community, okay. but it's yeah. closer to the corner of Pine Island and 44th Street. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Emotional support, it's the same one. 
it's really for his daughter. Yes, it's the same okay. person. Yeah. Yes. So as of now, <laughs> listen. You're on the case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the case. Just we we speak of a diverse community, and we have to be sensitive to certain things, and um, and uh, you know, some some people and cultures peacocks or pets. Yes. All right, commissioners. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was just because we was talking about peacock. <laughs> so what I wanted to mention now about this beautification, a um, couple things. We talked about the sidewalks. I have heard many concerns, and I'm glad this kind of came up now, about the sidewalks, and I think this topic has come up multiple times. There are residents who've been here quite a while who the city imposed planting trees in their front swells. These trees grew, and now these trees are creating the sidewalks to break. And many of those residents say, they never asked for the trees in the first place, but now it's their responsibility to fix these sidewalks. Um, I don't know if Mr. Cal is still online, if we have a historical database of the trees we planted versus not planted, but are, are, is there any resolution for cities, I mean, for us, for the trees that we planted as a city, or is that still the resident's responsibility? Um, go, go ahead, Martin. No, I've been here, uh, Commissioner Martin, I've been here for um, with the city of Lauder Hill with 16 years, over 16 years. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, planting trees in front of any resident has not been uh, permitted since I've been there. However, we do have uh, some uh, uh, planting in swells, uh, but not necessarily in front of residential. So, and that is bad because it, it, it really damages the, the water lines and sewer lines. So it is preferred not to plant trees. As far as uh, whether or not it was done, uh, maybe Earl can advise, but I think it was done, yes. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of, maybe, I'm not aware of any trees being planted. Kenny, we, you've been there for a while. Any trees being planted on residents' homes? I'm, I'm not aware of a program that the city's ever done that. Yeah. I can comment on that because I in the St. George in the West Kenlock area, the county planted trees uh, count, oh, did the county prior to the annexation when they did the beautification and the the, the new water uh, piping and stuff over there. So those the trees over there, because I, I know because I dug mine up the day after they left. Um, but the county did do that over in the on the east side. I okay. can't speak to the remainder of uh, the city of Lotta Hill and uh, like Ray having some of the same concerns. I don't know if you were done or not. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Um, have had some of those same calls about trees breaking um, sidewalks and my concern or comment about us again I like to be clear to the public. When we say we go out and mark sidewalks we come back and monitor We'll come back and fix it and charge you if you don't follow up. We got sidewalks that have been marked in the city of Lot of Hill for years. And they're still broken. So if and I'm, I'm sure it's a lot of them, and you do them as fast as you can. But that needs to be an effort made to either follow up on those or let's not get a perception to the citizens that this is what's happening. Because, you know, I, I can walk in my neighborhood alone and they, they're marked. We take the paint and we mark them, but the sidewalks have been broken for a long time. So whatever the process is, it needs to be revisited. Whatever the time frame is of expectation for fixing these problems, because as you mentioned, Earl, I think for us, the liability doubles when the fact we know it's broken and we haven't fixed it. And you can go back and look at the markings of starting to wear out some of them. So um, that's really my, my, my comment to that. We have a lot of broken sidewalks. A lot of them have been marked, but not all of them have been fixed in a timely manner. All right, thank you, uh, Jabo. And Mr. Uh, Kala, since you're on, you, you kind of brought up another point, similar related, uh, but unrelated. You mentioned that those that paint, I mean, that uh, plant trees in the swells require a permit? Yes, sir. Um... And we usually don't allow, per we don't give permit. Um, 
engineering uh, does not allow to install a large tree by a species in the swells. Okay, so having said that, I personally have seen people plant trees. I've seen trees grow tall enough that they're covering stop signs. Uh, some that got mangoes on there now, they're in the swells. Uh, how does code enforcement enforce this new rule? Or not new rule, but do they go around and find trees that were not permitted and we start telling them to pull trees up? Or is this something our code enforcement is going to do or not do? Because this is happening every day. There, there are new trees planted every day in the swells. Hey, uh, I guess if, if you could give us the coordinates, the address, uh, we will go and, and remove it in, in due time. I know there are some older trees um, and we trim it so that, because, you know, if you're blocking the, the, the side view to a stop sign, that, that, that's a safety issue. But um, yes, we, we could go and trim it if it is smaller or if not, then we will have to hire uh, a special um, services for uh, a large tree removal. Oh, okay, and do we have any guidance on what is acceptable to be in a swell versus not what's acceptable? I think I think that a tree. What makes a tree a tree is the species. So, uh, no species that are that will become trees cannot be uh, planted in a swell. Bushes and flowers, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. And uh, lastly, we, um, I looked into in like an adopt a street program. Uh, Broward County has an adopt a street program, but only a few cities are involved. Uh, I would like to uh, begin to initiate and get us involved in, in this adopt a street program so we can start taking it out to the community. Has that something we have tried? Because I believe it's your department that would be doing the application. Actually, um, we had looked at Adopt a Street, but I think the county, the cost of it was just, we thought it was a little. I didn't hear you say it again. The cost of the program with the county was expensive, but I can get you additional information, but we had looked into it. It was a part of, I think, the garbage services that they offer. It was a part of that. And so when we looked into it, it was a little cost prohibitive. Okay. Yeah. If you could share that information. Thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. All right. Very good. And uh, Commissioner Lawrence Jabo Martin, is your light, uh, is your hand still up? Well, I think, Mary, you might be able to answer that question I just asked. Because I know doing some of our green series, we've given out plants and trees to the residents. I don't know if we're giving them instructions where to plant them, but we're creating our own problem then. Well, we... as recently as a month ago, um, we gave away uh, trees, uh, but that was with the help of uh, one of the county departments. And what were given out were not uh, towering trees. They were uh, trees that are native, uh, that can withstand drought and do not grow very high. So they don't have uh, uh, the kind of root system that would uplift a sidewalk. <laughs> So uh, they're not the, the kind of trees that would create problems for us in the future. All right, and uh, we're at uh, item 10. Is there anything else on item 10? Thank you, guys. All right, then thank you so much. Thanks, April. <laughs> we're on to number 11. The vision of the city requested by Commissioner Denise D. Grant. I promise, Mayor, that tonight I am actually your favorite commissioner because <laughs> all of my items, I'm either doing them very quickly and or have inside discussions, and this is one of them. So in talking with the city attorney, I am going to remove this item. We're going to schedule a meeting. Okay. And if nothing is resolved, then we'll bring it back another time. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We're on to item 12, Condominium Transparency Act, requested by Commissioner Saray Ray Martin. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, for those who may not have had a chance to look at the uh, handouts online, because uh, I may have gotten them in too late, there was some printed handouts for you uh, with re or backup with regards to this uh, item. 
what I'm looking to do is get some consensus on implementing some new ordinances for our city as it regards to our condominium associations. For those that may not know, the condos um, often deal with bad management, um, often deal with uh, misappropriation or fraud. Uh, we've had a couple of home condo owner associations managers that have been arrested right here within this city. Um, right now, the only recourse that most residents have are to go to the state unbudsman uh, who is backlogged with many, many issues. And in addition to that, to purchase condos, it's even getting even harder, of course, with the rising prices. But now some of the lenders are requiring the 40 year inspection as well as their financials before even approving people to get loans. And so as the uh, restrictions get tighter, uh, there's no movement within the associations uh, I've done some research to find out what can we as a city do. What I found was that in the city of Hollandale two years ago initiated a condominium Transpar transparency act where they require all the associations to put their financials on file, which helps the residents. So when they're trying to purchase, they can look prior to even purchasing if this is somewhere they want to be. And they also uh, include now the 40 year inspection. So they can see ahead of time and those associations have to pay a registration fee to be into the database. Uh, and when they don't comply, they get fined. And then they're also notified that they're uh, not in compliance if they're not in compliance with the 40 year inspection. I think what that does is it uh, informs the public as well as help protect the city from liability. Because if we noted that they're not in compliance, We've posted it, we find them for it, and we're continuing to follow up. Uh, we're doing the most that we can do, uh, as well as educating the residents on the current status of their condominium associations. Uh, Miami has just recently adopted a similar ordinance, but they include uh, condominiums and homeowners associations. I'm suggesting we stick with just the condominiums at this time, but I'm looking to have some language in our ordinance uh, similar to that of Hollandale and in, in Miami that will protect our condo residents and also help ensure that these sales are transparent and ensure that if uh, when these associations get behind and following their regular documents, it will give our attorney, our code enforcement, a little bit more teeth to start pressuring them and getting them to do the right thing. So what I was looking for as we brought this forth uh, with the backup data, is to get some consensus. If this is something uh, everyone agree is a good idea, then we would ask uh, Earl and his team to draft up some legislation and also have a compliance date um, that we will implement it. It's not something we're just gonna go out and throw it at soon, you know, say, hey, have this done tomorrow, but definitely by the first of the year and give our IT guys uh, time to figure out how we're gonna hold those files online. But this is what I'm looking for a consensus for going forward. All right, very good. First hand raised is uh, Commissioner Jabo Martin. Yeah, and probably a question for Earl. Would uh, existing condo owners, would you be able to retro them into the program like this? Would they be grandfathered in the current law and possibly have to wait till either the sale or something like that? Wait, now, Commissioner, can you ask me that again? I'm make sure I'm clearly understanding. Um, it, uh, let me let me just make sure I clarify. This is not for. Yeah, the, I mean, I'm sorry for the association or whatever group is that we're going to enforce this on. Yes. Would well, this, whatever it took place day one, they become uh, having to abide by it, or will this be for people new new coming in? No, it's going to be for the associations. So the associations will then have to, all associations that are currently in existence in the city, we have to comply with Earl, the ones that we have. Earl, that would be all associations or just those the, the who condo. Are, are, have like, um, who have, you know, binding, like a St. George Barber State. We're not, we're not talking homeowners association. We're talking condos only. Condos, condos only. And if you want. Would this you apply can... to townhomes or those areas that are homes like Cypress Hollow, Forest Lake, which those are the homeowner associations. Homes. We're not talking about those. We're talking only condos. And if you want to, you the, the city could impose something like a condominium building that has 10 or more units. That way, you know that you're talking about a, a true condo versus a, a quad or a duplex. But one of the things that will have to be disclosed is your your article of incorporation that you have to file with the state of Florida. We want that to be 
made publicly available and in that in the database IT will upload. So so we know that we're only talking about condos that are registered per statute of in Florida. And, and again, from the association standpoint, those are usually elected positions. Yes. And I'd just be curious since this has been, you said implemented in Miami and, and, and Hallandale. Hallandale recently? Hallandale and maybe two years ago in Miami Dade, uh, I believe, um, earlier this year, in March of this year. Okay. I'd like to see the backup and just some historical on what changed on the way things were done down there. Because again, I, I can see people running for the hills. They don't want to touch any of this stuff if uh, it's exposing them in some way. Some they can control, some they can't. Right. If you're one of six people or ten people, and five are doing right and two decide to go sideways, everybody's business is down. So, 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 what, what, what you're asking for, Commissioner, is the matters that are taking place at the board level. In other words, when they, when you know, when they meet, when they have to have their annual financial documents, the things that they have to, you know, have anyways, we're asking that that gets uploaded. So, the, so they're resident. So right now, it's state authorized, but we're just bringing it to a we're local. We're trying to get to, to see those things. So. Oh, okay, right. That's simple for me. So, right. all right, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I can. I think that something like that, particularly if there's precedence uh, in other cities yes. of this type of legislation working, I'm all for um, for exploring the possibility of doing it in Lauderhill. Um, I remember the whole tree garden situation, right. um, and and then I've spoken to um, a couple of other um, residents who have similar concerns. So I think something like this, um, Commissioner Ray Martin, would be, um, let's be more transparent. All right. I, I think it's a, a great idea. And uh, I, I just cannot help but, but think because it is a good idea. I'm, I'm wondering is, uh, will the state legislature allow us to do it? Yeah. Well, it's been done already in Hallandale, and Miami just did the same, and so we're going to be the third, and we'll see what happens in Tallahassee next uh, spring. <laughs> very good. Commissioner Grant. Uh, yes, Mayor. I agree as well. I think it's a very good idea. Um, great thoughts, Commissioner Martin, as it relates to this, and, and this will um, give potential uh, persons coming to live into Lauder Hill an option to be able to look and see uh, you know, the health of the association. So that's good. I'm on board with it. All right, then, uh, yeah. Mr. Hall, I think there's a consensus to, uh, to proceed. Uh, then we move to item 13, which 2023 budget discussion requested by City Commissioner Sir Ray Martin. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this, this budget, um, as we prepare for the new upcoming uh, budget in 2023, I uh, just kind of wanted to share some of my thoughts and ideas with my colleagues as well as the staff. Um, and in the past, it has been my understanding that the budget is presented to us and then the mills and what we tax is determined based on that budget. But I don't recall us giving any guidance as far as what mills we would like to see. And so I'm going to ask Kenny to come up and explain a little bit about the millage current as it is now um, and what we're looking to do in the future. If you go on the Broward County Property Appraisers Office, you'll see that Lauder Hill is 24. It is the number one um, highest taxes, of course, similar to the sign. So I, go, I have asked uh, our finance department to kind of do some research where we were in the past couple of years as it relates to um, the ad valorem versus our expenses. Uh, he's, he's created that report and sent it to me. I had an opportunity to review it. Uh, we are The only thing that we can change on there to bring that millage down is the ad valorem taxes. We are currently at eight point something. Um, and as I understand, I think the staff is gonna try to work to bring some of that millage rate down uh, even further this year. And what I would challenge everyone is everyone take a hard look uh, at their departments, all department heads, and see what we can do to get by uh, to bring our millage rate down commensurate with 
some of the other uh, similar size cities. Uh, as I look, we are currently at eight point something to really get down and be competitive. We need to bring it down 2.5. I know I mentioned that number to the bring city manager. No, I'm sorry. Two? Bring it down 2.5%. Uh, I know I mentioned that to the city manager. She might have fell out her seat when I said it. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm asking now is that all departments to include the city commission, we take a look at our budgets, city department budgets, and see how low can we go. Um, so when we get ready to present the presentation, I would ask for a couple of options. If we brought it down one point, what does that budget look like? If we brought it down two points, what does that look like? How many police officers are gonna get laid off if we went down two points, whatever the case may be. Uh, but if you can present a couple of options um, that we can look at and see how it affects our budget uh, in the future, that would be greatly appreciated. But while you're up there, Kenny, if you could share with uh, my colleagues here where we're at as it relates to the ad valorem and some of the historical work you just recently did, you and your staff, and I appreciate that. Um, and what impact can we have on our total uh, taxes and just kind of a way forward of what's the difference between the ad valorem with the rest of the taxes, how we look to the rest of the city, what those funds are used for, and if we were to cut, how does that look? And how does the um, unions impact um, some of our expenses? Yes, sir. Ken, Kenny, before you respond, I had, uh, I've got three commissioners who quickly raised their hands. Did you want uh, uh, to say something before Kenny makes a presentation, starting with Vice Mayor Dunn? Yes, I just wanted to clarify, um, I think, Commissioner, I don't know if you realize you said that we're the highest in Broward County, like the sign, and, and that's not. Um, what what well, I'm saying. I just want us to make sure that we yes, say it in for, a way so that residents. For those uh, that are watching us online, <laughs> so that I'm they, referencing what appears if you go to the Broward County right, Property Appraisers correct. Office. So if we could, Kenny, if you could yes, just be very clear about that distinction. Yes, right. Yeah. And so that's what it appears online. And so if Kenny could share with us why does things look that way what's the difference yeah. and how does it all work and then and then my other question i know um we had met before about the same matter yes, and um leslie and the communication staff is working on a campaign to kind of um simply in nugget sizes explain to the community um about all of that so if we can get update if you're prepared, great. If not, then in the future. Thank you. Before you uh, start, though, Kenny, um, Commissioner Grant. Uh, yes, Mayor. I do have some questions, but I guess I will hear Kenny's presentation. Maybe my my question questions will be answered. All right, and Commissioner Lawrence Jabo Martin. Um, yes, Mayor. <laughs> I'm just concerned whether we can do this in a workshop time frame because we're literally talking about the whole budget and a lot of hypotheticals at this point. Um, and understanding the ad valorem and the non ad valorem stuff as, as we went through a lot of it during the uh, tax yes, form that we put on. Um, it's one thing to say we want to increase services. It's another thing to say you want to lower taxes. I, I'll leave that as a placeholder until you finish, because I don't, I don't know how deep you're going. I know we could be here for a long time talking about options and opportunities. And, 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 and if I might add, just for clarity purposes, this is not tonight for the deep dive. I have no more to discuss. At this point, it's really just for Kenny to explain uh, the ad valorem taxes and how it works. The options that I was requesting is way later down. This was really just a let's talk about it. Uh, what does it look like in the future? And if you can give some clarity on the ad valorem and why does it look like we're high online and what's the actual and uh, what are some of our upcoming options? And, and I'm done. Thank you. And before you, you speak, city manager, did you want to say something? I, w I was just going to say that. Um... You know, this is a, a process that we go through, and we're going to suggest we are, Kenny and I already have spoken about where we were looking at taking 
our ad valorem and the fact that we were looking at lowering the ad valorem. So when we present the budget um, in July, of course, that's what we're going to take into effect. And, and we want to hear all your comments. But we also like to meet with you each individually to talk about um, any of the things that you'd like to bring up regarding the budget. All right. Now, Mr. Hobbs, yes. proceed. <laughs> so again, just to just touch on a, a few things, um, and, and as multiple commissioners have mentioned, that if you look at the Broward County property appraiser, it does appear that we have the highest uh, military in the county. Uh, one of the things we want to um, um, point out, and again, this was done uh, during the uh, tax forms, is that that millage rate is made up of multiple taxing districts, uh, Lauder Hill being one. So uh, each city has their own taxing district, but also included in that total millage, that 24 point uh, plus mills that you'll see when you look at the property appraiser includes uh, millage from uh, Broward County. It includes millage from the school board as they were discussing earlier. Uh, it includes millage from the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, and then there are some other tax districts, the, uh, the, the the uh, Broward, Health. Broward Health, right? So there are a number of tax and districts that go into what makes up that total millage. What we control, what our city commission controls is the city's millage. Uh, and when you make that same comparison by stripping away all of those other millages, uh, and we're talking about from the city's perspective, there are two at valorem rates that you'll see. You'll see one uh, is the city's uh, at valorem rate, which is set by the commission. Uh, and that is set at the discretion of the commission. Uh, that is 8.1999 right now. So that rate is set by the city commission. The uh, second ad valorem rate you'll see uh, has to do with voters debt, voter debt. So that that debt that had, has gone out, or that millage, that millage rate has gone out to the general public and was voted on by the public. So when we speak of where do we fall in the mix of cities, we speak of the millage rate that the commission, the commission has authority over, and that is the operating millage. The voted millage uh, is it was voted on by the public, and that is set based on what our debt service payments are for that year. So that millage rate is set uh, to 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 bring in exactly what we have to pay out. So there isn't any surplus. That millage that comes from that cannot be used uh, to carry out operating activities of the city. It can only be used to pay back the debt. Uh, with the geo bonds that were issued. We have two outstanding geo bonds. So that millage that you see, that's the debt service millage, can only be utilized to pay that debt back and cannot be utilized to pay any operating expenditures. Uh, just again, uh, so that's that's the difference when you look at the, when you go on the property appraisers and you take a look uh, as to what it appears to be and what it actually is. So when you hear us speak of not being the highest, we're speaking of the millage rate that the commission, the city commission has authority over, and that's our operating millage. Uh, and again, just to, and I, one of the things in the, in the analysis that the uh, commissioner asked us to do was to try to give a historical perspective of where we were versus where we are. And, and again, I'll just touch on it. This will be more part of our presentation that we make in July, but I'll just to touch on some numbers uh, briefly. So uh, again, he wanted us to go back and give a five or six year uh, uh, historical perspective on where we were versus where we are. If we went back to 2016, at the time, our military rate was 7.5898. So for 2016, 17, and 18, our military rate did not change. It was 7.5898. Uh, 2019, it did increase to 7.9898. And then 2020, it went from 7.9898 to 8.9898. One thing, if you go back and you take a look at those budgets during those fiscal years, you'll see that that increase in millage was totally due to increase in public safety. Uh, at that, that time, there was a push for additional public safety, for additional police officers, additional firefighters, additional code officers, uh, anything public safety related. Uh, that's what that increase in millage came from. And it was solely for that. If you can go back, you can read the budget messages, you can see what impacted that change. Now, one thing we like to point out to the public uh, is that what we collect the taxes relative to what our total general fund budget is, uh, uh, is, is minimal. I'll, I'll use that term uh, just to give you an example. Uh, back in 2016, with the military rate of 7.598, we collected $15.3 million in revenue, while at the same time, our operating budget, our general fund operating budget was $52 million. 
So of that general fund operating budget, what is used to pay for police, fire, parks and recreation, public works, general administration, all of those things make up that $52 million budget. But of that, we only collect 15 million of that from property taxes. Uh, just to show you how uh, the, the change in value affects what you pay in taxes, probably more so than the change in rate affects what you pay, you pay in taxes. To give you an example, we did not increase our millage rate from 2016 to 17, 17 to 18, as I spoke of. But our but your tax bill increased, and it in, in, it, in it increased to the tune of generating an additional $2.4 million uh, uh, in total, I guess you'll say, taxation uh, during that same period, with the millage rate staying the same. So what makes up that is two components. There's the rate plus there's the value. So as value increases, that affects your what you pay in taxes, even if the commission doesn't change the millage rate. Uh, and just to make it even more relevant, taking a look at 2020 uh, to 2021, where the millage rate was 8.9898, uh, and it went down to 8.4898. Now, it was a half mil decrease uh, at the time, but it still resulted in an increase in property valuation or taxes of $6,000. So even though we dropped the total millage rate a half a percent, your tax bill, you still would have seen a very minimal change increase. I'll use that term. But citywide was only $6,000. So I think it's important to understand that there are two parts that make up uh, your tax bill. There's the, the rate and then there's the value. So when we have uh, times like now where values are increasing in double digits, uh, there, there's a value side of what you, what we have that impacts the, what you pay in total. I think to the point of uh, Commissioner Jabo Martin, I think it's important uh, too, and I think this was part of the analysis, which we'll get to uh, in the year, is uh, Commissioner so Ray Martin was trying to understand the correlation between what we're collecting and spending in taxes and how is it being spent. And I think when we look at, uh, and it's important to look at our operating and personnel, uh, you, you'll understand that the city is made is a service industry. So when we talk about what do we do, we provide service. So any changes I can tell you as it relates to millage rates and, and, and just service fees has a direct impact on the level of service that we provide. Uh, and that's not more relevant, uh, apparent than if we went back 10 plus years uh, when the state mandated us to roll our rates back. And in my 30 years here, that's the only time that I can recall we ever reduced our tax rate other than the last few years. When we did that, that was a direct impact on services, i.e. Uh, that was the first ever, uh, I guess you'll say layoff that we had uh, at that time. We actually closed parks on the weekend uh, at that time. But because the tax revenue came in less, that's the correlation is an impact on service. So I, I think that's relevant when we have the discussion about what level of service uh, we're looking to provide to our residents. Now, we'll go into a lot more details as it relates to this when we make our July presentation. I think to the uh, to the, to the the commission's point, uh, the city manager and I have had conversations as it relate to how, how we move forward. I think there was a consensus uh, from the commission that they wanted to see taxes reduced. Uh, I recall it from last year's <laughs> budget meeting. So there was a consensus. Uh, as to that, and I, I think just the proper protocols and the proper way to progress through this, the manager is, uh, is, is required uh, by by charter or by code to to present to the city commission uh, a balanced budget on July 1st. Uh, and within that balanced budget, again, that's her budget that we're presenting to you, which includes information relating to tax rates. It includes other revenues and all of the expenditures. What's important to understand about that is that the rate that the commission comes to or settles on, usually during that July meeting, uh, because it's required to be to the county by August, is the highest possible rate we can have. So between July and September, there can be changes made to the tax rate, but it can only go down. It can't go up. So whatever rate uh, is set, it's important to understand. So whatever, so I guess we say that to say that the manager's budget that's presented as relates to tax rates, and then you guys either whatever rate you agree to and we send it to the county, that's the highest possible rate we can do. The actual tax rate isn't set until September. So it can go down as we go through those summer months, but it cannot go up. 
So I think that's important to understand when we get to the point of the July budget being presented to the commission. Uh, you know, again, we'll have a more in-depth conversation uh, as it relates to uh, how we move forward. But I think it's important uh, for the public to understand. And I know that that Commissioner Jabo has said it and said it and said it that the 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 level of service that we provide is directly impacted by the revenues that we collect. And because we are a service industry, uh, when we have to go to make reductions or reduce expenditures, uh, most the, 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 the way that you do it uh, has to impact the service levels. Now, that could mean a number of things, but just understand that's what happens when, when we have to or we're moving in that direction. So uh, I won't take any more time. Are there any additional questions as it relates uh, to where we were versus where we are? Um, I can answer those now. As you laid out the process. Yes, sir. Uh, at some point, the Broward County property appraiser certifies. Yes, sir. What the values are of the properties that are in us in our city. Yes, sir. What is that day? So June 1st uh, is when they send out their first notice. Okay. So June 1st, they'll send a notice to us, uh, to the, to the, usually to like the finance director. And I think they even may have sent it to the mayor. Uh, but I know we get an email on June 1st for the property appraisal, identifying what the value is uh, for the city. That is sured up again on July 1st. So they send out a notice on June 1st, and then they send out a second notice on July 1st uh, as it relates to those values. Okay, very good. Uh, Commissioner Grant, did you want to ask your question now? Um, I was going to ask as it relates to where we could cut, but I mean, you've already discussed that and I think you're going to propose something and then we can have more in-depth conversations, right? We're going to, we're going to present a balanced budget yeah. uh, as of July 1st. And then yes, we, we could have conversations. Cause, yeah. Cause like for something. instance, events and things like that. Yes, I mean, we can cut some of those things out as well. Right. And yeah. well, just, and, and again, mm -hmm. and, and I've, I think we've met with two, two of the commissioners, the mayor and the vice mayor so far, but as, as I stated doing that, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if, but I'm not just talking about the commission events. I'm talking no, about the city, I'm just, the yeah. city wide yeah. events. Yeah. Level, yeah. yeah. All, yeah all of them. So, uh, again, if, if, and just to touch on it quickly, mm -hmm. uh, from what, if you recall, when we had this last conversation or the events and those things mm -hmm. were passed this year, it was post budget approval. Right. So by the time we've, reconciled all of that the budget was approved so that 60,000 and then that 30,000 was part of the budget but during that conversation it was also stated that this in the coming year because that was done post approval of the budget that that term discretionary that $30,000 would go away right. that, but because it was already part of the budget it stayed for this year right so I can tell you that in the manager's proposed budget there will not be a discretionary fund but now, like, I'm talking about like jamming in the park. Well, and that's, all the, that's, that the, that's part of the special events. Again, right. that's part of the overall review that the manager will have when we look at and meet with all of the departments. So again, I can tell you, we've done this before. Uh, we, we, we may we, just have to do it for we, a few we years. Balance, we balance the budget every year yeah. and, and everything's on the table <laughs> when we're balancing the budget. So I, I can just be brutally honest with you. That's when we meet with the departments, myself and my staff usually meet with them first. And then we meet with them with the city manager before we get to meeting them with them with you. So there's everything's on the table. Yeah. Uh, including, you know, special events events. obviously stuff. you guys set your own budget. Yep. But outside of that, yep. the, the manager, uh, and everything else. Is just one more comment, man, and then I'll end. Because I, I do understand the importance of events altogether, whether it's our events as a commission or the city events. Um, but at this time, we are in kind of a crisis. I mean, it's a new day in the world altogether. And we're also seeing the impact in the city of Lauderdale. So I think we need to start um, thinking outside the box in a sense. And even if we just stop some events for maybe a year or two until things change, I think that would probably be wise. And I think the residents would appreciate that sacrifice that we're making as well. Yes, ma'am. It's noted. All right. Uh Commissioner Saray, did you have anything else on this item? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. All right. And uh, Commissioner Jabbo, is your hand still up? No, yes, sir. <laughs> um, are we in a crisis? I, no, I, don't, I don't think we're in a crisis. The but, world is in but, a crisis but, financially. Uh, no, we're not. I guess it's the easy answer. 
and and I, I, I pause to say because of if there's going to be some balance to look at the as, as the uh, mayor said when the property appraiser sets the housing values our millage rate could literally stay where it is we could drop a half a point we'd still net yes a considerable amount of money because you just said housing values possibly went double digit increases over the past year correct the last couple of years the last couple of years yeah, and the the amounts taxable are directly tied to the value of your residence on top of the other things now so again i understand you laid out the format the way it works and all of that but until the numbers come in and we find out what we're working with kind of premature to say we need to chop off our head and our arms to get to a balanced budget that still supports our police, our fire, and other services that the citizens of Lauder Hill have come accustomed to. Because the worst thing I think you can do, and again, I think it's all premature, you gotta do it, you gotta do it again. But we done threw all these rose petals out there and made everybody, we're the city on the move. And now we look like we've been mismanaging the city's money because we just ran away with everything in the first year of this new commission, I should say. Only to have to cut it back for three years or two years or whatever y'all talking about. So I just say be careful with using things like crisis because the city's not in a financial crisis. We still have our bond ratings. We just voted to go out for some new bonds last commission meeting which again, we're talking about still trying to enhance the, the things that we're doing in the city. We're close to paying off some other bonds or refinancing some bonds to get better um, rates or, or put them in a better spot. So you're doing a lot of good things to keep us in a good place, but we still want to be physically sound right. in what we do going forward. Correct. But I, I, don't, I don't want to put the word out that we're in a crisis, I guess is what I'm saying. Noted. All right, Commissioner Grant. Yes, Mayor, I'll make it short. So the word crisis may not be the operative word, but nonetheless, um, if we were in a sound, fully sound situation, we would not be having this discussion. So um, it's imperative for us to realize that we we are moving forward, but at the same time, we have some areas of deficiencies. We have residents on a daily basis um, that are reaching out saying that we have the highest tax rate and what are we going to do and why is this so expensive and why is this and that and the other and um, we've had conversations Kenny on numerous occasions about residents who cannot pay their water bill but yet still we're having very expensive events and things such as it just doesn't look good um, and oftentimes uh, someone's perspective or perception is their reality so as we're all having a discussion and we're all entitled to our opinions, um, I think it is important to voice mine for sure. And I look forward to your proposal and see how we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jabber, I know you wanted to uh, respond. Because of you. <laughs> uh, go. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna go for a uh, move to item 14, a resolution uh, number 22R0598, a resolution of the city commission, the city of Lada Hill. That sounds like something Earl should have read. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> I'm backing up. Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, I think that Vice Mayor Don might want to speak to that item until we can, and, you know, Le Leslie's available in the manager. Yes. So my issue last during the commission meeting with this item is the lack of distinction between meeting and right. yeah events. no it's it's, meeting it's, 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 an, it's an important right. <laughs> it's an important distinction yes. i don't want to come to y'all every time i want to meet with a constituent so i think that we've come up with a solution and i i wanted to keep the item on just so that for transparency with the rest of the team hi good night everybody good night. um hola. hola so we know that three resolutions passed um over the like he said, after we got the budget in place. And it was basically to help us with the volume because it was a lot. And that we wanted to make sure that we were doing the best with the city's money 
and that we were successful and efficient with time and staff resources. Again, that's your biggest part of your budget is us. We cost money. So um, the three resolutions that were passed talked about having to do this calendar, having to come before you every time something was going to be added to the calendar. The question um, was surrounding the EPAV form. So when do you do an EPAV form? Okay, so you have a calendar, it's approved. You come up with something now, the butterfly convention, you need to put an EPAV in and the city manager will bring it before you so you guys could decide if you want to have a butterfly convention per se. Now, the, the next thing is, um, what, the question was asked, why are we doing all these EPAV forms? Well, in, you know, in reading the charter, the, you know, the one thing we want to try to do is protect you guys so that you are not, after we have this calendar, giving the city staff direct um, direction, right? So the EPAV form is part of the process for you to tell the city manager that you're going to have something and her staff is needed. So when we came up before you the last time, one of the particular uh, points of concern was, well, I've already gotten a program approved, but now there's subsequent meetings. So the question was, do I have to do an EPAV every time I have a meeting as it pertains to a program my colleagues already approved? So what we came up with, the staff met and discussed, do we really need to do an EPAV every time there's a meeting pertaining to a program or an event that you've already approved? So what we're gonna do is add a new box to the EPAV that says, I'm going to have a meeting or uh, it's already been approved. You know, it's an already been approved event. However, I'm going to be having subsequent meetings. And it's really for just the city manager at this point, because you guys know what you approved as colleagues in the programs and events. But now if there's subsequent things where you need multi uh, disciplines, different departments, then she needs to be able to know the city manager because it's her staff that is going to be assigned to these different events, right? And she also, you know, we kind of came up with the three C's. One, it's the charter. Two, it's is carrying the costs and also for the purposes of the calendar. So I look at you every time I say calendar. <laughs> so these are the types of housekeeping things. So again, if you're gonna have some programming that's already been approved and now you have subsequent meetings, the city manager still needs to know that her staff is being utilized and it's to keep you out of charter trouble. It's to keep us costs, keep our costs um, tracked, and it's to keep our calendar. So I hope I didn't totally confuse them. Yeah, and again, if it's a meeting where it's you and your constituents and your meeting, that's not our concern. If it's a meeting where um, you need IT, you need um, parks, you need uh, police, then that's something if you complete the form and get it to us. That way we can go ahead and make sure that meeting is staffed properly. It's it's being held where there aren't, you know, six other events also going on at that same date and time. We can't provide the resources that you need just to make sure we keep all of those things in order. And if there is a cost associated with it, if it's overtime or if there is uh, something you were expecting that that can all be tracked and, and done with your events. So, so this is a way um, generally, right. It's just going to come to me. It won't need commission approval, but that way we can make sure we have all the resources that you need available. All right. So that was my biggest um, concern. concern is the idea of having to come in front of the commission every time I want to have a meeting. So we found a compromise. Thank you. Can I just get a real life example of <laughs> what you're talking about? Um, okay. Can, Let me, I, can okay. I just share sure. okay. a very recent real life okay. example. So um, a real life example is two. One, last week, National League of Cities was here. Um, I shouldn't have to come to the commission to ask permission to host a meeting with the National League of Cities. Um, but that was an important meeting for us for obvious reasons. Secondly, um, we, I hosted a, um, a meeting with hospital CEOs for healthcare organizations. And that was something that Ebony planned. Um, and then Chief was there and, and, um, and um, Desiree was there. I shouldn't have to come to the commission to have a meeting with hospital CEOs. That's a real world recent example. And, 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 I, and with that, right, when we know you're going to have a series of um, the mayor does the garden series. So we know that he's got four events 
there's going to be some meetings as it pertains to that or jazz picnic. I'm, I don't want to pick on anybody. We know you have you like the last me, okay. Thursday of the month is your HOA. If it's on the form already, and we know that um, every Wednesday, second Wednesday of the month is tea time. We know that those are ongoing programs, but we know they have a set date and time and it's on the calendar. So it's prescribed. But some of you guys have programs that go on and on and on. So there's going to be meetings subsequent that again, like she's like the manager said, if it's her and Ebony, we don't really need to know that they're meeting with John Smith. But if it's going to be require staff, the manager needs to know that her staff is going to be repurposed for these different you know um, meetings. We also yeah, need that to talk to each other. Three of us put meetings in that aren't on the same thing, and all three require the chief of family to be there. Okay. And we'll. We'll, we'll call you and say, listen, we're having um, some conflicts with it. The chief can't attend all three of these. Whoever maybe came in first, she'll go to that one. Then I'll call the other two and say, is there another date we can look at? Or can I send the deputy chief? Could that person also accommodate what you're looking for? And it happens. So I'm just it ha to say, that's uh -huh. real, too. Yeah, that's a <laughs> right. real life form. It happens. That's, that's a real. Doing it rather than us arbitrarily calling people and saying, hey, I'm doing something, blah, blah, blah. So your document visualizes for y'all what's happening where it's not coming back. And, and the other thing that we often get is, you know, there's a thing going on somewhere and we don't know what the thing is. Um, so another one of these for the city manager only is sometimes you guys participate in stuff out of the city. Maybe you're going to work with uh, another city or you're going to work with an HOA. And then our logo shows up on somebody else's um, flyer flyers and creatives and, we get the call that says, why is the city of Lauder Hills logo on, you know, the happy, you know, healthy people's event? And we often don't know why um, until then we call and do a little research to find out if someone wrote a check. These are the kind of things that we're going to have for the city manager's information only on the EPAP. So if you do decide that you're going to support another city's uh, award ceremony or another HOA's event that's not has anything to do with us, if you could just let us know for the city manager only, because then we we don't know where these things are coming from. And you should, you know, support other people's events and be part of them. It's we're not not encouraging. We are encouraging. Just let us know so that she can answer the question, because a lot of times we get calls on the weekends and it's like, well, where did this come from? And sometimes we don't really know. <laughs> so this is like a for information city manager only, not for a colleague discussion. So if we're in the gray area and it actually toggles into event city manager or gatekeeper will push it back and say no fully path required right and we'll deal with it at that point which means it'll have to come back before the commission yes so if your program now becomes a new special event like in your programming now we've added a 10k now your program just became a special event then that needs to come back so Not should, just the meeting. And I guess my, my last question is, should our expectation, because again, in my mind, it's a quickie, quick meeting, and it kicks back as a program now. My quick meeting is not going to happen until a commission meeting happens to okay the new event. And if we follow the letter of the law. Yes? No? You're talking about a meeting, right? No, no, no. If I send She's something over, just going to. Any, that's really... No, I think you, we would talk you with stepped over it. It's really an event you're trying to do, a new event. It has to come back before the commission to get gatekeepers going to catch it and push it back. <laughs> Julie is the gatekeeper, by the way. We haven't figured that. <laughs> well, I think if it's an event that hasn't been ever come before the commission, then you have to bring it back in front of the commission. That's what that's what you guys had elected to do. Right. Um, but if it's something that's a part of, like, say you have an event and you have the Calderon run, and underneath the Calderon run, you put in there two dates for um, a Calderon, um, I don't know, eating event and a Calderon running event under that too, learning how to run, then those, if they're a part of your original program, then you wouldn't need to come back for that. But if it's something where you're creating a whole new program, then of course that would have, that would have to come back to the commission. Let me recognize Commissioner Grant. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I know that with the calendar, you guys probably need us to update it so we can take some of those things off, right? Some of the events. Some have come off. <laughs> some have. We okay. appreciate any off. 
All and, right. and Commissioner, we're going to meet with you too on your calendar. I think Julie is setting up those dates. So one anything that you need to take off, that'll mm -hmm. be a perfect time too. Okay. And then as it relates to staff and the payment thereof, so if it's after hours or weekend, then we're counting. So it, it's counting it comes out of our mm -hmm. the commissioner's um, funds. Even correct. Yes. Special event. If it's overtime, if it's during regular hours, then no. Unless it's uh, the special event coordinators, because that's what they that's what they do. That's their job. Yeah. So if you're talking about a utility guy or a electrician or a cop or then that's what comes out of your budget. We're gonna go over with you that. Um, we've started those meetings, so we'll go over your entire, um, what you've paid out to date, so you can see everything on there. What if we get like sponsors that replenishes our account? So we put that as a part of the, the packet also. So that, that goes like, if you had a program that cost $10,000 and you raised five, then the program would only cost five. But we list it on the form for you also. You'll be impressed. <laughs> and one thing I ask you to do is I think Julie sent you all the form to go ahead and start thinking about 2023 so we can get those documents um, in as far as what you're planning to do for the next year. We also uh, want to look and see if um, maybe, like he said, there'll be no discretionary funding. The uh, uh, city attorney said we can't use that anymore, but we are looking at um, if you have travel, or if you have... Um, Explain that again. No discretion. We're not having any discretionary... We cannot have discretionary funding um, based on the city attorney's... Um, Recommendation? Yes. But we can... We can take it all of our... <laughs> That's a parting gift, Earl. <laughs> Earl, not even... That, that's, that, that's, that's, not, that's not your program, but that's discretionary money. Is that... Yeah, yeah. yeah we never had it before. We've... So not even the four thousand seven hundred that they had. The old well, I don't. I, I think that is still possible, and I'll let the management deal with that piece. But a small amount that you might need because you want to send flowers to somebody because they passed to the family, those kind of things would, would be okay. But the large amount that was in last year's budget, just um, I spoken with finance and management. We just don't think that's a good idea. To have to continue. But you that. guys are the ones who recommended it. For the program, but no, but for programs, the program budget's still what they are, or whatever the administration sets for oh, you. Oh, we're all still you. going to have the sixteenth. I don't know what number that it'll be, but that's programming. That's that's not that's not discretionary. Oh, so you guys are not gonna like take it back, and we just pull from it. You're gonna give it to us to manage it. Yeah, that, that, that's what they're gonna meet with you about. Yeah, they're gonna meet with, with that's each what one of you. Need your list for right. Oh. Programming is different from discretionary. <laughs> and, the, and the event coordinators are um, available to meet with each of you and your aides to give you an idea, because I, I know most of you have said this, this is the stuff I'm bringing back and this is the stuff that didn't work so well. Um, was it a good return on my investment? So you're welcome to have Stephen and Stephanie to come and sit with you. So then if you have to cross the lower ones off, you can determine what that would be by and, and the special event coordinators are ready to meet with each one of you. So when you turn in your budgets with Andrea, it has a you know a pretty good idea of what's the priority for you and your events mm -hmm. and programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, events and programs. Okay. All right, Vice Mayor Dunn. Now, I just want to make the distinction um, between the meeting and the events. So in my mind, the events are external opportunities that's open to the general public that people get to register anybody from the city can come to and the meeting is by invitation over only we have a, a selected list of people so that i guess whatever the resolution is um if we can put it in writing, put it in writing and, and, and make that distinction um so that we don't have to so, the, so those would be the internal EPABs just for her. So she knows where her staff is. Correct. Right. Yeah. So so the definition and then what the process is, right? Right. Um, I think that would be really helpful. And then we'll attach the new improved form with the new box that we're going <laughs> to add to it. And I think you all need to clarify also on that same note, because meetings usually don't happen. Well, not not say usually, but a lot of meetings are after hours. They were going to require staff, you know, if we have dignitaries coming in, we're usually having a luncheon or something and going into a meeting that may run after five, 
I don't know what the work hours are. Six. But I don't know if you're going to get dinged because you kept somebody here for an hour or, mm. or whatever the, the time piece is. Or if you take somebody out to dinner, a group of people, mm. how does that work? So I think, although it's a meeting, is it also going to be on the clock for time? It needs to be clarified. Well, we, we still are trying to keep track of costs, right? So we would want to still, that's why we're saying still put the EPAV in so that she knows her staff is going to be leaving the office and going someplace else for the purpose of it. That doesn't mean she's taking it back to all of you because you're having a meeting. You know what I'm saying? So it does help us track the costs. And again, if, a, if it's something after hours, then if it's overtime for that person, that you just have to pay it out of your, your funds. And then the, the, the other clarity, I guess, since the question came up about um, the budget versus um, what we're going to have access to. So just to make sure that I'm clear, um, we'll have whatever the amount is that's proposed in the manager's budget that will come to us in July right. for um, events. Correct. And we can also, for programming, we can also, I guess, when we submit our travel budget to you, then we can also say what what we're requesting. Like if you're going to NLC or FLC, right. you're right. planning on going to any of those conferences, those costs can be submitted. Plus, if you have postage needs or right. you need I, to. I guess for me, because uh -huh. I use my what we're calling discretionary funding. I use <laughs> I use that money specifically for like Lottie Hill Shines programs, not necessarily for events. So in that case, then I would submit that request to you. Right. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other uh, discussion on item 14? And ladies, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item 15. Increase in water bill, uh, an item uh, requested by Commissioner Denise D. Grant. Yes, Kenny, please. And I'm going to make it short. It's 10 o'clock. Thank you. So I know, Kenny, that we've had um, several meetings um, with residents about the increase in water bill. And then the other day again, had three residents in one community um, indicating that their water bill has just gone so high and they haven't done anything differently. Um, one resident indicated that um, they're not even there on the weekends, but yet still they're paying $250 a month. There are three persons in the home. One is a teenager, but young girl who they claim doesn't really do much. And then uh, the husband works on the weekends elsewhere. So it, I'm just trying to figure out, is there, is there something new? I, I don't understand because we're hearing this quite often. And, um, and then when the residents, they address you is as if they're attacking you in a sense, right? And they're looking for an immediate solution. So just wanted to hear if you've been hearing these things as well. And um, if there's any change at all, and if so, what can we do? or just to inform the public of what's happening. Right. So, so as it relates to the, to our water bill, I think it's important for the residents to understand that the water bill consists of uh, a number of things, not just the water bill, uh, right. water usage. So it, it consists of, it also includes the garbage uh, billing, which in some other cities it may not. It also includes storm water. Uh, so as it relates to changes, I, I can say that uh, per the code, uh, our rate does change an amount equal to CPI each year. Uh, but I can tell you that has been minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, going back from 2017, our water and sewer charges are what we call our fixed fix rates uh, were $18.19. Um, and that was in 2017. Oh, 17 and 2022 currently is $24 and four cents. So it has increased $6 and 15 cents per month. Uh, that's the increase. So those are the fixed costs as it relates to water and sewer. Now the total fixed costs, which will include availability of uh, storm water and garbage has increased from $67 uh, 
uh, back in 2017 to $81.85, so $17.85 a month uh, over the last five years. Uh, that's the increase. Now, the second portion of that bill is flow, flow charges. So you have minimal, the minimum charges, and then you have the flow charges. Uh, this is where we get into the discussions when it comes to residents. One of the things we try to explain to them, our flow charges have increased from $1.67 roughly, uh, because again, it's tiered. So I'm speaking of the first tier, the zero to 4,000 gallons. It was $1.67 back in 2017. It's $1.90 now. So our fees haven't increased dramatically or to the point that you would hear people complain about their water bill increasing. When you go back and you look at the bill, and one of the things that they don't like to really talk about is what's truly affecting their water bill, and that's consumption. So when you look at the water bill, if there was zero consumption, your bill would be $81.85. Everything else associated with your water bill is tied to actual consumption. What I try to explain to them is that the city has one component in this, in, in, in this uh, system. The meter. The only component that we have is the water bill. Every other thing that could impact what happens to your water bill is, a, is, is owned by the property owner. For example, there could be issues between the water meter and the house. There's a water line. There could be issues with your sprinkler system. There could be issues with your outside knob faucets. There could be issues with the sink in the house. There could be issues with your ice maker. There could be issues with the toilet. All of those other things are your responsibility. So from our perspective, the only thing that could truly impact your bill that we can control is the water meter. Now, the water meter is mechanical, and, and we can pull it and we can test it. But one thing that it has shown, or at least in the industry it, that is known, is that what happens most times, I won't say all the time because nothing is really exact all the time, but normally what would happen is there's an issue with the water meter, the water meter will slow down, not speed up. So as the mechanical piece ages, it actually slows down and reads less water going through the meter, not more water going through the meter. So what oftentimes what happens is when we get complaints and people want their water meter uh, change, we come out, we test it, we install a new water meter, and then the water bill goes even higher because now they have a meter that's reading more accurate than the old meter that we had in the ground before. So the biggest issue, and, and, and even in the individuals that we met with, uh, was the disparity in their actual consumption. So it may be 4,000 gallons one month, 10,000 gallons one month, back down to 6,000 gallons, 12,000, 5,000. That's a disparity. And that's what, that's what makes for those high bills. But again, I think from our perspective, our rates haven't changed that dramatically that, that would result in you having a bill going from $100 to $200 plus. That's solely tied to consumption. And that's what we can't explain. We can't right. explain why your water consumption is up. So you know what a lot of them are saying is that they're not reading the meter properly. And that, and that is true. That's what they say. And, mm -hmm. and we've... <laughs> and, and I can tell you, you know, our meter reader crew, uh, they are reading the meters. Uh, and what, what we have done uh, is we go out, we read it, we reread it, we meet them on site, we read it with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had people say, yeah, we put a rock or a pot over our water meter. And the meter reader was like, yes, I moved it, I read it, and I put it back. So it's like they do things to try to see, <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm saying that those are the arguments that we get. Well, you know, I put a plan over it. So he couldn't have read it because the plan is still there. Or when I lift up the box, it was sand in there. He said, yes, we dig it out. We read it when it rains or your sprinkler comes on, the sand goes back in the box. So if they're not reading the meter, they'll actually put a code in the system. So if there was a reason a car parked on the water meter, they can't read. it. So they'll put a code in the system. But outside of normally extreme cases like that, they're reading the meters. And when they're not, they're putting a code in the system. So oftentimes when someone's saying their meter isn't being read, we agree. Or properly. We are, right. Well, but we agree to meet you out there mm -hmm. so we can read it together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now you're there, we're there, we're reading the meter together. We see what the reading is. We compare that to the water bill. And 99% of the times, it's right. 
uh, that you've just used the water, but we can't explain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we've even had in this situation, we had her meet the individual at the property with his foreman as well. And they ran through a whole bunch of tests as well. He had the plumber come out. I was, so, I'm curious to find out what was the finding in that one? That there was no leak. No leak. <laughs> so, and it's a new meter. We replaced the meter. We gave him credit, but there is no leak. Uh, uh, that has been found. So we can't explain why his consumption fluctuates and mm -hmm. is high. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Commissioner Lawrence Martin. I just had a quick question. What would you say the percentage of people calling you with these type of problems? It's a small percentage based on the number of customers that we have. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, we get the calls. But most times when we come out, we read the meter, they go out, they check it. Usually there's an issue. So usually there's a leak most times. Uh, it's rare that, you know, a small percentage of times where there isn't a leak and they're still complaining. They're, they're, that's a, we don't get them often. I can, I can tell you that. They, they do, we do get them. We do receive those type of calls. But based on the 10,000, 12,000 plus uh, customers we have, it's minimal. All right, commissioners, any other questions? Anything else? I have number one. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is over. All right. Um, then I think that we're done with uh, the agenda. Uh, now we have communications from public officials. And Mr. Hall? No, nothing, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes, just one. Um, great meeting this past week from um, National League of Cities. Uh, to, next week, I go to Washington for the Lauder Hill, um, for the CIE program through National League of Cities. That's with the Lauder Hill Inclusive Entrepreneurship. I'm going to actually go in a day early. Our lobbyist is, is working on scheduling some um, meetings for me, I think they have one already confirmed with the Office of um, Minority Business. And hopefully we'll get a chance to meet with the, with the Department of Commerce to see if we can't um, secure some funding for um, LEAP and for um, Lot of Hill Shines. So I'll be out next week. All right, thank you. Commissioner Sir Ray Martin. Uh, yes, Mayor. On the May 30th Memorial Day, I would like to in, open the invitation to my colleagues. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a meeting or an event, but we're going to have a <laughs> gathering. We're going to be gathering at Veterans Park at 8.30 a.m. Feel free to come out and lay a wreath or service memorial for our, our memorial service uh, in partnership with uh, the Northwest Lauder Hill Association. So yeah, I don't know if gathering is okay, but that's what we're going to have. It's a gathering. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lawrence Jabo Martin. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming out uh, Saturday to St. George Park. It was, a, it was a blast. Everybody enjoyed it. Got a lot of good feedback. It was good to see uh, the city out supporting a worthy um, Ribbon cutting ceremony. Thank you. Commissioner Denise D. Grant. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a couple of things. Just the regular stuff. Um, on Wednesday, this Wednesday, um, we have tea time uh, with the seniors at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., and that's going to be at the Sackett Center. Next. Uh, stretch and breathe, which is what we're doing about the wellness stress awareness tools that's going to be may 21st from 7 a.m to 10 um, on the 21st of course you need in the community we're having or over by enron um, based on requests and that's going to be on the 25th um, from 5 p.m starting at five and is that it yep i guess that's it all right fantastic yeah, Thank you. Um, city Manager, Desiree Giles Smith. May just one thing. I want to just uh, make everyone aware that we're having the police memorial. And we're going to be honoring one of our own core Pendergrass. Um, and it'll be at 9 a.m. this Thursday. So we hope you all can make it. All right. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, motion to adjourn. Oh, wait, Mr. Mayor.
Mayor, just one last thing. Okay. Um, so the Lauda Hill Inclusive Entrepreneurship Program, the classes are at Sackin Center on Wednesday nights. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind stopping by to offer a word of encouragement to our business owners. Um, I know Commissioner Ray Martin has been by already. Um, so we're following the same format that we do for Shines um, with a Q&A coming this week. So we're going to be sending the questions um, that they have for um, staff to you tomorrow, Desiree. But if you guys could please um, stop by and have them feel just as welcome as we do the Shines group. And that's the one for the returning residents, returning mm -hmm. residents. Okay. really powerful entrepreneurs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, motion to adjourn. So move.